The speaker. The Legislative Assembly is honoured to be situated on the ancestral lands of the Wadjuk Noongar people. We acknowledge the First Australians as the traditional owners of the lands we represent and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament now assembled, and they would be pleased, pleased to direct and prosper all our consultation to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Western Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Members, do we have any petitions? Oh my gosh, we'll be overcome. <laughs> Member for Swan, uh, Darling Road, sorry. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I have a petition that has been certified as conforming with the standing orders of the Assembly. It has 170 signatures and the petition says, we, the undersigned, are opposed to the current project design and lack of community consultation for the Thomas Road Bridge over rail project, put forward by Main Roads WA and the Labor State Government. The current design will result in compulsory land acquisition, the destruction of flora and fauna that is home to an established black cockatoo feeding habitat, the construction of 11 metre noise walls only metres from private homes, and the redirection of local traffic to Marygrove Primary School precinct. At this stage, no plan has been presented for the level crossing at Larson Road and standard planning practices have been ignored, with no environmental protection authority assessment or consultation with the adjacent landowners and local community undertaken prior to the announcement. This has resulted in significant uncertainty and undue stress for the Byford, Darling Downs and Marygrove Primary School communities. Now, we humbly request that the Legislative Assembly to ask the Minister to delay the commencement date and investigate alternative options for the Thomas Road Bridge over rail project and the Larson Road level crossing. We also request the Legislative Assembly ask that the Minister consult with local landowners and the Marygrove Primary School community before steamrolling ahead with a sensitive project that will have a detrimental impact on the environment and local community. Thank you, Member. Uh, the Member for Kalamunda. Um, I have three petitions. Sorry? I have three petitions. Do them, have them yes. at Saratan, if you like. Um, Mr Speaker, I have a petition that has been certified as conforming with the standing orders of the Assembly. It has 307 signatures. The petition says, to the Honourable the Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament assembled, we, the undersigned, note that the community of Kalamunda and surrounding suburbs do not believe we have a dedicated and sufficient police response which leaves us vulnerable to burglaries, thefts, vandalism and antisocial behaviour, which includes hooning and other serious traffic-related offences. Now, we ask the Legislative Assembly to establish a full-time dedicated police team out of the existing Forestfield Police Station to regularly patrol and respond to the suburbs of Kalamunda, Lesmurdy, Wollaston, Gooseberry Hill, Bickley, PC Brook, Carmel and Pickering Brook, and to, to fund a study of the most effective new locations for CCTV and other security measures in the above suburbs, as well as fund the implementation of this infrastructure. I have a further uh, petition that has been certified as conforming with the standing orders of the Assembly. It has 75 signatures. The petition says, to the Honourable the Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament assembled, we, the undersigned, say, the Hills communities from Stoneville southwards to Pickering Brook are not currently served by the network of public transport buses, but there is an opportunity for some innovative thinking to improve connectivity in our attractive residential and premium tourist destinations. Now we ask that the Legislative Assembly calls on the State Government to arrange for a trial program 
of on-demand public transport in the hills communities so that locals and tourists, locals and tourists can get around. I have a further petition that has been certified as conforming with the Standing Orders of the Assembly. It has 449 signatures. The petition says, to the Honourable the Speaker and members of the Assem Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of West Australia in Parliament assembled, we, the undersigned, note that lines look out on Westpool Road, Les Murdy, needs infrastructure upgrades to increase safety, improve visitor experience, reduce littering and reduce antisocial behaviour. Now, we ask the Legislative Assembly to press for improved access from Welsh Pool Road by installing a designated turning lane and signage, the installation of toilets to facilitate the more than 100,000 visitors received per year, the provision of recycling bins, increasing parking spaces to accommodate the popularity of the park, improvements to lighting to increase safety and prevent antisocial behaviour, the development of a food truck bay to allow the building of a kiosk slash container restaurant, improvements to lawn and native planting. Thank you, Member. Speaker. Member for Bunbury. Mr Speaker, I have a petition which has been certified by the clerks of the Legislative Assembly from 1,410 petitioners in the following terms. To the Honourable the Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of Western Australia assembled, we, the undersigned, say we appeal to you to provide funding for the building of a South West Aboriginal Medical Service, SWAMS, Health Hub in Bunbury. The Health Hub will enable SWAMS to provide all of their medical services from one location, improving quality of life, access to community health and wellbeing services, which is directly contributing to closing the gap for the Noongar people of the South West. Now we ask the Legislative Assembly to make this funding available. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Bunbury. Uh, notices of uh, papers, papers for tabling, Clark. The following papers are presented for tabling reports from the Department of Premier Cabinet Ministerial Resourcing Report as at 29 October 2020, report on consultants engaged by government for the six months end of 30 June 2020, statement of corporate intent 2020-2021, horizon power. Papers tabled, notices of motion. No notices of motion, brief ministerial statements. The Minister for Police. Mr Speaker, this year Crime Stoppers Western Australia is celebrating its 25th anniversary. Established here in 1995, Crime Stoppers works in partnership with our police force so community members can help solve crime by providing information through the telephone hotline 1800 333 000 or online. Importantly, community members can report criminal activity and suspicious behaviour anonymously. While 2020 is Crime Stoppers Silver Jubilee, the organisation deserves a gold medal for its community engagement. Around 95% of West Australians know about Crime Stoppers and how effective it is to get information to our police. In just the past 15 years, community members have contacted Crime Stoppers nearly 580,000 times and contributed to over 22,000 incidents being recorded Treasure. involving 77,000 offences, including homicide, robbery, sexual offences and drug offences, 53,000 arrest outcomes, and over $4.4 million in cash and two tonnes of drugs being seized. So significant is the WA community's embrace of Crime Stoppers that it is estimated around 50% of police intelligence comes from community reports to Crime Stoppers. The McGowan government is a strong supporter of Crime Stoppers. Its benefits to our community are significant and can be quantified as savings returned in police investigation time, in crime prevention, in drug and property seizures and in reporting efficiencies. Crime Stoppers ensures and enables the broader community to participate positively in the work of our police. It reinforces within the community that the police force is there for all of us to protect us all, to keep us safe and to safeguard everyone's life and property. That government support, coupled with that of Crime Stoppers corporate partners, has underpinned the development of a range of innovations, including Crime Stoppers WA Connect, which allows community members to report prison, environmental and scam matters to relevant government agencies. Mm -hmm. 
the Eyes on the Street Industry Reporting app, which supports rangers and other frontline industry personnel who, by nature of their work, are more likely to come across suspicious incidents to report these uh, incidents. Uh, the multilingual reporting reports can be made in 11 different languages, and Bike Link, which seeks to reunite stolen bikes with their owners. These are just a few of the outstanding programs that Crime Stoppers delivers. I'm sure all members will join me in congratulating Crime Stoppers on 25 successful years, a silver anniversary for a gold standard institution. Okay. And the Minister for Heritage. Mr Speaker, I'm particularly proud to rise to announce the permanent entry of our parliament on the Western Australia's Register of Heritage Places. This place, this place, this place, this place, this place, this place Mr Speaker. Uh, members, please, this, you know, place. this old heritage person is this, trying to say something here. This place, first constructed in 1902, uh, between 1902 and 1904, and extended in 1958 and 1964 has been the seat of democracy for our state for over 115 years. In 1870, as the colony developed and agitated for more responsibility, Governor Weld established a partly elected legislative council. In 1890, Western Australia was granted responsible self-government and established a bicameral parliamentary system. Throughout the 1890s, there was considerable debate amongst members about the location of the proposed new parliament house either at the site of the old Legislative Council or the old barracks. This location overlooking St George's Terrace and the Swan River, built on Kumba, Mount Eliza, a place of significance for the Wujak Noongar people, was chosen. Our parliament is significant for its lived history and not just its built form. In 1899, WA was one of the first to grant women the right to vote. In October 1910, Mr Heitman, the member for Kew, and the Sergeant of Arms at the time exchanged blows. In 1920, women became eligible to sit, and in 1921, Edith Cowan became the first woman elected to an Australian parliament. In 1928, Mr Thomas Heron, the member for Mount Leonora, was found unresponsive in the reading room and pronounced life extinct. <laughs> In 1953, in 1953, in 1953, a cow escaped into the grounds of Parliament House and was never seen again. And we almost had a repeat of that in 2017. But we can thank Minister Murray for recapturing that cow. In more recent times, Ernie Bridge was the first Aboriginal person to be elected to the Legislative Assembly in 1980. And the Parliament decriminalised homosexual acts between consenting parties in 1989, abortion in 1998, and adopted an acknowledgement of country. Uh, passed the voluntary assisted dying legislation, legislated a number of royal commissions into institutional child sex sexual abuse recommendations, and rapidly adapted to the COVID-19 pandemic and passed emergency legislation. As all know, members know here, it is a privilege to be elected to represent our communities and sit in this place. And as I approach my heritage 20th year, I am proud to be the heritage minister who gets to sign off on this hi historic registration. Yeah. Mr Speaker. Um, yes, uh, what are you now, the, the minister local of the local government? government. Mr. Mr Speaker, I rise to table the report into the inquiry into the town of Cambridge and reaffirm the McGowan government's commitment to providing ratepayers with the standard of governance that they expect. The Deputy Director General of the Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries authorised an inquiry in accordance with section 8.32 of the Act on the 18th of April 2018. In response to a large number of complaints to both the department and my office from elected members, the community and employees of the town of Cambridge. The authorised inquiry was initiated to establish whether the town was acting in the best interests of their community and within the provisions of the Act. I wish to note that one councillor did resign in June 2020, citing the unnecessary paths of conflict actively taken by the council as contributing factors for his resignation. As a result of issues identified during the investigation in May, I served the, on the town a notice to show cause why I should not suspend them. 
The town sought judicial review in the Supreme Court, and the court found in their favour. As I have remarked previously, I am disappointed by the outcome and remain concerned for the health, safety and well-being of the town's employees. A number of critics, commentators, current and former members of parliament have used this decision and inquiry as a springboard to spread blatant mistruths and misinformation about the role of the minister, the role of the department and the motivations for government interventions in local governments. Their view of the world does not conform to reality. It is quite frankly bizarre and absurd and is bereft of any constructive criticisms that would benefit the sector. The report I'm tabling today makes 19 findings and five recommendations. It highlights consistent and sustained interference by council in the administration, a strained relationship between council and the town's employees. It also highlights the importance of the CEO in discharging their responsibilities and in, and in observing the distinct statutory delineation of council and administration under the Act. Findings in the report include the town has not provided a safe and healthy working environment. Staff have been able to, unable to properly perform their duties. Elected members have involved themselves in administrative tasks and elected members had failed to act openly and transparently. Recommendations in the report include a requirement for the town to undertake an independent governance review and comply with an audit to be undertaken by the department to ensure recommendations from the review in, are implemented. On multiple occasions, not unlikely today, unlike today, I've tabled inquiries into local governments where councils have failed to observe the clear delineation of roles and responsibilities with their administrations. This failure is the biggest culprit for the issues I repeatedly intervene in. However, in August, uh, when I gazetted regulations to clarify this, the Legislative Council disallowed these changes, citing the same fantasy land I mentioned earlier. I tabled the report. Paper tabled. Oh, Minister for Sport and Recreation, Chair. Thank you for the call, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as Minister responsible for the conduct and regulation of the combat sports in Western Australia, I am today providing a response to the coroner uh, Linton's findings and recommendations into the tragic death of 17-year-old Jessica Jackson in 2017. I again express my deepest uh, sympathy to Jessica's mother, Sharon Lindsay, and her family. Coroner Linton held an inquest into the circumstances surrounding Jessica's passing between March 10 and March 13, 2020. Coroner Linton recently presented a detailed and comprehensive report containing her findings and two uh, specific recommendations to the government. Coroner Linton's first recommendation relates to my position as the Minister of Sport and Recreation, namely to consider legislators amendments to empower the Commission to have further oversight of trainers and gyms that are responsible for the training of contestants. The second recommendation relates to the Commission giving consideration to a scheme that requires contestants to provide their weights prior to the official weigh-in. These weights can then be assessed to determine whether the contest is, a safe, is safe to be sanctioned. As a Minister, I accept the recommendations and note that the Commission, through the Chair, has also accepted the recommendations. The Commission continues to evolve the weight cutting strategy that has resulted from this tragedy, namely through education, research, regulation and weight assessment. In doing so, I have endorsed the Commission's approach via a program of consideration of consideration of considered sorry, immediate, medium and long term actions aimed at driving what has to be an ongoing process. I table a copy of the Commission's response to the coroner's recommendations. The Commission's response to the coron coroner Linton's recommendations will be a three-stage approach. The first stage will involve immediate and short-term action, including the development of a strategic plan that intertwines with the weight-cutting strategy. The second stage will move towards regulatory amendment that requires all registered trainers to hold a current first aid certificate. The third stage of implementation is a long-term approach that will focus on research and regulation. Further information on what the Commission has already done, what it recommends in doing and stages for implementation are detailed in the Commission's response to our table today. I understand the family of, of Jessica will not feel these actions go far enough. However, it is clear that the culture of excessive weight cutting in combat sports and possibly all sports must change but well, there must be a balance between the stick and the carrot. I hope the Commission, the industry and contestants embrace this opportunity 
to learn from this tragedy, creating a new culture that encourages contestants to safely manage their training and wait and work towards uh, peak performance in the sport they love. Thank you, Minister. And the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to provide an update on the reform of Aboriginal heritage laws in our state and the successful conclusion of the latest consultation period on the draft Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Bill. While the existing Aboriginal Heritage Act was considered progressive legislation when it was acted in 1972, there, have been widespread rec there has been widespread recognition for many years that the laws are not in keeping with modern values. The first attempt at reform was undertaken by the Lawrence government in 1992, but failed due to a lack of consensus. The same fate has befallen many similar attempts by subsequent governments. On this occasion, I am confident that we have a path forward. The current review process has now been underway for almost three years. With the launch of a consultation paper in 2018, a more extensive discussion paper last year, and finally the release of a draft consultation bill in September this year. The bill represents fundamental legislative reform in relation to the recognition, protection and management of Aboriginal cultural heritage in this state, and is, in effect, co-designed law making by Aboriginal people, land users and the broader community. The bill captures and celebrates the diverse elements and perspectives of Aboriginal cultural heritage and recognises that it is both a traditional and living culture that remains fundamental to the lives of Aboriginal people. It also aligns with native title, which is critical in determining the custodians of cultural heritage. The bill places Aboriginal people at the heart of decision making about their own heritage and focuses, and focuses on achieving agreement between land users and traditional owners. The three phases of consultation which have got us to this position involve more than 100 workshops and information sessions attended by more than 1,400 people. We had more than 380 submissions and about 150 targeted and individual stakeholder meetings. Parliamentary Council are now working on a range of improvements to the bill recommended through the latest consultation phase, and I am confident a final version of the bill will, will be available when Parliament returns next year. I have been enormously pleased with the constructive approach taken by those involved through all consultation phases. This clearly includes Aboriginal people, largely represented through native title bodies, claimant groups and the Aboriginal Advisory Council. Also providing helpful support for the process has been the resources industry through the Chamber of Minerals and Energy and the Association of Mining and Exploration Companies. All these stakeholders understand that if consensus cannot be achieved, the deeply flawed 1972 Act will continue. I have also been very grateful to have the support and encouragement of the opposition during this process in which to acknowledge the member for Dawesville uh, and the member for Warren Blackwood for their genuine interest in resolving this issue in a bipartisan manner which secures an enduring outcome. Mr Speaker, I am confident that the effort undertaken to reach broad consensus on these reforms will allow the best possible chance for a bill to be supported by the 41st parliament. While I will not be a member of that parliament, I will continue to follow uh, with great interest this important reform. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister for Energy. Acting Speaker, I rise to inform members about the McGowan government's continued future-proofing of our electricity network through the installation of battery storage systems on our electricity grid. Much progress has, made in has been made in 2020. On February 10, I launched Perth's first community power bank battery storage system for customers in Ellenbrook to virtually store excess solar generation to use in the afternoon and evening peak times. This was in addition to trials undertaken in Meadow Springs, Falcon and Alcamos. In the Meadow Springs trial, customers collectively saved $11,000 on their power bills. Since then, Western Power has installed 10 further batteries at Ashby, Two Rocks, Canning Vale, Vass, Kalgoorlie, Westgrove, Port Kennedy, Yokine, Parmelia and behind the metre at the Margaret River Recreation Centre. The amendments to the Electricity's Corporations Act 2005, which this government passed in the Electricity Industry Amendment Bill earlier this year, have helped to enable this continued deployment. These batteries benefit the energy network by providing near instantaneous essential system services or load following ancillary services, such as frequency regulation. Synergy customers with solar power who live in areas surrounding the power bank, uh, power bank batteries will also be able to purchase storage space to save their excess solar generation for use when they need it. 
this next generation power bank offering will be made available early next year. These batteries are in addition to the 10 Synergy Schools virtual power plants, which I announced alongside the Minister for Education in September. All of, the all of this work is an important part of our state's transition towards a low carbon future and ensuring our energy system can support the rapid up uptake of renewable generation. This government has developed a plan for our future energy uh, through our energy transformation strategy, which has developed our distributed energy resources roadmap and more recently modelled future possibilities for the grid through the whole of system plan. Thank you, Minister. Minister for Fisheries. Uh, Mr. Ekinspe, the, the Sharksmark WI app has proved popular with beachgoers, surpassing 30,000 downloads in the last 12 months. The app, part of the State Government's comprehensive shark mitigation strategy, was launched in October last year. It works seamlessly alongside the Shark Smart website to deliver near real time information on shark activity, including rent, the current alerts and warnings to beachgoers in Western Australia. It also provides information on surf life saving WA patrolled beaches, weather forecasts, and the locations of shark monitoring network receivers to help people plan their trip to the beach. The most used feature on the app continues to be updates, which sorts uh, the shark activity information according to a user's favourites or other locations. The map page is also popular, allowing users to set their favourite locations and explore shark activity and beach safety information at coastal locations. The current top five favourite locations added by users are Cottesloe Beach, Mullaloo, Scarborough Beach, Leighton Beach and City Beach. The most viewed beach safety feature is the location of shark monitoring receivers, followed by patrolled beach locations. The app also has a quick call link to enable beachgoers to report shark sightings or a whale carcass to water police as soon as possible. The reporting feature uses location services to provide information about a user's coastal location and beach emergency numbers or Ben signs to improve accuracy of report information. The app provides a common language for coastal features, which helps avoid confusion from local or common names when phoning water police. The SharkSmart uh, WA app can be downloaded for free from the App Store or Google Play. More information is available by visiting SmartShark. Smart, I'll say that again. More information is available by visiting SmartSharkApp.com.au. It is a great to see so many Western Australians thinking about their beach safety and downloading the SharkSmart WA app, WA's official source of shark activity information. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Okay, business of the Assembly, notice of a motion, to Leader of the House. Speaker, um, I move uh, that so much of the standing orders be suspended as is necessary to enable the member for Victoria Park to make a valedictory speech of not more than 30 minutes on Wednesday, 18 November 2020, between the valedictory speeches of the member for Kimberley and the Speaker. Mr Speaker, uh, just acting speaker, just briefly on this. Um, uh, obviously, uh, um, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, tremendous contribution to the state of all of our retiring members. We had some very entertaining, um, uh, albeit some politically incorrect uh, um, phrases in uh, a couple of our valedictories last evening, but um, uh, uh, colourful speeches indeed. Um, but uh, obviously with the uh, recent announcement earlier this week that um, the member for Victoria Park, the Treasurer, uh, Ben White, will not be uh, contesting the next election, that required me to uh, slot in a, another valedictory speech this evening. So just for members' uh, notice, uh, um, the valedictory speeches will commence at 5.30 uh, this, uh, this evening and also acknowledge and thank the opposition for their agreements, agreement to, um, uh, to reduce the time for private members, which I appreciate. Um, uh, that will enable at 5.30 this evening for the member for South Perth um, uh, to uh, commence his valedictory speech. That will be followed by the member for Kimberley, uh, then the member for, uh, for um, uh, Victoria Park and then, of course, um, the speaker will uh, be our final valedictory speech. Um, expected around seven for the speaker, but obviously members, depends how long members take for um, uh, their valedictories tonight. So again, I'd uh, encourage all members uh, uh, to be present in the chamber at 5.30.
uh, today uh, for those very important um, milestone speeches uh, of those members that I've mentioned. Thank you, uh, Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, rise to support the uh, notice moved by the leader of the motion moved by the leader of the house um, to extend uh, the capacity for our valedictory speeches. I'm hopeful that we see something that's a little, I don't know what the language we'd like to see, uh, different perhaps from the member for Collie Preston uh, than we experienced last time. But I hope the uh, speeches will be similarly entertaining, perhaps a little bit cleaner with the language, but otherwise I uh, look, forward, look forward to supporting the motion and, and the valedictory speeches that follow. Thank you, Member. Members, the question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Aye. You can say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Okay. Government business. Notice Speaker, the motion. Um, I, the move, the House. I, I move that for the remainder of this year, so much of the standing orders be suspended as is necessary to enable messages from the Legislative Council to be taken into consideration on the day in which they are received. And again, briefly speaking to this motion, Mr Speaker, um, obviously, uh, we are winding down now to the uh, conclusion of the 40th Parliament. Um, today and tomorrow will be the official final days of Parliament. However, as you're aware, on the 25th of um, uh, this month, we will have a joint sitting uh, in the other place to uh, install um, a new senator for Western Australia. Um, but uh, also we have foreshadowed that um, it is likely that the House will uh, need to reconvene uh, uh, at a date to be finally set um, in uh, uh, early December to um, receive messages from the other place. As members will be aware, the other place is debating um, uh, a series of uh, um, uh, uh, bills from this place. Uh, there are a number of them that are priority bills and that we are seeking, seeking uh, the forbearance of the uh, uh, members of the other place to um, deal with those. And so I, I would expect that um, uh, we will be receiving messages um, um, from the other place, and this uh, this motion, of course, enables us uh, to um, receive those and deal with those um, considerations of those legislative council messages on the day in which they are received. Thank you, Leader. Um, Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, support the motion to ensure that we can receive those uh, legislative council messages when and if they appear. Uh, noting, of course, do we have an understanding, Leader of the House? Uh, by way of injection, when we might be hosting the joint sitting on the 25th? Yeah, what time? 11 uh, 11.30. 11.30, we, we commence in here. Right, yes. yeah. um, and in that case, um, look forward to that day and then the 4th as well, possibly the 4th for a recall. So um, continue to work with the government as we have in the spirit of uh, cooperation to make sure we can pass any messages that come through this place. Thank you, Member. Members. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. You can say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Government business orders of the day. Government business order of the day number one appropriation recurrent 2017 18 supplementary bill 2018 and appropriation capital 2017 18 supplementary bill 2018. Second reading adjourned debate. Member for Wanneroo. Thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. Um, I rise to make a contribution to this general debate today. And it's the second last day of this, the 40th Parliament. And so it's that it's, in all likelihood, the last opportunity for me to get to my feet in this chamber to speak before I face the people of Wanneroo and ask them again uh, to do me the honour of um, electing me as the member for Wanneroo at the state election on March the 13th. Um, I've now been the member for Wanneroo for three years and I think coming up to nine months as part of the McGowan Labor government. This McGowan Labor government in its is in its fourth year and we've been a stable and strong government who've kept WA safe throughout this most extraordinary of years. We've delivered a strong 2020 budget that matches these times. Um, Mr Acting Speaker, we're focused on protecting the health of the community and our budget and strong financial management is leading the state's economic recovery, keeping people in jobs and creating an unprecedented pipeline of jobs as we go forward. Most people um, would acknowledge that it's this McGowan government's responsible budget management and the strength of WA's economy prior to the pandemic that has provided WA with the capacity and flexibility to immediately respond to the impacts of COVID-19 across the state. 
We've been able to make WA safe and strong because of our financial management over the entire period of this government since coming to office in 2017. We are where we are because this state Labor government has been disciplined, coordinated and, and solid throughout the term of this government. We're in this position because this government has been responsible financial man managers for over three and a half years. In just three short years, WA Labor has got the budget back under control, turning the previous Liberal National Government's record deficits into surpluses and have been the only government in the country to pay down debt. The McGowan Labor government's focus on budget repair set us up in a strong position to be able to respond to this pandemic. We continue to show financial responsibility, which allows us to continue to respond to this pandemic in a way that will keep us safe and keep our economy strong. And members, it's not lost on me what's happening in South Australia and what's occurred in Victoria. It is a very fluid situation. We don't know what's going to happen next. And people I talk to in my community are very comfortable that we've got a strong and stable government who've got the financial and government capacity to respond as we need to when required. Um, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking a little bit about the way we've actually responded this year throughout the COVID-19 situation. I know a lot of the debate tends to get taken up about borders and whether we should have them or not, and we know how the opposition feel about that. But I wanted to sort of focus a, a few minutes, if I can, on the actual actions that this government has taken in terms of leading the COVID response and recovery in the last, um, since March. Um, the member for Armadale uh, a few weeks ago gave us a great recount of the timeline of events of how this pandemic has unfolded around the world, Australia and here in WA. But I wanted to take this opportunity to just recap on what the McGowan Labor government has done in response to the pandemic going back from March and um, how we have ensured to keep West Australians safe and strong. Um, and I should really speed talk through, through some of the things I want to highlight because there's been so many things that this government has done. For example, I'll speed up a little bit through some of these. On March the 16th, we announced a $607 million stimulus package to support WA households and small businesses in the wake of COVID-19, including $402 million to freeze household fees and charges at least until July 2021 doubling to $600 the energy assistance payment for vulnerable West Australians, including pensioners. On March 16th, we introduced up to 20 days COVID paid leave available to public sector workers. We moved quickly to support our public sector workers to make sure that those who are sick stay home, ensuring a safe working environment and helping to reduce the spread of the virus. And of course, we know it is the public sector and the strength of the public sector that has kept Western Australia going throughout this pandemic. And so very early on, we recognised that, ensuring that our public sector could access leave if they needed to in, in case they became unwell. That was back on, in March. On March the 19th, the McGowan government, government announced an immediate pay rise for police. Back in March, the police we know are at the front line of our response to the pandemic and we ensured they felt supported and valued right at the beginning of this pandemic. On March the 30th, we announced a $159 million COVID-19 relief fund to provide crisis support by prioritising the Lottery West grants. On March the 30th, we announced a $25 million package of rent relief for small businesses and non-for-profits, including rent waivers on tenants of government buildings. On March the 31st, we announced further relief for households experienced financial hardship through a $1 billion COVID-19 economic health relief package. This included measures such as one-off offsets of $2,500 for 95,000 small businesses in this state, waiving of payroll tax. And what our actions back in March meant was that no one suffering financial hardship was going to have their power or water disconnected. On Wednesday the 8th of April, we announced a $91.2 million police package. This included 150 additional police officers that we recruited immediately and $17.8 million to expand police tracking and tracing capabilities. On the 14th of April, we introduced new laws to provide support for commercial and residential tenants and landlords, including a moratorium on evictions for small commercial tenancies. 
On the 23rd of April, we announced a new $154 million relief package to support tenants, landlords and, and the construction industry, including $100 million in land tax relief grants for commercial landlords who reduced their rents for small businesses, and $24.5 million to assist the building and construction industry to maintain a skilled workforce and apprentices, including $5 million encouraging people to take on free <laughs> short courses so we could make sure that we could keep having a skilled, work for, skilled workforce as we move through this pandemic. On April 30th, we announced the fast tracking of major projects to support jobs by establishing a statewide construction panel to exped expedite delivery of key projects. In fact, more than $140 million of road and maritime projects Always, have been fast tracked to create more jobs. On the 13th of May, we announced a $14.4 million package to support the tourism industry. On May the 20th, we announced historic planning reforms. This once in a lifetime reform has allowed much needed economic activity by providing certainty for major investors of our big projects. But it's so much more as cut red tape for small businesses and allowed even people in my electorate to go and get a pergola built in their backyard quickly uh, without all the red tape of local government. On the 21st of May, we announced the fast tracking of $12 million of sports grants. On the 3rd of June, we announced new land releases to further activate and expand the Nirubup Industrial Estate, which services Perth's fastest growing northern corridor and is going to be the home of the future jobs in my electorate. On the 5th of June, we scrapped fees so we could support more than 3,000 displaced apprentices and trainees to safeguard our future workforce. On the 7th of June, I'm only up to June, Members, on the 7th of June, we announced a $444 million housing stimulus package. Of course, $319 million to support people to build, buy, renovate, and maintain social housing, and of course, the very popular and significant um, scheme of $117 million towards $20,000 grant for new home buyers. And I'm seeing the impact, the successful impact of that scheme in my corridor, members. Uh, Lots of land being bought up my way, lots of tradies in job, can't get enough bricklayers and tradies to build those house, houses fast enough in Wanneroo. On the 1st of July, we announced a $36 million um, investment to make sure we had an elective surgery blitz to catch up on all those elective surgeries that, that had had to be suspended during the lockdown. On the 2nd of July, we announced a $55, sorry, $57 million package into our TAFE sector, including free TAFE courses and major reductions in fees to 39 high priority qualifications to make sure that we've got our young people trained and ready, go, ready to go for the jobs that we're creating. On Sunday the 5th of July, we um, gave a $6.8 million boost to financial counselling services. And on the 23rd of July, there was a $10 million support package for the manufacture of WA made P PNP. And that only gets us up to July members. And then, of course, on July the 26th, the Premier announced our $5.5 billion recovery plan. This plan has seen an unprecedented $5.5 billion investment to support us through the COVID-19 and drive our economic and social recovery. It was designed to get West Australians back to work and is creating thousands of local jobs in important sectors such as construction, manufacturing, tourism, hospita hospitality, renewable energy, education and training, agriculture, mining and conservation. And I just want to take a moment to read a few more of those. Um, bear with me, members. On 26th of July, the Premier announced $66.3 million investment into renewable energy technologies. On the 27th of July, the McGowan government announced our Green Job Plan, which sees $60 million invested in environmental projects, creating more than 1,000 conservation jobs in this state. On the 31st of July, we announced a $330 million investment into industry, and I just want to highlight one particular one, which I'm happy about for Wanneroo, as part of that industry investment, saw $20 million come to Wanneroo towards a robotics and automation physical test facility as part of a 94 hectare precinct north of the current Nirubup industrial estate to support research. And of course, on the 28th of July, we had an announcement of the biggest TAFE investment in history, 
which saw $229 million invested to upgrade existing TAFE facilities and, of course, to provide even more fee cuts uh, to important, important courses that we need our young people to get access to. On the 2nd of August, we announced $300 million investment throughout the state in, the sport, uh, in sports and, and community infrastructure upgrades. On the 3rd of August, we announced, my favourite, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment, $492 million worth of investment into our new schools and existing schools um, across the state. And I'll touch in a moment a little bit on what that means for my schools in Wanneroo. On the 4th of August, we announced $8.2 million um, of funding for resource ex exploration. And I want to highlight this, this one too. We often talk about how important mining is to this state and how it's led our economic recovery and that of the nation. But we also need to focus on resource exploration and make sure we have mining projects well into the future. And this government, as part of the re uh, recovery plan, has done so. On the 5th of August, we announced investment boosting local manufacturing. And most people, of course, would know and People are very supportive of more than $40 million going into constructing a new diesel rail car maintenance facility, which means that we are going to build the trains in Western Australia with West Australian people providing West Australian jobs. And on the 8th of August, $150 million was invested into the state's tourism industry, including important maintenance and capital works upgrades to places like uh, Kings Park, Margaret River, Karajini, Monkey Mire, the Pinnacles, Rottnest Island and Ingaloo. And we all know how well the local tourism sector is going at the moment as people are discovering their, their state. On the 14th of August, we announced um, a massive uh, $40 million injection into our food industry plan, which supports local production of food, something very important to Wanneroo indeed. And on the 17th of August, $22 million of investment came to make sure that we invest in renewable energy, in particular hydrogen, become a player in that emerging field. Um, I'll leave that one. And of course, uh, there's too many, I'm running out of time. Um, and on the 22nd of, and on the 22nd of September, and the 22nd of September, uh, we are hopeful, we are investing, uh, we announced $18.34 million to build defence manufacturing workforce. We are skilling up West Australians to take, take that, that submarine work. We are just waiting on the federal government to make sure that they invest in Western Australia. We're ready to take it. We'll wait and see what the feds say to us. Look, um, <laughs> there's no doubt our economic strategy and, and uh, the, some of the investments that are highlighted are having an impact and are providing a pipeline of local jobs. We delivered the budget in October, and of course, the two things that I just want to quickly highlight are uh, three things. Firstly, it was a responsible budget with a surplus of $1.2 billion that will allow us to be agile and continue to have the capacity to respond as this pandemic continues to impact us and play out across this state, Australia and the world. Um, I want to highlight two things in particular which uh, have had a great impact certainly in my community and of course as part of the responsible financial management of this state. Every WA household will receive the $600 credit on their electricity bill and I've had great feedback on that. It is having an impact, and it's great to see that so many people in my electorate are not only appreciating it, but wanting to pour that money straight back into the local economy by buying, by buying uh, and spending that money in their local uh, uh, community. And of course, we are very keen. We are very keen also on, on keeping members our local communities safe, safe. Um, and our, one of, another key uh, announcement as part of the 2020 budget was the recruitment of 800 more police officers on top of the 300 new police officers being delivered. Members. Members, um, you know I would. Uh, I want to focus on education. Um, the nearly $500 million invested throughout the state is having an impact, but I want to highlight the impact that it's having in my electorate of Wanneroo. Um, as you know, 
Mr Acting Speaker, I was a teacher for 27 years, so you wouldn't be surprised that I want to just take a few moments to highlight those things. Um, I'm particularly proud of those. Um, that package means that $25.1 million is being spent right now in my schools in the electorate of Wanneroo. Uh, Joseph Banks Secondary College is receiving $16.1 million um, to build an impressive new building to provide not only general classroom and specialist classrooms in STEM, of course, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, Minister, but as part of their plans for a space academy at the school. That's going to be, it's going to be outstanding. Um, I have two government secondary schools in my electorate, and the second one, Wanneroo, of course, is the school where I graduated. Um, the, the new gymnasium, which I delivered as part of an election commitment in 2017. Mr Acting Speaker, may I have an extension, please? Extension granted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Wanneroo Secondary College, my old uh, stomping ground. The new gymnasium is fantastic. Can't wait for the Premier to visit there on Monday. Um, yeah, might even get him to shoot some hoops with me. Yeah. Isn't he indoors? Is yeah, isn't he indoorsful today? Um, yeah. Look, and I understand if yeah he is. Um, but the, but the announcement, of course, that was made as part of the the, the recovery plan is we are now uh, uh, committed to investing five million dollars additionally to Wanneroo Secondary College so they can now have a brand new performing arts centre. And that's not an election commitment, members, if I'm re-elected. It's actually happening right now. The, uh, the, architect, the architect has been um, has appointed and the works are being undertaken right now. As part of the $25.1 million, of course, new early childhood centres are being are being developed. Uh, the, the architects have also been appointed at, at East Wanneroo Primary School and also at Spring Hill Primary School. And that's on top of the previous uh, commitments that I del delivered as, as part of my election promises in 2017, which has seen tapping get a new um, undercovered area, science labs in Karama tapping East Wanneroo and Wanneroo Primary School, and of course the maintenance blitz in December, which has been so significant across all of my schools in assisting them in their small maintenance work and providing a jobs uh, pipeline for local tradies in my area. The projects are underway, they're, they're happening right now. And so, Mr Speaker, I try very hard to be positive in this place and I don't want to criticise the opposition, but sometimes it does get a bit hard. It, sometimes it's necessary, especially if they try and uh, you know touch me up in regards to education. And I do, I do want to take this opportunity to highlight a couple of things. And member for, and member for Dawesville, um, I really, really would love you to interject in a moment and explain something to me because I'd, I'd be really keen to hear your perspective on it. Um, the, the couple of bits that I want to refer to in particular is uh, uh, in regard to the opposition leader's Facebook. Um, this is interesting. Yeah, I mean, if you want to see the leader of the opposition, you actually have to go to her Facebook member for Kalamunda, because if you go to the Facebook of, a, of any of her Liberal colleagues, she doesn't actually appear there. Yeah. Um, member for so Kareem. I don't member see for I don't see the opposition le leader member on the opposite. It's the Darnest thing. Member for Kareem. Now, on the sick. Member for Kareem, there is no point of order. Sit down. Sit down. Thank you. Member, member, member for, member for, for, member for <laughs> mem Must be the only one. Uh, I didn't hear that. No. So, member for Wanneroo, carry on, please. It's like, it's like it looks member for Kalamunda. Me Your own members on her feet. <laughs> member for Kareem. It's all right, um, Mr. Acting Speaker. If you don't sort him out, I will shortly because I'm going in the chair. <laughs> Um, um, so I'm going to tell the truth because I'm going to show you a couple of Facebook posts from the Leader of the Opposition. And this is from the 6th of September. The first one... No, no, I, I just... The, uh, never, point of order. Oof. Approval from the Speaker, and I'm not certain that that's occurred in this case. 
It's a, well, I think it goes... Oh, is that what doing there? I'll bring in a poster then this big and it's just a piece of paper. Look, <laughs> Mr Acting Speaker, I won't hold it up. I'll describe it for you. May I do that? <laughs> do that then, Member. So the no the Facebook on post, the 6th of September, which I'm describing, and you'll be keen to go back to it, shows a generic photograph of Joseph Banks. I notice a generic one because she hasn't actually been up there, no, no. Um, not in all the time that I've been there. And I quote from it, and it says, the teachers and students at Joseph Banks Secondary College in our northern suburbs will benefit from our commitment of $16 million to building new classrooms. Now, I'm confused about that because it's, 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 yeah. it's not your commitment, it's not your deliverable, it's actually in this budget of this Labor, McGowan state government. So how you can actually say that it's yours baffles me. You may interject at any point now to set me right on that point. I noticed the member for Dawes has gone all quiet. I just spoke then. Just in case, just in case it was a misprint or a, a wrong Facebook post, on the 7th of September, there was also a lovely generic photograph of Wanneroo Secondary School, because guess what? She ain't been there either for the last three and a half years. So she grabbed a generic photo, and in it it says, our $5 million investment to Wanneroo Secondary College will give our students greater opportunities with a new performing arts centre. Now, it's not your commitment. You've got to think up something new. You're about to go to the election in 2021, and you've got to come up with your own ideas, your own syllables, and please come out and provide some future commitments from my schools. That would be wonderful. But don't try and sell my commitments that I've worked very, very hard on by being an advocate for my schools for the last three and a half years and pretend that they're yours. Member for Dawesville, I'm disappointed. I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm, I'm disappointed that you, you aren't setting me straight because it's obviously. It's, could you explain to me why your leader posted and said it was her commitment funding that the state uh, McGowan Labor government has committed? and is doing right now in my electorate. Sure. How does that work? So in 115 days when, when we take over the Treasury <laughs> benches, what will happen is we'll continue that investment. So it's our commitment. Oh, continue that investment. <laughs> it, well, you should perhaps... Thank you, Member. Perhaps what you should... Perhaps what you should have said is... So perhaps the Post should have said, we support the McGowan government's investment in Wanneroo and we undertake to continue it if we're elected. That would have been a probably more accurate way to, to, to post it. Look, um, at some point you have to roll up your sleeves and present yourself as an alternative. Come up with your own ideas. The electricity policy that you've come out, I'm telling you now, that's a dud. Uh, yeah, you didn't do too well last time, Ryan, suggesting that you were going to privatise Western Power, and it's not going to work this time. And your other second great uh, thought bubble in terms of shopping hours. I don't know where that came from. Again, the, the Leader of the Opposition is obviously not walking through the shopping centre at Wanneroo because I can tell you small businesses don't want to open up on, uh, early on Sunday. In fact, a lot of the small business... In Member fact, Karine. most of the small businesses don't even open on a Member Sunday because Karine. it's not worth their while. So where is your policy? You're lazy, you're incompetent and you are dysfunctional. We, are, on the other hand, are a strong and reliable team. I can see the envy on you, Ms. Uh, Member for Dawesville. We've got more women in the parliament. We have 15 in the LA Legislative Assembly at the moment. We have seven set... Look, you've got more bald men in this chamber than you have women. So, Member for Corrine, just be quiet. You've got, three, you've got more bald men... Members. You've got more bald men in the Legislative Assembly. <laughs> Member for Corrine. <laughs> a genetic, a genetic, this, a genetic trait is being now mocked in this parliament by this member. A genetic trait. Thank you. And thank so, you. does that mean all genetic members. traits will be mocked by members of, of this parliament in the future? Silence. Thank you. And is that acceptable to mock genetic traits? I want a ruling on that. You sit down, member for Green. Thank um, you. It was a. Mem uh, um, it was just pointing out facts. Ms. Mr. So Acting Speaker, I'm quarter. a woman, and the member for Green is bald. Um, I, and I noticed there are some more bald 
people on, on yeah. But yeah, so yeah, Member but we have more Kareem. women. The point Member was for Corrine. I'm going to have now, to call you shortly. I also want. I also want Member to just very Kareem, briefly. I'll call you for the first time. Uh, yeah, I also want to just briefly touch on. Uh, I know we we talk and rightly so about uh, COVID-19, and it's taken up everyone's energy. Whether you're a local member, whether you are a minister or the government, it is the most extraordinary of years. But I also want to just briefly, for for a couple of seconds, highlight the reform agenda that has been the hallmark of the McGowan government over the last four years: voluntary assisted dying, container deposit scheme. No body, no parole. Revenge porn laws, giving redress to victims of child sex abuse. Mandatory reporting of child sex abuse by priests. We do reforming legislation, and we will continue to do so if we are re-elected in 2021. And of course, what we offer for 21 is pretty exciting, Member for Dawesville. I think we're heading your way a little bit more in terms of how many we might be having sitting in this place. We are offering not only a strong and stable government, but the candidates, the candidates that the WA Labor Party has selected for pre-selection to run in seats are quite phenomenal. Mr. A member for Dawesville, you'd know one of them pretty well, a paramedic in Dawesville, Lisa Monday. She's going to be a fantastic contributor to this place. In Albany, we've got Rebecca Stevens, fantastic woman. In Collie Preston, we've pre-selected another teacher, Jodie Harns, to fill the shoes of um, uh, uh, the Minister McMurray. In Darling Range, we've got Hugh Jones. In Kalgoorlie, we've got the Dynamo Ali Kent. In Geraldton, we've got Laura Dalton. In Scarborough, we've got the Sparky, Stuart Aubrey. In Hillary's, we've got another teacher, Caitlin Collins. It's going, it, we, we have pre-selected to join this team, this existing team, a fantastic range of candidates who I know will work incredibly hard for their electorates, won't take them for granted and be part of a McGowan government that will continue to manage this pandemic, manage the economy to make sure that we say, stay safe and strong. Um, members, I just wanted to finish, um, and, and I'm sure it's the same for, for all, all of you in this place. Today, this year's been overwhelming to be in public life um, I've felt more connected to my community than ever. I've had thousands of conversations on the phone and on the doors with the residents I, I um, represent to check on them, to see how they're doing, to understand how we as a government can support them and to receive feedback on what they want their governments to do. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, my residents support the McGowan Labor government's approach of putting WA first. Overwhelmingly, my residents support our border control measures, which has kept our state safe and strong. It's, um, I want to give a special shout out to my electorate staff of uh, Johanna Fredrickson, Justin Pereira and Hayden Mills. The work that they've done this year has been quite incredible in supporting individuals in my community who in lots of different ways have been in, impacted by COVID, whether it's having their elective surgery delayed whether it's trying to get a loved one home from interstate or overseas, or whether it's assisting a young person who's been displaced from their work. It's the most incredible time to be serving your community, and there's never been a greater time to serve it. And I look forward to being in this place come March to represent the members, uh, the members and the residents of Wanneroo for another four years. Thank you. Thank you, Member. A member for Perth. I'd just like to uh, contribute to this uh, uh, general debate. Um, I'd also like to start where the member for Wanneroo has finished in terms of uh, the, the year that we have faced, and it has been extraordinary um, times, uh, and e every local member will have worked hard to assist their constituencies uh, and their communities. Uh, in relation to responding to a global pandemic. I just have one observation uh, from this time, and what has struck me uh, in the electorate of Perth has been the way that the lo local community came together, uh, particularly when the pandemic first hit. Um, I was pleasantly surprised, but I expected it that my community would rally 
together to assist those most vulnerable, those in need, uh, those who are al alone uh, or, uh, or don't have family or friends. Um, and, and that was obviously particularly seniors. And my office organised a seniors outreach program. I think we were the first electorate office to do it and the member for Dillsville, like everything, copied me. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> and uh, my office and I um, reached out, we got volunteers in, and I personally called, and this is a fact, I personally called two and a half thousand seniors in my electorate. Um, and from that, what was... They still talk about the phone calls. They do, they remember those phone calls. And from that, uh, what really struck me was that so many elderly, vulnerable, isolated people were already being looked after by people in their streets and their neighbourhoods. And in fact, People would come into my office, photo, uh, you know, photocopy a flyer, uh, and then distribute it in their streets, and that was unprompted from my office. So it really did show this incredible sense of uh, community. Uh, and like the member for Nauru says, I've, uh, the door, I'm back to door knocking post, uh, post reaching, uh, I think it was phase three. And um, what strikes me is that there is a genuine appreciation of the leadership provided by our Premier Mark McGowan, safe and strong leadership uh, during these times, that people do look with sadness, for example, to the United States, where we are seeing uh, increasing terrifying waves of COVID uh, and appreciate how fortunate that we are to live in Western Australia, and that is both a result of uh, West Australians rallying together, but also the firm leadership by our Premier, the Deputy Premier, the Emergency Council, the Cabinet, uh, both our initial response and ongoing economic response. I do want to talk, uh, in terms of that economic response, to three key issues uh, during, this, uh, during this time. The first about the Perth City deal, which I think has been underestimated in terms of the impact for the city. Secondly, planning reform, which will, uh, we've only done phase one and phase two is yet to come, is critically needed. And number three, my favourite topic, local government reform uh, and the need and change that is required there. In terms of the Perth City deal, it's interesting, I've seen some of the usual critics uh, say, oh, this is not substantial, it's not transformational. Be very clear on this, that the Perth City deal is the most important uh, infrastructure package and change for our city in, in decades and decades. It is far more important than Elizabeth Quay and Yagan Square uh, and City Link. Now, some people may question how I can make that claim, but I'll, I'll make it on this basis. Um, I like CityLink. I like Elizabeth Key. Yeah, you can square, yeah. Um, it's OK. It's, I'll get into the design challenges. But um, they... Them in themselves aren't attra major attractives of people for our city. That's the simple reality, is, is that... Perth has ample, large public spaces. Uh, Elizabeth Quay, Yagan Square and, and Extra, other parts of the city link, and that adds to our existing public spaces. And they're not major attractors to the city. People may pop into Yagan Square once or Elizabeth Quay, but that's it. And ultimately, we know this, and good urban planning is very demonstrate, demonstrates this, is that people attract people. People are the critical ingredient. Uh, it seems a little bit chicken and egg scenario, but the reality is, is, is that we, you know, in, in times of non-COVID, people travel to great cities around the world. And when they talk about their great experience, it often comes back to that street experience, that they sat on, sit at a cafe, watch people walk by, that the vibrancy, 
that people bring to a city. That's the attractive experience. And this is why ECU campus is critical, because by 2025, it will guarantee 9,000 new students into the city. And for so many reasons, this is critical for the future of Perth. It will mean more foot traffic every day in the city. So more people walking. And it's actually shown that those university students, while they have less income, they have higher levels of disposable income, and they will spend it in the shops and support small business. This is critical. Secondly, it will spur on accommodation in the city. So it won't just guarantee pop, uh, a day population, but it will guarantee a night population. New towers will be built. And this, once post-COVID, will be attractive to uh, international students. Part of the reason why Western Australia has struggled in the international student market is because uh, international students crave for that city experience that Melbourne or Sydney delivers. Now, of course, in a post-COVID world, things will change, but we will be able to offer that through major new city campus that just doesn't include WAPA, but also business, uh, and this will spur accommodation. And we'll see an increase in safety. We, yes, uh, an increased police presence is very welcome, and of course, we will deliver on the biggest injection ever of 800 new police. But actually, Having 9,000 students in our city is just as critical because more people on the street means less opportunity for crime, means safer streets. And that's why parts of, for example, east end of the city don't necessarily feel safe because on a Wednesday night, you can look down the street and there is no one there at all. Now, the City of Perth has, and the commissioners have backed an ambitious target of 90,000 uh, people to live. And I'm very confident that ECU uh, will be a major um, factor in contributing to that population. Now, I did mention Yagan Square. I actually have really rallied behind it. I appreciate it was a previous initiative of the, of the, the last government. I acknowledge uh, and I uh, deeply appreciate the uh, traditional owners, but as an urban design space, it's not as effective as one could hope. And the simple reality is, is that people walk right through and past. And in fact, my understanding was original uh, planners had actually suggested that a road go through, and in fact, the bridge um, be used as uh, for buildings and for a pedestrian amenity. I think that could have been really interesting for our city. But what ECU represents is an ability to pump life into Yagan Square, and I'm really excited by this. And certainly I am personally advocating uh, and supporting that uh, ECU look to take over the ground floor plate of Yagan Square uh, as a first demonstration of the potential, run classes there, promote the new university campus and support the other existing businesses in Yagan Square. Because ultimately, Yagan Square could become part of the ECU campus, and I find that exciting. You could imagine that amphitheatre filled with students during a lunch break. There is so much uh, potential. Uh, we will really see a university precinct develop in the heart of Perth, and I think it is, uh, it is the changing, it will change the face of our city. Um, there are other elements of the, of the Perth City deal that are worth mentioning, particularly uh, the CBD transport plan of 105 million. There is no doubt that the city of Perth, and this is not a criticism of council, but the city of Perth lags as a walking and cycling city than other cities around the world. Um, it is disappointing because we have an incredible river. People love walking along the river. Uh, it's seen as one of the best assets, but we really have to invest more in walking and cycling in the city. And I just don't mean for the lycra set, I actually mean for 
mums and dads and kids, that on the weekend they might cycle into the city. And what is shown again is walkable and cyclable cities have stronger economic activities. That rather than a car that simply drives through a street, uh, people walk or hop off their bike, linger, look at a small business, sit at a local cafe. The research and evidence, the economic research is there. So I'm deeply proud that as a state government, we're investing 105 million, including a new iconic bridge a pedestrian and cycling bridge and gateway to East Perth, which the residents and businesses are incredibly excited. We are investing in cultural assets and the only other place that I would like as part of that package is the Perth Cultural Centre. I am chair of the task force. We have incredible institutions there, um, incredible institutions, but the public space fails those institutions. It is hot. It is barren, um, there are no trees, the amphitheatre doesn't work, and uh, we are now out to the market uh, looking for an uh, urban architectural firm to produce a master plan, which may be delivered in phases and which hopefully uh, successive governments, uh, obviously we've put uh, 20 million, which is a very strong start uh, towards the redevelopment of that. And what we imagine is a, a boulevard of trees where people can walk, cycle, that we have more intimate spaces. As I've said, we do not necessarily need big, hot cement spaces. It, they don't attract people. Uh, they're not friendly. Tourists don't flock there. Um, we really need to reimagine uh, that public space. And of course, with the new museum, uh, which is uh, opening very soon, I think it will become apparent that we really do need to invest in that uh, public space. That's the first area, the Perth City deal, and I think it really is, I'll say this again, it is going to be the biggest transformational piece uh, for our CBD, and I'm mighty proud it's being delivered under a state Labor government. The second part is local government reform. And I do want to address this because it is apparent uh, that there are still signature issues and problems facing the sector. I think everyone on all sides of politics are sick and tired of inquiries that are generated and dysfunction uh, in local government. Uh, it's no good for anyone. Uh, it's not good for ratepayers. It's not good for the staff who try to do their best. It's not good for the councillors. It can be a very deeply distressing process. But it is necessary sometimes to provide uh, a, um, a line in the sand for an organisation to move forward, uh, as is the case with the City of Perth. Um, so I do want to say this. I, it's funny, we do need a new act. I do want to say that this minister has brought in a number of reforms that I do want to go over. We brought in the Auditor General Oversight of, the local, of local governments, which is actually critical and is important to accountability and transparency. We brought in changes and amendments about the suspension and dismissal of councils and individual councilmen. Uh, members, which was required. We brought in a range of new changes to lift transparent accountability, mand mandatory uh, training for elected members. Uh, we also brought in new CO standards. We changed and reformed gift disclosures, which were clearly causing problems and confusions, and more information to the public. And then my colleague, uh, the uh, the uh, member for Balcatta, released the local government review port re review report that lines a pathway forward in terms of creating a new modern act for local government, which reflects the realities of what we face. And I do want to say this, and I think it is important, that local governments do not face the same scrutiny as the state government. When you think about it, there is no state parliament, there is no parliament, there's no opposition, there's no estimates, there is a question time, but it can be very condensed. Um, 
there is much greater scrutiny of media of the state government than local. I admit, yes, local government can generate some great tabloid stories, but local papers are declining. So we actually do need to increase public transparency and scrutiny. And I want to say this, people, when we talk about local government reform, assume that we're talking about amalgamations or changes. And I think an observation is fair to say, and I look at my own council, the City of Vincent, that small councils have struggled during the COVID-19 pandemic, and it has been a challenge. But I think it's also fair to say that the idea of council amalgamations is dead and buried. And I don't do this as a, a big political point, but I think it is fair to say that the, the whole debate uh, burnt many people uh, in the, in the, under the previous government, and that people like my council that really did try to legitimately engage with the process, and I know Frio did and other councils, I'll ask for an extension, extension uh, did struggle. So I think there has been so much loss, uh, so much distrust that the idea of council amalgamations, uh, which I think are probably still warranted, particularly in the western suburbs, are off the, the agenda, I believe, for successive governments. So what our new Act must do is put that contentious area aside and instead focus on creating an act that is more that allows does allow more flexibility for councils in some regard but also lifts the basic benchmarks and i want to refer to and i'll just give a couple of examples the first relates to the appointment of ceos um, i do believe that there needs to be greater scrutiny and accountability of administrations and in particular ceos my own experience as the Mayor of the City of Vincent has shaped that, but also speaking when I was the Mayor of Vincent, engaging others. Uh, in particular, what shocked me was that people appointed CEOs that delegate the duties off and not give it much more thought. Uh, there were examples where CEOs were appointed where not all the council had seen the contract. Now, you, you buy a house. When you buy a house, you look at a contract. But CEOs were being pointed in Western Australia where not the full councils uh, were being looking at a contract. So there are regulations being drafted now, which the minister has already flagged. And this will spell out, and I have championed this, a much clearer, transparent process which ensures that councillors are involved in the critical decision making. That includes, for example, that when you're going to advertise to the market, that all councillors vote on the advertising brief. So everyone is very clear what type of CO that you're looking at. That when there is a contract, every member of the council must review the contract and see it and understand it. And if required, have in, like we did at the City of Vincent, have a lawyer present to go through uh, that contract. That is critical. And there is a third element that I think in is critical and it was recommended by the panel that after two terms, that a CEO, uh, after two five-year terms, the CEO's position should automatically go out to the market. Now, I understand Walga doesn't necessarily like this, but I actually think it is critical that CEOs, and they may have done extraordinary performances, but their job still goes out to test the market to see who else is there. And the reason for this is part simple, is that we know some CEOs, and they won't like this, but some CEOs stay in a local government for 20, 30 years. The culture develops around them. Mayors come, councils come and go, but ultimately it's the CEO shaping the organisation. And new councillors and a new mayor may feel intimidated may feel intimidated about actually daring to ask whether a CEO position should be advertised because someone has been there for so long. So if we have an automatic feature that says after two terms, not because of politics, but because it is just part of the process that it goes back out to the market to be tested, um, I think this should be welcomed. Because I'll be frank, I don't think it's healthy for any organisation to have a CEO for 20 to 30 years. 
You don't get new ideas. You don't get thinking outside the box. Uh, in fact, what you can get, as we've seen, is fiefdoms built in local government. So we need to look at that. We also need to look at just basic reporting to our community. When I was the Mayor of Vincent and first came in, uh, my council had a very poor rating in terms of trust and good governance. In fact, the last Catalyse survey, which had been done, which is basically local governments engage an independent agency to, in, to consult the community and rate local government on, based on a number of factors, including good governance, good leadership, uh, accountability and so forth. It, City of Vincent came in second last. And so what we did at the City of Vincent was actually look at how we could drive better trust in our organisation. So what we did was we made a number of different areas publicly reportable online for anyone to see any time. And some of these are actually can be contentious. We put all conflicts of interest, so impartiality, proximity interest, fiscal, financial, they were all put on, a, on, on our website and constantly updated. So you could see, you can still see as the Mayor of Vincent during my time when I declared everything. So it gives people a sense of history. Contracts, over 150,000. The details with the organisation put online. Um, tenders put online. But I think the most interesting, which has been contentious in some local governments, is a lease register. So every lease that the City of Vincent entered into, the type of property, the organisation, the amount of money, the options in that lease, is all put online. And that's actually critically important. We know with sporting organisation, leases, how much each other is paying, uh, can actually cause division in the community and local government. So I take the view is this, that the more information, because local government is not subject to the same scrutiny as like a vehicle of parliament, it is actually critically important that we set higher benchmarks for them uh, and that kind of tool of public registers is actually really critical. So I am hopeful that in a second term of a Mark McGowan Labor government, uh, following the release of the local uh, panel report uh, that was this year, that we can begin or see uh, that second tranche of local, major tranche of local government reform in Western Australia that will lift um, and set uh, new public benchmarks for reporting to ratepayers and, in particular, for me, will set new transparent and accountable mechanisms for council and for the community in relation to the appointment of CEOs, which ultimately are the only employee of any council. Empl the CEO is the one choice that a government, local government, can make that sets the direction for council. The last area that I want to talk about is planning reform um, in the six minutes I have left. And planning reform I, ha I am deeply proud to have championed planning reform in Western Australia. And in particular, some of the smaller changes which I genuinely believe will have lasting and significant impacts for small business uh, in Western Australia. But I do want to say this. These, these reforms, which include the streamlined, centralised process, doesn't mean we want to see or guarantee shoddy developments or developments that are completely out of the ballpark. So it's not to see a hundred storey tower in a three storey zone. And I think if there is any of those in the development industry that just see it as a free kick, it's not. And in fact, the process has a longer community consultation process. Uh, it has more earlier uh, engagement up front with a range of government agencies like main roads and local government and also has a requirement to engage with the state design review panel. These are all important changes. So the message to the development sector is do not think, despite these reforms being critical and needed, that it is simply uh, anything goes approach. It is not. 
uh, and I am pleased that, it, that there is oversight by the WA Public, uh, by the WA Planning Commission and the State Design Review Panel. But I want to say that there are smaller reforms that are actually important. And the one that I personally championed as Mayor of Vincent now for four years, which will be coming in very soon before Christmas, is abolishing planning approvals and parking shortfalls for small business. People are still shocked and surprised to know that if you're opening a cafe, a restaurant, a laundromat, a consulting room, a recreational facility, that you will need, and a small bar, you will need planning approval. And if you have then, under that change of use application, a shortfall in car parking, you could be paying three to $5,000 a car bay. So if you have a shortfall of 10 car bays, you will owe 50,000 to the local government. And in addition to that, you'll have to engage the planning consultant or a lawyer. It may go on for four to five months. And in that time, and I can tell you this happens, small business walks away. And in these times, we actually need greater flexibility for small business. This is a signature planning reform. I do think some people underestimate it, but it will mean real meaningful change for family businesses that are opening up or that they want to change the purpose of their business, that they're a cafe store that decides to expand to a laundromat or that someone decides that their cafe is not working but their sister wants to use the space for her hairdressing. We've all experienced the stranglehold of local government and this change, abolishing the change of use and the change uh, and the um, shortfall is something that I personally championed for eight years and I am very deeply proud to see that these changes for small business will come through. We will be, if we are re-elected, doing a second tranche of planning reforms. They're probably more complex because they will look at greater details of parts of our planning system. In particular, it will look at the complexity of main roads approvals with developments, which are a bugbear of both the community uh, and development. We will need to look at further uh, consultation mechanisms, further streamlining of uh, planning approvals, uh, not in terms of to destroy the quality of process or community consultation, but to cut away and remove some of the double up that we still see in the planning process. And very soon, as the next part of our design reform, we will be announcing medium density, which will for the first time mean, and probably uh, generates the most community angst, but for two storeys, three storeys and four storeys buildings, we will be setting new benchmarks for local government, uh, local government uh, planning in terms of we will be seeking better house design, designs uh, with better natural light and ventilation, more landscaping, uh, more deep soil zones. All these changes are ultimately about creating more livable neighbourhoods and better design outcomes for our communities. So there's a lot to be done still. Uh, we're not a government that is running out of steam. You can actually genuinely, genuinely see that in terms of both local government and planning, we have substantial reform agendas that will be delivered on a re-election of a Mark McGowan government. Thank you. Member for Kingsley. Thank you, Acting Speaker. May I seek permission to speak from the table? You sure can. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Uh, I'd like to begin today by speaking about uh, one of my favourite topics, and I know it's one of your favourite topics also, is education. Uh, people often ask me, why did I run for parliament? What was my driving factor in running for parliament? And for me, it's always been education. With two young children, uh, both at primary school now, I know how important education is for our children. And one of the things that really sparked my uh, desire to 
be a Member of Parliament was under the previous Barnett government when he cut the education assistance out of our uh, public education system. Um, I know that those education assistants are the ones that are there to catch the most vulnerable kids in our system, but also they're the ones that help to extend those kids that need a little bit of extra assistance to achieve their own personal goals. So for me, that was like a, a red rag to a bull um, about education assistance being cut out of our public education system. It was the final straw. That's what actually got me to stand up, put my hand up and, and run for parliament. So it's no wonder that I've spent the last almost four years campaigning for the schools in my electorate. Um, we're a, a fairly well-established electorate. Most of the schools, in fact all of the schools except one, are over, well over 30 years old. And they have seen um, a lot of uh, maintenance issues, a lot of expansion and kids being housed in demountables or um, in, in spaces that are not suitable or not modern to account for the new modern technology and the modern um, teaching that we have in our schools. And so while our schools were fantastic at teaching, the teaching staff and the support staff were amazing, what we actually lacked was investments in the infrastructure in our schools. So I've spent the last four years uh, harassing, I guess is the best word, uh, the Minister for Education to invest into the schools in Kingsley, to make sure that we are not forgotten as we have been uh, in previous years under previous governments. So I just wanted to go through the amount of investment we've actually had in the seat of Kingsley over the last four years. So start with Woodvale Primary School. Uh, we, had, we invested a music wall for their, for their primary school, the pre-primary school kids. They got a science lab. We all know how important STEM is. Minister uh, for STEM is over there. He knows how important it is to teach our kids these skills that they're going to need for jobs that haven't even been invented yet. So uh, a new science lab is incredibly important. Um, they got loose parts play boxes. They got money for new play equipment, and they also received $54,000 during the maintenance blitz last year, which was amazing. At North Woodvale Primary School, they also got a new nature play space, a space that they had been saving up for for a number of years, and with the amount of money that we put in of $20,000, they were actually finally able to get it over the line. Um, they also received money for a new science lab, but most importantly for them, they received $1.4 million to upgrade their administration building. This is one of those things that's really hard for schools because whenever they get an extra bit of money, all they want to do is spend it on the kids. But we also need to acknowledge that the students and the administration, um, people that work at the schools, also need to be housed in appropriate accommodation. So when I went to their school and uh, told them last year that they had received this money for an administration block upgrade, they were over the moon. At Goulard Primary School, is a, this is a very small little school in my electorate, um, and when I first went and talked to them in 2017, they started t telling me about their undercovered area and how it wasn't appropriate to um, use in the summertime because it got too hot, um, and then in the wintertime it was too cold to hold classes in there. And so we started on a process of finding out what they needed to make this undercovered area a usable space. It was a big space in their school, and to making it a usable space, we invested $240,000 in their undercovered area to upgrade it, to make it a usable space, so that they can actually uh, bring collaborative classes together. So if they've got one, more than one class, they can bring the classes in to collaborate together. And so that that space was somewhere that they could be proud to take visitors, that they could be proud to hold assemblies at. So $240,000 for Goulalau Primary School. Creaney Primary School, under our maintenance blitz, received $52,000 and with that they created a new stage and uh, rendered the walls in their admin block. Again, they came back to me with this same uh, saying, oh, any bit of money that we get, we want to spend it on the kids. And so this maintenance money was really great because it was for maintenance. It was for maintaining the building, maintaining the infrastructure. Halliton Primary School, 
uh, received $150,000 to upgrade their administration block. They also received $20,000 for a nature play area in the school. They received a science lab. And one of the very small things, it's always the small things, Acting Speaker, that make the difference, uh, there was a, an unofficial footpath that went uh, beside the school, outside the school fence, but actually on school property, that many of the parents and students used. And a lot of the parents that were using it had prams or buggies where they were trying to get through the sand. Um, Many, many years ago, somebody had put the Shire of Wanneroo, this will tell you how many years ago, um, slabs down so that it was, there was a bit of concrete there, but they were getting unstable and a little bit unsafe. So we worked with the school, we worked with the department to actually get that footpath put as concrete so those mums with the babies in their buggies could, could use the footpath without fear of getting bogged and um, so that it was just really nice for the amenity around the school. Uh, Dalmain Primary School was one of the first primary schools uh, around the state and, and, in fact, the first primary school in my electorate to open their science lab. Uh, we opened it with a big bang, putting Mentos into Coca-Cola and watching that explode. It's a fantastic experiment. And what it showed me, Minister, was that these kids are so creative and they are so into learning all of these skills that they're going to need in science and technology that I was really proud that we were the ones that were able to deliver this new science lab for them. <laughs> yes, don't drink Coca-Cola <laughs> is probably what it taught me. Um, they also received an additional $26,500 during the uh, maintenance blitz funding. At Greenwood Primary School, $20,000 for, for new shade sales and $52,000 for the maintenance funding. Hawker Park Primary School, now this is one of my favourites. Um, when I was first elected back in 2017, I went and spoke to the principal, as all new members do, and we had a great discussion about uh, a, a little hub or early intervention centre co-located on the school site um, so that there was wraparound services at the school and that there was a space for the school to provide some playgroup facilities or um, potentially even the child health nurse on site so that parents who were dropping off their older children had somewhere that they could go and engage in the community, get the things that they needed, get the support that they needed on site. Now I did actually, um, I don't know if the minister uh, remembers this, but I did come and speak to uh, the minister for children, uh, child protection uh, back in 2017 about this and we discussed how this might happen. Um, in the end, we decided it probably did sit with education, but during uh, the announcement of the WA recovery plan, $1.5 million was invested in Hawker Park Primary School to create an early intervention centre. So this is going to be a hub for the school. They're going to have the capacity to run their before and after school programs there, to run play groups there during the day. They're going to have a psychologist on site. They're going to have other medical rooms. So if at various times the school needs an OT or a speech pathologist, or you know, if the health department is looking for somewhere to put the child health nurse, they can all be accommodated on site. I think this is so important for families. We all know how time poor families are. Um, if you can co-locate those types of services where you're dropping off your kids to school, that just makes such a difference for these families. And I know that moving forward that this hub, this early intervention centre, is going to be a great addition to the Hawker Park Primary School. So moving on to some of my high schools, um, we all know how, mm. how demanding high schools can be or what their demands are, their needs are. We've been really lucky to have been able to invest $2 million into Warwick High School for upgrades to their performing arts facilities. In addition to that, we have already invested $150,000 to remove old concertina walls and put in modern movable walls that give some sound protection between classrooms and give additional space for people to put things up on the walls. And then in addition to that, we also gave them $79,000 during the maintenance blitz. At Greenwood College, 
has received $2.4 million for upgrades to the science block, in addition uh, to the $101,000 that they received during the maintenance splits. Now, that all sounds great, little bits and pieces here and there, but when you add it up, it means that the McGowan Labor government has invested $1.9 million into schools in my electorate just for maintenance and $5.9 million into my schools underneath the WA recovery plan. That is amazing. That is the most money that we have seen invested in the schools in Kingsley for decades. Moving on to the other, other education part for us in here in WA are TAFEs. For me, I understand, having received my own certificate at TAFE way back when, that TAFE is a vital component um, for training in Western Australia, for getting people into jobs, and particularly now, under the recovery plan, for getting people back into jobs. Um, and it's the number one priority for our government. Training is vital to support WA's immediate and future workforce needs, and TAFE will obviously play a major role in our economic recovery. So, as members know, uh, the McGowan Labor government has announced a $57 million recovery package for the training sector, and this will make training more affordable for thousands of students. A few months ago, uh, we had the Premier out at the Joondalup TAFE, and we were chatting to some of the students there about the, uh, the announcements that we had just made for the training sector. And one of uh, the students there said that he had always had a goal to become a ranger. He wanted to, to work on country and he wanted to become a ranger, but he could never have afforded the fees. Now, that nearly broke my heart because the capacity to pay should never, ever stand in the way of being able to train for a job that you want to achieve. It shouldn't be here in Western Australia. So when he turned around and said to the Premier, thank you, Premier, the only reason that I'm undertaking this course is because you slashed the fees, I was so proud. I was so proud of our government, so proud that this young guy was going to be able to fulfil his dream because of a decision that we had made as a government and that the Premier had stuck by and made as the Premier of Western Australia. So obviously we have uh, invested $32 million to expand the list of the lower fee local skills priority courses by adding another 39 courses to the list. Uh, $25 million for the introduction of the 15 free TAFE short courses to upskill young people for the current and emerging jobs, uh, particularly after the COVID-19 or coming out of the COVID-19 global pandemic. And particularly for my electorate, we're very lucky. We sit between two TAFE campuses. We have the Balga TAFE campus to the southeast, and we have the Joondalup or the North Metro TAFE campus to the north. This government is investing in our kids' futures. We're investing $32 million to upgrade the Balga TAFE campus, which in excuse me, includes a new multi-storey building. And we've also invested $17.6 million for the construction of a new trade and training workshop and associate, associated technology labs for the light automotive training at the North Metro TAFE in Joondalup. For me, these things, with you know, a dad who was a mechanical fitter, that was his trade, I can see the value in training our kids up on, um, on these uh, skills that they're going to need for moving into the future uh, jobs, particularly as we're bringing so much manufacturing back here into West Australia. We're, we're building trains here again. We are building uh, emergency service vehicles here again. Investment like this now is going to be so important for the future. So I've taken up quite a bit of time talking about education. I did say it was my passion. So I will ask for a short extension. Extension granted. Thank you. My other passion um, is health. You know, as a mum, I've spent many, many a nights down uh, either at PCH or up at Joondalup Health Campus with children with 
broken bones and ear infections and whatnot. And so for me, the investment that we have made in health in, thank you, in Western Australia has been so important. We have invested $256.7 million into the Joondalup Health Campus. That is an amazing amount of money. The new development is going to include extra mental health beds, new operating theatres and additional inpatient beds. We're expanding the emergency department and the behavioural assessment urgent care clinic to treat drug and alcohol affected emergency department patients. Now, I know that I am not the only Northern Suburbs MP that understands the critical need for us to invest in mental health in the Northern Suburbs. I know yourself, Acting Speaker, have, we've had many conversations about mental health in the Northern Suburbs. And for us to be investing so much money, and yes, some of it is federal money, but we were the ones that you know went out and got the money from the federal government. For us to be advocating and investing so much money in the Joondalup Health Campus, it just shows how much we understand the need in our electorates. And the same with the TAFEs, so, you know, I've got one at the top and one at the bottom of my electorate. I have the same thing in, in health. So I'm very lucky to have Joondalup Health Campus to the north of my electorate and the Osborne Park Hospital to the south. Now, the Osborne Park Hospital, we're investing $24.6 million to expand the new neonatal nursery, to also create a fit-for-purpose maternity assessment unit and a new rehabilitation unit with additional stroke beds. This kind of investment in health is going to be vital as we move towards the future with an ageing population. My, popula my uh, electorate alone has 24 per cent of the electorate over the age of 60. If we're going to be able to look after these people in the future, we have to invest in our hospitals and our health system now. I'm going to move on to a couple of really hyper-local things from my electorate that I'm really, really proud that we've delivered, not just in this term of government, but this year. I had the Premier out at the Kingsley Memorial Club Rooms late last year, where we reaffirmed the commitment of the state government to provide $50,000 to the Bali Peace Park uh, group. To their, their aim is to purchase the site of the Sari Club to create a peace park in Bali. Now, having just had the Bali Memorial last month, I understand how connected and how raw this still is 17 years later uh, for these people uh, who have lost loved ones, for the Kingsley Football Club who lost seven of their players um, and who many, many others were injured um, in the bombings in 2002. Uh, not only did we re reaffirm the $50,000, but we actually increased it by $10,000 to account for increased costs. So the McGowan Labor government will provide $60,000 for the Bali Peace Park. Now, East Green is a, uh, it's now a housing development, but East Green was a primary school that was closed by a previous government and demolished. And this, it was set to be created into a housing precinct. Um, the residents at the time, they were not very happy about it, but it happened. And when I came in in 2017, it was essentially a big dust bowl in the middle of their community where there was antisocial behaviour, there was some hooning happening, there was some vandalism happening. But more than anything, there was sand just blowing in to these residents' houses. So they came to me and they said, something needs to be done, it needs to be developed. Shortly after that, we, we launched the plan for East Green and unfortunately it didn't have a great take up. It wasn't probably as well thought through as it could have been. It probably wasn't, um, the, the community hadn't been as engaged as they could have been on it. So unfortunately they, they weren't selling. I went back to the minister's office and I said, if we want this to be a vibrant community, if we want these blocks to sell, if we want to deliver a really great 
precinct in East Green. We need to be smart about this. We need to think about what are people going to need. So yes, generally in Western Australia, in Perth in particular, in the metropolitan area, the block sizes are getting smaller. But if you provide a really great public open space, if you provide a fantastic park, that's less of an issue. So I went back to the minister and said, we need to build the park. We need to build the park first, and then we need to sell the blocks. And thankfully, the minister listened, and with the department and with Fraser's property group, they undertook to build the park so that people could see what they were buying into. So we relaunched this again at the beginning of this year. And I'm pleased to say that when I spoke to the East Green Development Sales Office two weeks ago, out of all of the 102 blocks that they had, they only had eight remaining left to sell because of the amazing effort put in by the department and by Fraser's property group to create what is essentially a beautiful open space that I can already see families using. Um, the best thing about this was that it wasn't just built, um, it wasn't flattened and then put plastic play equipment in the middle. They actually designed it around the existing mature trees so that it's got already got an established, beautiful feel in East Green. I uh, just want to quickly touch on uh, the things that the McGowan government have done uh, in the recovery plan, the COVID recovery plan for business and infrastructure. Um, in particular, in my area, uh, we've invested quite a bit of money in um, infrastructure around the area. I know we've had $76 million project to widen the Mitchell Freeway between Hodges and Hepburn, which is so important for residents in the northern suburbs. So I'm sure the member for Joondalup will agree with me. But for me, for the residents in Woodvale and Kingsley, this widening of the freeway is going to have a great impact on their commute into the city every day. And we know that every minute that we can shave off that commute is more time that we get to spend at home with our families. This particular 8.8 kilometre stretch of freeway is a significant pinch point for traffic, um, at, particularly for travellers on the, from the northern suburbs. 60,000 vehicles travel this stretch of road every weekday. And there were also quite a number of crashes. Between 2014 and 2018, there were 560 recorded crashes on this section of freeway, with one fatality and 350 major incidences. Now, opening of the Ocean Reef Road, Wanneroo Road Bridge Interchange happened only a few weeks ago. And we know from that opening that this is going to shave seven minutes off of the commute for people in the northern suburbs. This is at the very north of my electorate, Members, but it's a very quiet. It's a very important interchange for people living in the northern suburbs, and this is just one part of the McGowan government's commute, uh, commitment to delivering better infrastructure and local jobs to the northern suburbs. So what has the McGowan government done for businesses in the northern suburbs, uh, sorry, in the, in the state? So what has uh, the McGowan government done for businesses in the state? We've invested $942 million to support businesses and not-for-profits in Western Australia. We've waived licence fees. We've given payroll and land tax assistance. We've offered commercial rent support. There was the small business electricity payment to every business who was a Synergy customer. We've created the Pivot Program to assist small businesses, small business owners to adapt and respond to the COVID-19 environment. It will help owners enhance their entrepreneurial mindset and develop innovative ways to operate their business. We've created building incentives of $117 million in the $20,000 grants for new builds. This is an amazing investment for us in our local communities. It's an amazing investment for our small business. And as a former small business owner, I'm proud to be part of a government that understands the needs of small businesses and that we invest in those needs and that we show that we care about small businesses, not only in the metro area, but across the state of Western Australia. 
I know, having been a small business owner, that it can be very difficult, even when times are good. So when times are bad, that's when we need to know that the Premier and the government have our backs. Thank you. Uh, the member for... Yeah, that's it. And the appropriation capital 2020 Premier. 2021 bill. Let me start by acknowledging that this year has been a year like no other for locals living in Joondalup, Western Australia, and the world more broadly, as we tackle the challenge that is COVID 19. Every Western Australian should be proud that together we've been able to stop the spread of COVID 19 and keep our state safe and strong. Yeah, yeah. What we have before us in this budget is ultimately the result of one and a half years worth of a budget in one, having been postponed from May to October. In those one and a half years, we've seen continued Thank strong... Thank you, Member. Understanding Order 61, this business is adjourned to another part of today's sitting. Members, do we have any questions? Well, there was a dead heat, <laughs> but uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the extremely low rental vacancies rate and the number of Western Australians moving home due to COVID, which is putting further pressure on housing, and I ask, what is the forecast increase in the number of homeless when your government's moratorium on evictions and rents increases, rental increases ends in March? Minister. Um, the question, uh, that the specific question that the Leader of the Opposition has asked me uh, is about the forecasting of the number of homeless in regard to uh, the um, moratorium we have now on evictions. Um, actually, in, uh, th there, is no, there is no specific forecast in relation to homeless people. Uh, we, don't, um, we don't keep that data now and, as far as I know nationally, there are no um, data sets which project the number of homeless people. In fact, one of the reforms that we've got in place in Western Australia is to have Data, better data collection in relation to homelessness in Western Australia. Uh, in fact, a lot of the data that we rely on now is either census-driven, which of course has a lag in it, or uh, is, as a, is uh, a result of um, homeless counts that local governments, sometimes with cooper in cooperation, do um, in the metropolitan area or in regional centres. So one of the reforms that we've put in place in regard to the homelessness strategy, which um, I think is, uh, will, will stand us in good stead, but I do note, um, Leader of the Opposition, that your opposition spokesperson has, um, has dismissed and said was a waste of time, uh, is that we need to have better data collection in relation to homeless in Western Australia, including a tracking of those people who need our support, and that's part of the work that we're doing. Uh, in regard to the economic forecasts of what is likely to happen uh, to housing supply, uh, people on the public housing waiting list, the social housing waiting list, and in fact the private rentals in Western Australia, um, uh, it, it is something that, that uh, government is looking at, but I, I do notice that we have um, the Treasury here, we have the Housing Minister uh, as well, so perhaps that is a, a question that you could um, best direct to them. Uh, we have been working very closely with the community sector to make sure those people who are homeless or at risk of being homeless are supported at this time, and that includes from around the state. Uh, so work is being done in regional areas with remote Aboriginal communities to make sure that people are supported at this time uh, during COVID and those communities are still, in, uh, are still being protected uh, against uh, too much traffic in and out um, at this stage. So uh, uh, 
I can assure the, the Leader of the Opposition and the House um, that we're very mindful of what will happen to vulnerable people at the end of the moratorium. Um, but given um, the challenges that we've faced as a state government in relation to COVID, uh, we uh, know that we're in the best position, uh, both in terms of jobs, um, the movement of people around the state, and in fact protecting against community transmission of COVID uh, of any state in the country. Thank you. Uh, supplementary. Oh, Minister for Water. Oh, thanks. Good the advice. Minister did a very good answer. Don't spoil it. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. D do you uh, share the concerns of the sector that the sector has about the worsening homelessness crisis uh, once the moratorium on rental increases and evictions is lifted? And are you confident an additional 2,600 public houses over a decade? is going to be adequate to serve the needs of the homelessness. There was a lot of preamble there. Are you happy to take that question, Minister? Um, Mr Speaker, it, it wasn't interesting as a supplementary Treasurer. question because there was a whole lot of new information in there. But uh, look, I can, be, I can assure uh, the House as well as the public that we're working very closely with the community sector, not only to reform our current homelessness system, which is something that the, that the other side, uh, including uh, the Leader of the Opposition, uh, played no role on, at, in, at all while you were in government. In fact, I remember your contribution, uh, Leader of the Opposition, uh, was to say that the community sector was paid to do a job and they should do it. That's, that was your contribution when Members. you were asked. Uh, about um, the City of Perth's response to homelessness uh, um, in, in their precinct. Member uh, for we're Korea. working very closely. Not your question. We're, very, we're working very closely on our housing first approach, the best evidence available to, for long term outcomes for those people who are currently homeless, to reform the system through No Wrong Door, uh, the by name list and the like, so the back of house reform to make sure that our homelessness people. Uh, are best served, uh, to put new resources into a system that we put in uh, over $90 million a year uh, into now, and we've upped that, uh, we've increased that state contribution to include uh, over $70 million this time uh, last year. We announced through Housing First and the building of two common grounds. So I'm confident that we are not only do doing our bit as a state government to address this issue, but also working with the community sector. Um, I'd be interested to hear from, from you, Leader of the Opposition, what, your what you did when you were in government in relation to homelessness. Not much. And um, for people like yourself and the, lead and the member for Kareen, who are, are born member again, for who are born again when it comes to understanding and being, and being concerned about the homeless. In fact, in eight and a half years in government, did very little. Members. Very, very little. And so, Member for Wanneroo, you can't ever comment Speaker, on everything. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud Whatever of the engagement that we've had with the sector, the support that we've um, that we've given the the community sector, the policy work that we've done, and the extra resources that we are, um, have brought into the effort to address homelessness, not only the crisis response but long-term sustainable solutions for Western Australia. Members, before I forget, in the Speaker's Gallery today, I've got my uh, daughter, Sarah, and my granddaughter, Emily. Emily wants to be a Member of Parliament, and I have to watch... Uh, <laughs> oh, membership for... No, well, she's a lot brighter than a lot of people in this chamber at the moment. Um, I didn't say where I was looking. Uh, so where are we? The member for Gilroyne. We'll try not to put them off. Um, <laughs> my question is to the Treasurer. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's long and hard fight in securing a fair share of the GST for Western Australia. And I ask, can the Treasurer outline to the House how the GST reform secured by this government is delivering a fair and sustainable outcome? And can the Treasurer outline what this government's message is to the Liberals in New South Wales and their attempts to overturn the reforms 
to the distribution of the GST. Mr Speaker, Treasurer. Mr Speaker, my message isn't just to the Liberals in New South Wales, but Liberals anywhere, Mr Speaker, because this is one of the great reforms that this government managed to achieve not long after coming into government in 2017, Mr Speaker. And since we did that reform uh, to make our GST distribution fair and sustainable, I must admit I've been keeping an eagle eye mainly on South Australia and Tasmania, who I thought might come at us for another go. Maybe the territories, because the Commonwealth has basically put in uh, all the GST money to support them and withdrawn the Commonwealth support for the territories. I didn't think it would come so early from New South Wales, Mr Speaker. And I want to make this point very, very clear. New South Wales has not lost one cent in GST revenue as a result of the reform that we successfully implemented with the Commonwealth Government. Not one cent, Mr Speaker. What this is, is the New South Wales Government trying to blame one of the most significant reforms for Western Australia on their diabolical budget management, Mr Speaker. That's all they are trying to do here. That disgrace that is the New South Wales budget. We've now got the Premier saying, actually, it's all because of Western Australia, despite the fact that Western Australia, all this reform we've done to get a fair and sustainable outcome for Western Australia simply means we get 70% of our GST. And I remind the House currently New South Wales is sitting on 91.8 per cent of their GST revenue, Mr Speaker. So to give you some ideas, to give you some ideas, over the last decade Members. that has been, through GST revenue alone, a subsidy from Western Australian taxpayers of $30 billion to the, to the other states and territories of Australia. And even with our reform, Mr Speaker, even with our reform over the next decade, that subsidy is going to be in the order of about $16 billion. So there's no way that the reform that this government managed to achieve with the Commonwealth Government is in any way unfair or any way unsustainable. I want to remind uh, members, this is what the New South Wales Premier is saying is unfair. If we went back to the old system, because ultimately it's driven by royalties, as most people in this place will know, under the old system, we would have to raise about nearly $10 billion in royalty revenue to keep $1 billion. That's what Gladys Berejiklian, the Premier of New South Wales, is saying is fair. That's what she wants to go back to, Mr Speaker. But there is no way, no way, that the McGowan Labor government is going to cop this. There is no way the people of Western Australia is going to cop this. If New South Wales are going to increase their net debt projections by a factor of 300 per cent, own your decision. And I do note that it's not revenue write-downs driving that, Mr Speaker. There are a range of very large budget blowouts that have been covered off uh, in the New South Wales budget as a result of that, Mr Speaker. But this is uh, the disgrace that is the New South Wales budget. The capitulation on financial management is in no way the result of the GST arrangement that we successfully negotiated with the Commonwealth Government. And I make, and I finish this point, the New South Wales budget has not lost one cent as a result of the GST deal that we did with the Commonwealth Government. Not one cent. And I say to New South Wales, own your decisions, own your budgets, because Western Australia is not going to cop that for one minute. Yeah. Uh, member for Bateman. You outlined to the House the forecast number of Western Australian small businesses expected to close once JobKeeper ends in March. Uh, member, you're asking for an opinion. Um, I'm happy to give it. OK, Treasurer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Oh, I, Mr Speaker, as my time comes to an end, I'm always happy to opine. Uh, uh, thank you for the question, Member for Bateman, uh, about a Commonwealth policy. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll make some comments on the, on, the, on the Commonwealth Government's policy of JobKeeper, which I think has been an extraordinary success. And when you look back in time, I suspect the adoption of a right, by a right-wing government to one of the most significant left-wing policies Australia has seen really has been quite significant. JobKeeper and JobSeeker will be historically important in the sweep of policy uh, in Australia. And I think the fact that we have one of the most left-wing Commonwealth governments in, Western Australia's, in Australia's history highlights the fact that they understand that connection to work is fundamental. Connection to work is fundamental. I've said in this place dozens of times, I suspect, since the coronavirus restrictions started to impact the jobs market, Mr Speaker. 
Whether you are the Governor of the Reserve Bank or any Treasurer in, in Australia, it's all about keeping people connected to work. And that's exactly what the policy around JobKeeper uh, was designed to do. I think it has been successful. I think the unemployment rates in Australia would have been significantly higher. But for JobKeeper, I think we can all recall those early days of those horrible images of Australians, Western Australians, in lines outside of Centrelink. The design of JobKeeper was to stop that, and it worked. Now, as I've said, going into these sorts of, these sorts of supports uh, are much easier than coming out, which is why you've seen the Commonwealth Government make a range of changes over the last little while around rates of job seeker and job keeper, but also the transition out. Ultimately, the impacts on individual businesses, uh, member for Bateman, I suspect you know, uh, will be subject to the economy at the time, uh, and we'll see how that works. But ultimately, I wouldn't be surprised if in some form job keeper continues beyond March. But there will be clearly an impact, uh, because ultimately that has to transition out, which is why uh, the Premier and I and ministers have uh, had a $5.5 billion recovery spend, Mr Speaker. That is designed to dovetail in off the back of the withdrawal of JobKeeper and JobSeeker to keep Western Australians in jobs, to keep businesses operating, Mr Speaker. And that's why I think yesterday the Premier outlined a whole suite of support that we have given to the small business sector of Western Australia. Uh, so, Mr Speaker, uh, what the Commonwealth projects on their own policy is up to them. What we will do as a state is ensure that our policies align with what their announced intentions are, and our $5.5 billion recovery program certainly does that. Supplementary. You're forecasting an average unemployment rate of 8 per cent this year. What is the number of workers in small business forecast to become unemployed once JobKeeper ends in March, and what impact will, help, and what impact will that have on the unemployment rate? Treasurer. Whilst the budget is predicated on 8% unemployment rate, what's the rate now? 6.7%. Thank you. Gee whiz, Minister for Tourism, you've been listening. So that highlights the fact that highlights the fact that we are actually our economy has been more resilient than even we expected back in May when we were when we were responding to the coronavirus. And you can giggle the way you can giggle all you like. You giggle all you like. You giggle all you like. But the fact of the matter is, and this, this, the fact that this makes you just somewhat disgruntled, Member for Bateman, reflects poorly on you. The fact that the unemployment rate is lower than we thought it might be is a good thing. It is a good thing, because we want to ensure that Western Australians are able to stay in work. And if what is interesting is that the participation rate is now back to uh, basically back to pre-COVID levels. Our labour force is back to pre-COVID COVID levels and an unemployment rate of 6.7 per cent. That is a good outcome. That is a good outcome, Liberal Party. You should celebrate this. You should celebrate the resilience of the Western Australian economy. Because when I became Treasurer, and I was on the back of four years of recession, domestic recession, under the former Liberal government, we had to get growth going again. And who would have thought that even with that June quarter, that 6% contraction in Members. the June quarter, we still delivered economic growth across the 1920 year? You know why that is? Because we did the work early in the term of the McGowan Labor government. That's why the balance sheet's strong. That's why the economy is doing much better than we thought it would be uh, back in May, and that's why Western Australians, I suspect, in just a few months, when they go to uh, when they go to the polls, they'll say to themselves, "Will I risk a Liberal national government?" And I'm pretty sure I know the answer. Member Southern River, <laughs> Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier, and I refer to the New South Wales Liberal Party's campaign to rip up. The fair deal to the GST distribution the McGowan Labor government has worked hard to secure, and I ask the Premier, can the Premier outline to the House why the McGowan Labor government will stand up for Western Australia and fight any attempts by the Liberal Party to overturn the hard-fought reforms to the GST distribution? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I was in the Parliament in 1999. Members. Uh, when uh, the then Liberal state and federal governments signed us up to the GST deal, Mr Speaker. And that deal, of course, uh, for the next 20 years, ripped money away from Western Australia and sent it east uh, in large amounts, as the Treasurer has just outlined. And then we learn yesterday or today uh, that the New South Wales government, in their actual budget documents, have a breakout box. And their breakout box details how all the problems for New South Wales are because Western Australia is getting GST money. And that's to blame for the situation that New South Wales finds it in. 
There are facts of the matter as this, Mr Speaker. New South Wales is getting 92 cents in the dollar. 92 cents in the dollar. Western Australia is getting 70 cents in the dollar. Yet somehow in the tortured imagination of the Liberal Party in New South Wales, that is unfair. That is unfair. And for some reason the Liberal Party over there seems to think they can blame Western Australia. They can blame Western Australia. And we heard the Shadow Treasurer. He endorses many of the New South Wales Liberal Party's policies, Mr Speaker. Uh, we do know that. I'll come to that later on if he, uh, if he asks me a question, Mr Speaker. So somehow in the tortured and fevered imaginations of the New South Wales Cabinet, uh, Western Australia has an unfair advantage, Mr Speaker, because we get 70 cents in the dollar and they get 92 cents in the dollar, Mr Speaker. The reason our economy is doing strong, which the New South Wales government bemoans, uh, is because we have managed COVID well, we have got our economy back and we made sure upon coming to government we put a proper, put a proper footing uh, and Minister under our Bateman, economy, Mr Speaker. So what we find, what we find is ABS weekly payroll jo payrolls, ABS weekly payroll jobs data, Western Australia leads the economy. We're back to basically 99.6% of all work recovered uh, since, uh, uh, since uh, COVID hit the state, Mr Speaker, leading the country. Uh, internet job vacancies, highest since March 2013. Retail figures, strongest year-on-year -year growth in the, in the country. Uh, highest um, uh, land development, land sales, building approvals, uh, we've got FIFO workers moving in their thousands to Western Australia, Mr Speaker, uh, and uh, we're the only economy in the country that didn't go into recession. All the other states went into recession, not Western Australia, Mr Speaker. Now, New South Wales, run by the Liberal Party, they sold off nearly everything. Uh, their debt is now heading to $104 billion, and they have a $16 billion deficit, Mr Speaker, whilst this government delivers a $1.2 billion surplus, which again the Liberal Party complains about, Mr Speaker. Uh, we undertook responsible financial management. We've been recognised by Moody's and S&P uh, for that, Mr Speaker. Uh, but I must say, if, uh, if New South Wales wants to complain, it's up to them. They are the masters of their own domain, Mr Speaker, and they need to, and they need to manage their own budget responsibly and not, blame, and not blame other states for what they have achieved. Now, I want to be really clear about this. I want to be really clear. New South Wales Liberal Party has launched a campaign against us. They have launched the campaign in their budgets. I expect they'll want other states to join to it so they can point the finger at Western Australia and say that That's is what is responsible uh, for what is going on over there. Now, I just want to say to all the states and all the treasurers across Australia, especially New South Wales, do not take on Western Australia. They will, be de they will be declaring war upon this state if they want to go down that direction. This was hard fought for 20 years. Do not try and unwind this deal. We do not want to have a war with you, but if you do, we will go to war with everything at our disposal to protect this deal, Mr Speaker. OK, uh, the member for Churchland, so I was on my feet for about five minutes. Well, no, I was concentrating on him because he was so loud, but all the rest, if you do it again, I'll call you to order. Member for more. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question today is to the Minister for Local Government. Minister, I refer to the Legislative Council's disallowance of your changes to Regulation 9.1 of the Local Government Rules of Conduct last week and also to Recommendation 26 of the Select Committee to Local Government, which reads in part, the Government clarify the roles of Council and the Chief Executive and the distinction between governance and operational matters. And I ask, how will you respond to Recommendation 26 to clarify the relationship between CEOs and councillors and strengthen Council's governance functions? Good question. I thank the uh, member for more for the question. Well, you know, very interestingly, member for more, as you would be aware, in the panel inquiry from the City of Perth, the issues around uh, the importance of uh, uh, clarifying and making sure that elected members understand very clearly their role and responsibility as opposed to the responsibility of a CEO, uh, that the CEO is responsible for the operations of a council and that elected members are not 
uh, are responsible for the operations of a council. Made very clear in the report uh, of the panel inquiry. Made very clear in a number of C reports uh, of recent times, uh, again highlighting that uh, there are a number of councils, and particularly elected members, who do not understand the difference between their role as opposed to the CEO. And then, of course, uh, as a result of the uh, panel inquiry uh, to the, um, uh, that uh, was handed down by uh, 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 Mr Tony Power, one of the key recommendations, uh, which was, was of course also taken up by the Select Committee, was to clarify. So what do I do? I clarify by putting forward an amendment to, to, uh, 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 to Reg 9. Reg 9, which of course is where uh, it can be very clearly uh, uh, highlighted or claimed that there is uh, some um, grey areas. So I put up a, an amendment to the other place to clarify, as was expected by and underpinned by the panel inquiry and by the very select committee that reported to the other place, including representatives of your party. And what did your party do, along with some crossbenchers in the other place? Disallowed it. So they disallowed it. So, so, so we attempt to clarify, we attempt to clarify the role and responsibilities. We attempt to clarify, and then what do you go and do with it? You go and vote against it and disallow it. This is a, geek, a great example of the lack of any policy decision making and policy uh, 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 deliverance from those opposite. They're very happy to carp. They're very happy to come in here and demonstrate that they don't have any clear understanding of what local governments, uh, the Local Government Act, in fact, the current one. Uh, uh, does in terms of uh, uh, delivery of local government in Western Australia. That's one of the reasons why this government has embarked on, a, on, a, on a, uh, a reform program, which was not what you, of course, did when you had your eight and a half years in this place. The only thing you did, the only thing you did whilst you were on the other, uh, on the, uh, uh, this side of the house, was a, uh, an ill-fated amalgamation of proposal by the former government. So, I'll keep on, I tell you this, I'll keep on putting reforms up you can keep knocking them back, but I tell you what, the local government sector needs reform. We've recognised it. We are working our way through towards a Green Bill if we're re-elected at the next election so that we can have a modern piece of legislation that underpins the importance of local government to communities throughout Western Australia. You can sit back and attack, you can sit back and, uh, and carp, but your history shows you do nothing. You do nothing while you're in government with regard to local government, and you criticise and knock out reforms that are important and needed, as you did last week in the upper house. But I'm going to keep going because it's important that we have reform in local government. And I would think that it would be important for you, member, who asked the question about politicisation of local government. He, he was very concerned about the uh, expert panel's report about politicisation of government. You might remember he asked the question. He said, "Oh, you know, oh, I see that they want people." to declare about their political interests. Yeah, the, National Party. the National Party always says this. Yeah. There should be no local there should be no politics in local government. Well why would you why would you be member afraid for more. of anybody a member declaring for more. a member of a political party? You don't have any logic to what you put forward with regard to local government. All you do is criticise, all you do is carp and you have no reform program at all. Yeah. Supplementary. Yeah. Mr Speaker, uh, Minister, given the disallowance, do you now concede that your failed attempt to prevent councillors from being able to deal with sensitive matters relating to a CEO was an overreach that has created more confusion and uncertainty than existed before? Minister. You're not listening. You're not listening, Member for more. You come in here. You don't listen. The fact of the matter is that place up there, and I don't want to Member make. Member for I want more. To make, You've I don't had two questions. Any, I want to cast anything, any, any, uh, any Minister, comments. Minister, Member for more. You had two cracks. I'll call your order for the. I don't want to uh, cast any. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> the <laughs> against the members in the other place, but I tell you what. One member was overheard in another place of saying to, uh, in regards to disallowance, when another member who voted uh, to not uh, disallow, not from the Labor Party, when he pointed out to the, uh, the member and said, um, you do realise you're a acting uh, uh, um, uh, ultra-virus here, and the response was, oh, but it's just politics. 
Just pass it. You see, that's what you do, that's what you do, and that's what the approach is in the other place. But we're happy. We don't have, we don't have the numbers in the other place. We accept that. We accept that. But the simple fact of the matter is this. The local government system in West Australia needs reform. The local government act is over 20 plus years old. It does not and is not fit for purpose. That's why this government has had a program of reviewing it. That's why we put forward and pass legislation in this place that in deals with issues around Auditor General being responsible for financial and performance, in performance measures. We'll keep doing it. We'll keep putting to the people of Western Australia a proposal to reform local government because it needs to happen. When they go to the election on the 13th of March next year, at least they'll know that we are doing everything possible to, be, to provide a modern piece of legislation and a modern context for local government. We believe in the local government sector. It's an important sector. All you do is carp. All you do is harp on. You do nothing. You would continue to be the hyenas who pick through the bins and, and throw rubbish around and do nothing else. <laughs> Hyenas. <laughs> Member for Belcada. My question is to the Minister for Police. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to keeping Western Australia safe and strong, and I ask, can the Minister update the House on the measures this government has taken to support our police officers in the important work they do in protecting our community? Minister for Police. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Member for Belcada for that question? And, uh, I also note his tie cho choice. Is that a, a Belcada Football Club tie? What an excellent choice and what a great, what a great club. And I thank the member for this Minister. question on policing. Uh, and what a difference, Mr Speaker, four years makes. What a difference the McGowan government has made with its support of the West Australian Thank Police you. Force. If we think back to those four years ago, uh, we, we, what we inherited was a mess. We saw crime escalating out of control. We saw meth use increasing on a month-to-month -month basis. And we saw a, metropo a failed metropolitan operating model that had police force split into two teams, the local policing teams and the response teams and police officers traipsing from one end of the metropolitan area to the others. And of course, in that last, uh, in that last uh, budget back in 16-17, uh, uh, we saw a police force that was having to suck up more and more efficiency dividends as they had money cut out of their budget. Well, four years later, uh, what we see is uh, an injection of some $755 million into the police budget. That's right, th over three quarters of a billion dollars. Not only that, uh, we had an opposition that were promising zero extra police. At the election, we promised about uh, 143. We promised the 120 staff, uh, 100 uh, police officers for meth and 20 other staff. We promised 30 uh, for the regional enforcement unit, another 13 to cover the extended hour police stations, and then on top of that we over-delivered uh, another 10 to support family and domestic violence. Then in April this year we committed another 150 officers, and uh, in the recent budget another 800. That takes up us to over 1,100 additional police officers. Uh, a substantial commitment uh, by the McGowan government. But our commitment to keeping Western Australians safe and strong doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with the extra money and the extra officers uh, and the much better operating model. In addition to that, we've delivered on so many things that our police officers have needed for years. They were calling for stab-proof vests back in 2013. Former gave, government gave them a little mini trial back in 2015 and put no money on budget. What have we done now? We've allocated $19.2 million to give them personal issue vests so that our police officers are as best protected as they can be. We've also rolled out um, mobile phones, the, the One Force mobile phone uh, to all of our, uh, our police officers. Uh, Body-worn cameras, again, something uh, that should have been done years ago, delivered on my, by our government. Uh, $20.9 million in funding for those body cameras, better for police, but also uh, better for the general public, because you've got that record of interaction. 
In addition to that, we've delivered on a number of police stations. Member for Collie, I know, is very grateful for the new police station in Capel, which I note the Liberal Party still don't support. We're delivering a new police and justice co complex at Armadale at a cost of $85 million. Uh, that will be opening, that will be opening uh, next year. Uh, and, and more recently, we've committed to the Fremantle Police Complex at a cost of over $52 million, uh, something again that the, uh, the Liberal Party failed to deliver on over all that time. We've protected our police officers as best we can against COVID-19. We've put those extra laws in place. We've introduced a police redress scheme uh, to to recognise those people who were forced to leave uh, medically retired and got no form of redress under, the uh, under any former government. We've also taken those medical retirements out of uh, Section 8 of the Police Act and removed that indignity from our officers. Mr Speaker, it is a very long list uh, of uh, supports that we've put in place for our police force uh, and uh, we've seen the results for it. Compared with the peak of the 1516 crime rave of the Barnett Harvey era, there were a massive 28,000 fewer offences in 1920 uh, than what there were in 1617. That's a 10% across the board uh, reduction. And in terms of the wastewater uh, drug testing, that that's done nationally, not by us, but nationally, we've seen the lowest levels of meth consumption in the last quarter since testing began. Um, Metropolitan Perth consumption more than 60% lower than what it was at the end of 2016. So uh, the Mayor, I thank the Premier and the team for their strong support of our police officers, for their support of our police so that they can keep West Australia safe, strong and protected. Well uh, the sure. member for Dawesville. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my question to the Minister for Mental Health. Minister, I refer to the recently released Productivity Commission report into mental health, and I ask, in relation to Western Australia, can you confirm that the report states, and I quote, that there are community ambulatory wor workforce shortages for children and adolescent services and older person services? And if so, Minister, what are the reasons for those shortfalls? Minister for Health. Uh, Mr Speaker, as the member will be aware, the Productivity Commission report is an examination of mental health services and policy right around the country. Uh, it is an extensive report and the government is yet to, um, to form a view in terms of its findings. So obviously we, we welcome any opportunity to continue to examine how we can better improve mental health services in the community, how we can improve the services, how we can build the workforce that sits behind those services and at, most importantly, Mr Speaker, how we can improve the lives of those people who are impacted by mental health issues. And as the Prime Minister said, Mr Speaker, groundbreaking data shows that the poor mental health and suicide cost the country $200 billion a year. So there is an opportunity, uh, Mr Speaker, not just to, to look at the, uh, obviously the expense of providing these services, it's the opportunity to look at the expense of not providing these services. And um, that's one of the reasons, Mr Speaker, why uh, Western Australia, uh, the McGowan government, has now invested record levels of, of investment in, uh, in mental health services, including for the first time the mental health budget being over a billion dollars over a billion dollars, Mr Speaker. But uh, the sad thing, Mr Speaker, is that ultimately it will not be enough. We will continue to be challenged, uh, not only by the uh, high level of acuity and complexity of adult uh, mental health patients that are impacting on AEDs, but also, Mr Speaker, young people, adolescents and people under the age of 12 are emerging as a huge challenge for our mental health services. It's one that we all have to challenge, we'll all have to uh, meet uh, together. And uh, we have our mental health plan 2015-2025, uh, which is um, a, a, a pathway for uh, mental health services in Western Australia. It's funding agnostic, Mr Speaker. It calls on funding from both the federal and the state governments. And together, I'm sure, working with the federal government, we can find a better future for mental health services in Western Australia. Supplementary member for Dawson. Thank you very much, Speaker. Minister, when will you pay attention? Well, when will you respond to the Productivity Commission's report and to the sector and to the own, your own plan that you just cited there that shows that we need to increase the level of funding in not just outpatient services but community based services for young people and older people in Western Australia? 
Premier. Well, Mr Senate. Speaker, I think the member will find if he reviews Hansard that I just answered his supplementary before he, before he got to his feet, and that is that we are continuing to fund more mental health services than ever before through record growth in our funding. And we do have the plan for mental health services, Mr Speaker. Um, it's a plan which was uh, 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 struck under the previous government, and it's, it's, a, it's a plan that we are committed to as well. But it's not just the responsibility of the state government. Despite our record investment, we need to have the Commonwealth working with us to make sure that we have an adequate level of services in our community. Thank you. Member for Mirabuka. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the Galahad Government's commitment to keeping Western Australia safe and strong and ensuring patients get the high quality treatment they need. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on how this government's legislative reforms are ensuring that patients are put first and are provided with dignified, high quality health care? Minister for Health. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for the question. Um, it's an area of, of government. Uh, service delivery that she is highly committed to and um, I very much uh, thank you for the question. And despite the global pandemic, Mr Speaker, the McGowan government has continued to work hard on its legislative commitments to the people of Western Australia. And through this hard work, we have seen a range of pieces of legislation go through this place, Mr Speaker, which I think places uh, uh, the, uh, the needs of patients front and centre. In particular, Mr Speaker, the, uh, the Future Health Research and Innovation Fund legislation, which uses the interest from the, the Future Fund uh, to improve health research, commercialisation and innovation. The passing of this legislation is a win for health and medical research and innovation sector in WA. And through health and medical research, innovation and commercialisation, we'll find new and better ways to treat and prevent disease and create healthier communities. We are building a, a workforce of excellence. We are diversifying our economy. We are making sure that patients receive the very best health care by taking advantage of great medical research taking place in this state. And medical research in Western Australia is in a very poor state. We receive a very small portion of the national medical research funding, and it's important that we utilise this funding to make sure that we can improve the lives of Western Australians by having more medical research, commercialisation and other work in the innovation sector taking place in WA. And Mr Speaker, the amendments to the Public Health Act um, brought, um, and the School Education Act brought about the Public Health Amendment immunisation requirements for enrolment bill, otherwise known as no jab, no play legislation, Mr Speaker. This is groundbreaking uh, legislation that all states committed themselves to, which is about, about making sure that we can better support young families who have children entering the education system to ensure that they get the support they need to make sure their kids are fully vaccinated. And Mr Speaker, we now know, you know, I think there's a greater appreciation right across the globe, more so than ever, that vaccinations save lives. And if we get to the point, Mr Speaker, where early next year we find a, a vaccine for the COVID-19, I'm sure everyone will agree that it's time that we set aside these arguments around that the anti-vaxxers put, put into the public domain and all, and all commit to making sure we keep our community safe. Mr Speaker, the voluntary assisted dying legislation 2019 is obviously a landmark piece of legislation for WA. We are now only the second state in Australia to legislate for this end of life choice and I and the government are exceptionally proud of this achievement. The Act provides a compassionate and safe legal framework that the community has sought for many years and it reflects extensive consultation and con that was conducted right across the state, Mr Speaker. The implementation of this Act is underway through the work of an expert team supported by WA Health and led by Dr Scott Blackwell. This significant piece of legislation will become operable in July 2021. And Mr Speaker, can I just acknowledge the great work of the Joint Select Committee on End of Life Choices, uh, chaired by the member for Morley, the expert uh, panel led by Mr Malcolm McCusker, and the ongoing work of the End of Life Care Team at WA Health. But Mr Speaker, we also undertook other um, ongoing reform in the health sector. We know, Mr Speaker, that tobacco remains the leading cause of preventable death in Australia and is estimated to kill 19,000 Australians each year. So the changes, Mr Speaker, that we made to the Tobacco Products Control Act um, 
uh, were a significant step forward uh, of, of the ongoing process of tobacco law reform in this, in this state. In particular, our, our changes, Mr Speaker, focused on young people, making sure that young people were not tempted by the marketing of tobacco companies to ensure that they get hooked early in life and then can struggle to get off this, this, insidious, this insidious drug. Mr Speaker, in the eight and a half years of the, of the, the Barnett Liberal Go National Government, not one piece of legislation reformed the Tobacco Products Control Act were put through. They left it, they left it to the work of an independent member. Uh, the, the, of the independent, the independent member Janet um, Woolard to actually put through this legislation. And Mr Speaker, in, a, in an exercise in playing catch up, we are currently doing a review of the current Act in its current form to see what future changes can be made to this legislation in 2021 if the people of Western Australia um, re elect the McGowan Labor government. And on the subject, Mr Speaker, of future legislation, safe access zones. A proposal for a reform uh, was put forward, Mr Speaker, and we brought this legislation as quickly as we could to this place. I'm very pleased that the, that the Assembly saw fit to support this legislation without even seeing the need to divide, Mr Speaker. So I assume, that, um, I assume Mr Speaker, that all members will be staying united after the election when we recommit this legislation, regardless of who gets elected. Um, and, I'd like, and we look forward to any government, given the unanimous support that was enjoyed by this legislation right across the chamber. I look forward to any government returned after the election recommitting this legislation so we can pass it as quickly as possible to improve the lives of women who are seeking sexual, uh, legal uh, sexual health services uh, right across this state. Read that somewhere. Uh, the member for Geraldton. My question is to the Minister for Community Services. Minister, I refer to the media statement dated 6 November 2020 about the Target 120 Early Intervention Program, recently expanded to Geraldton, which states that you're working with a range of departments, including the Department of Education, and I ask, how is your department working with education to encourage and enforce school attendance in Geraldton? In target uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I don't know whether uh, the member paid much attention to the Target 120 um, publicity or the, uh, I think I did a, um, a question during question time recently, but Target 120, uh, as the name implies, is a very concentrated program. So it works with identified families in a concentrated way to get better outcomes for the young people in those families um, and hopefully uh, other members of the family, the siblings and, and the parents. Um, so I explained in a question um, to this House in question time, question asked of me, that the program is uh, working with young people aged 10 to uh, 14 and their families. And in Geraldton, in the last year, we've worked uh, at the moment, I think it's about 10 young people and their families. And we're starting to get some very good outcomes around the state. But in the case of Geraldton, uh, by memory, I think there was 77% of those young people have had no new offences. And uh, overall, there's been a 99% reduction uh, in, in offences, uh, in offending for those young people. Um, I didn't have the data to hand on school attendance, but that's certainly uh, one of the criteria. That'll be one of the uh, measures that we'll use uh, to guide the success or otherwise of the program. So the, uh, the program is, is working with those identified young people, but it is not designed to look at school attendance across the board. It is working in the case of, those, of the Geraldton program with 10 young people. Uh, so I'm happy to get you some data de-identified data on what's happening with their school attendance, but it, it is not designed to work more generally on, uh, on school attendance. Yeah, Supplementary. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, have you discussed the reintroduction of Education Department truancy officers with the Education Minister to help reduce recidiv recidivism and improve school attendance for that's not a supplementary, that's okay. not part of the national party. Member for Kimberley. Mr Speaker, 
My question is to the Minister for Fisheries. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to growing WA's aquaculture industry and creating new jobs in the sector as our economy recovers from the impacts of COVID-19. And I ask, can the Minister outline to the House how the Aquaculture Development Plan announced today will help attract new investments in the industry and support the creation of new local WA jobs? Thank you. Good thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank the member for Kimberley for, uh, for that and your enduring interest, actually, in agriculture for the pearling industry, particularly and Barramundi and your, uh, your electorate. Um, the, the situation West Australia finds itself in now is that we are at a turning point. The aquaculture industry in Western Australia, after many, many years of people talking about it and successive governments attempting to talk about it and do something about it, uh, there is a moment in time now, and delivered by COVID, but also delivered in large part by the fact that the fiscal discipline of the first three years of this government uh, and the way we've approached the health crisis in, in front of us has allowed us to refocus and redouble our efforts in, uh, in taking the aquaculture industry to, towards its potential. And yesterday I was very delighted to launch the Aquaculture Development Plan for Western Australia uh, to expand our uh, blue economy, if you like, and track new investment, and uh, up to as many 6,000 jobs in its mature form. That's 6,000 sustainable jobs well over the horizon and into the future. Uh, the agriculture plan focus of, of work needs to accelerate and support the continued growth of the agriculture industry to, to uh, make sure it's well positioned to build on the opportunities as we come out of COVID-19 and reopen the international economy. And it's fundamentally important that we, we take the time and are not idle in this moment while we're trying to create or are creating the best possible opportunity. The reason being is Western Australia, with its 12,500 kilometres of coastline, extremely prospective areas for aquaculture, is actually internationally attractive for foreign direct investment. Making sure we, we get those sort of areas identified uh, uh, and as much as possible de-risk them and get them to the international market is fundamental to the growth of Western Australia at full production. Um, the existing agriculture zones will, in fact, be the largest agriculture zones in Australia and uh, in some, some species in the Southern Hemisphere. The, hatch, the uh, Oyster Harbour uh, leases, about 500 hectares that I released recently, put to the market, is the first tranche of nearly 1,000 hectares of a highly prospective oyster farming location down in Albany will make it the largest single oyster production facility in the Southern Hemisphere. And that is in large part being able to be delivered because the government committed to common user infrastructure that was beyond the capacity of any one commercial operator. Very the good. millions of dollars that was uh, injected into the shellfish hatchery in, uh, in Albany uh, has actually exceeded expectations to the point that we need to accelerate the expansion of its capability to deliver to a hungry industry with highly corporatised approaches to it to ensure that we are keeping pace with the industry. So the agricultural development zone itself is a very exciting thing to, to launch. We're looking forward to the conclusion of the EOI process there. Uh, to support this potential, though, right across the coastline, right up into the Kimberleys, uh, from all the way down from the, the bite all the way around, uh, we've done a lot since 2017. Done a lot. And there's a lot more to do there, member. Uh, declare, we declared the Midwest Agricultural Development Zone, which has since been fully allocated for FinFish, transferred the Australian Centre for Applied Aqu Aquaculture Research to the Department of Prime Industries and Regional Development to, under the MOG arrangements, which have accelerated its research capability. We funded the construction and operation of Marine FinFish Nursery in Geraldton in partnership with the Agriculture Council of Western Australia, established the Albany shellfish hatcheries I mentioned, progressed the establishment of agriculture development zones in the south coast of the you focus on to. Albany, upgrade the Waterman's you Bay. I know to. you don't like hearing it. To. I know you don't like hearing it. I know you don't like hearing it. But we didn't talk about it. Since 2017, yes, these things have been delivered by a government that actually cares about the out. Come. Um, members on this side saying about taking too long, they forget when they are on that side for their answers. Minister. So those expectations of Western Australians for a job, for a sustainable job, not just for their kids but their children's children, this government gives them the opportunity to involve themselves in a highly technical industry that will sustain their ability. Now, if I take too long, I apologise. I apologise, but the litany of success...
members. The successes of this government need to be articulated in this place so you people get an understanding of, of what good government looks like. Because you did it in eight years, you didn't do it now, and I'm going to continue. We provided $3.9 million of funding for an agriculture business stimulus package. The Deep Herd St Hillary Shellfish Research Facility. We provided a declaration of the Albany Development Zone, release of administrative guidelines for the agriculture leases, make them more internationally competitive, the completion of the design component of the Geraldton Marine Finfish Nursery in September this year, accelerated it. We launched the agriculture development plan, so we have the action, have a blueprint for people who want to see an opportunity for their children. And I'm a gown governor delivered it because we had the opportunity to have a vision you had no idea about. No more. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Water. I refer to your response to my question on notice and I ask, can you confirm that the total number of staff in the Water Corporation has increased from 2,654 in 2016 to 3,429 in 2020, an increase of 775 or 20, 29 per cent? Minister. Um, again, um, thank you, uh, thank you, Member for Cottesloe, for the question. Um, congratulations on getting two in a calendar year. Um, but I'm, it's, uh, I'm very pleased that you've managed to get yourself up the up the totem pole to that. Uh, look, uh, sorry. No, they don't trust me with more. There's always th tomorrow or, or when we come back. Members. Member, member for Cottesloe, um, I'm really pleased that you asked me that question. There has, in fact, been an increase in the number of staff at the Water Corporation. Um, you may, you may, it may have missed your attention that under this government we have bought back in house a number of services that were privatised under previous yeah, yeah. Liberal governments. There was a, 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 uh, essentially maintenance uh, for uh, metropolitan operations was privatised under the court Liberal government, I think back in 1997, I think it was. Uh, and uh, under this government, we bought that work back in house. So that was about 250 uh, staff who are so happy now to be back and members of the uh, employed directly by the Water Corporation. Uh, I went to a morning tea that the Water Corporation put on for to celebrate those staff coming back in house. And I remember one one gentleman came up to me and said. He had worked for the Water Corporation, as he saw it, for over 40 years. He'd started with the Water Authority and then his job had been privatised. He'd essentially done the same job, but the logo had changed on his shirt. He'd seen contractors come and go. He was now, he said, in a position where he could proudly retire as a directly employed member, uh, employee of the Water Corporation. <laughs> That was the mood at, at that morning tea. People worked hard, but they were proud that they were finally again being recognised as direct employees of the Water Corporation. In addition to that, there was a contract, the Aruna Alliance, uh, which I think was let in 2012, uh, again by the previous court, Liberal government, uh, not uh, Barnett Liberal government. That, that was operating a lot of our wastewater treatment plants, uh, the, the dams, those sort of, uh, that sort of activity, those major uh, bits of infrastructure. I think it was about 400 uh, staff came back into the Water Corporation's direct employees uh, at the time. So, a member for Cottesloe, and again, I went to a similar morning tea uh, for, uh, uh, for that group when they came in, and they were suitably chuffed, suitably chuffed, that we think on this side of the house that the work that they do for the public of Western Australia is so important that uh, they can be now directly employed by the Water Corporation. And I've got to say, when we were hit with COVID-19 and the Water Corporation had to quickly 
uh, alter the way it managed a lot of those services, having those staff directly employed, directly at their uh, direct line of sight, was of great assistance. So, Mr. Crosso, yes, you're right, there's been an increase in the staff at the Water Corporation, largely due to those two contracts coming back in house, and they are decisions I'm very proud of. Supplementary. Members, Minister, can you confirm that you care more about growing union membership than you do about. No, it's not a supplementary. It is not a supplementary. Members! Members! So I understand that a supplementary question should relate to the original question that was asked. The member for Cottesloe was asking a question about the workforce. It was indeed the right answer. It's not a point of order. That's the end of question time. Shush. Yes. Mr. Speaker, Section 2, uh, questions on notice, which is one of the uh, chances for the government to be transparent in their processes. Uh, the, Premier, the Premier has an outstanding question, question 6370, which I have already asked the Premier to respond to a month ago, and now it's outstanding two months later. Premier, why has that not been answered, and when will it be answered? Uh, member, what's it about? Uh, it's, a, it's about putting caps on people coming into Western Australia. Uh, well, I'll endeavour to find out. Member for Nedlitz. Clause two, and my question is to the Minister for Innovation. I've got you've got two outstanding questions: number six four five seven and six four five six. When can I expect an answer, Minister? They're not outstanding. Um, I will endeavour to get an answer for you as soon as I can. <laughs> Member for Vash. Uh, under uh, section 80, subsection 2, I have an outstanding question which was to the Minister for Health. Uh, the outstanding question number is 6495, and I'm just uh, wondering if that uh, question can be answered. Yeah. Mr Speaker, there have been a range of questions from Member for Vass that we've answered, so I'm surprised we haven't got onto it, but I'll grab it and get it to you as quickly as possible. Member for uh, I have another question outstanding from the Minister for Local Government. Question number 6471. Uh, can I, I expect an answer for Parliament resumes, Minister? I, I, I will endeavour to make sure you get that answer to that question as soon as possible. Oh, Member for Nederland, it's busy today. Uh, I have a, uh, actually, the outstanding question is to the Minister for Transport. I asked the Premier if uh, the Premier could uh, chase up the Minister for Transport on, on my behalf to put, find out the, when the answer to question number 6474 will be answered. Uh, again, Premier. I'll endeavour to do this. Hoover, what's it about, Member? Uh, the Premier is asking what the question is about, Mr. Speaker, so I'll respond. You, you may answer. Thank you. The question is about the, the actual number of uh, train movements between Bayswater Railway Station and, 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 uh, and Claremont, uh, uh, Speaker, yeah. and I understand that it's trebled because of the actual uh, uh, the, the line. No, no, I just, I, I just want the question. No, no, he's not answering the question. He's telling the Premier what the question is. So he doesn't want, have to answer it. So That's confirm, enough. We've got the gist. Yeah, we've got the gist. I will okay. endeavour to find out about train movements on the railways. <laughs> members, members, members. Uh, I wish to advise that I've approved the presence of media this afternoon to take photographs of the Treasurer delivering his valedictory speech. They asked me this question yesterday, but I wasn't sure if he changed his mind, so I didn't answer them until this morning. <laughs> and I'm very disappointed they're not staying for the Speaker's valedictory. Uh, right. Uh, no MPA, uh, government business orders of the day. Members, the question is the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Against? 
TI7, TI7. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Appropriation Recurrent 2017-18, Supplementary Bill 2018 and Appropriation Capital 2017-18. Supplementary Bill 2018, second reading adjourned debate. Uh, member for Joondalup. The contribution to the Appropriation Recurrent 2021 Bill and the Appropriation Capital 2020-2021 Bill. Let me start by acknowledging that this year has been a year like no other for locals living in Joondalup, Western Australia and the world more broadly as we tackle the challenge that is COVID-19. Every Western Australian should be proud that together we've been able to stop the spread of COVID-19 and keep our state safe and strong. What we have before us in this budget is ultimately the result of one and a half years' worth of budget in one, having been postponed from May to October. In those one and a half years, we've seen continued strong leadership here in WA and it's resulted in a surplus. Thanks to our Premier and Treasurer for this, the McGowan Government's fourth state budget. Our community in Joondalup and communities around the state can feel confident that there is money available in the 2021 budget to roll out the WA recovery plan while keeping WA safe and strong. The focus in my response to the budget today is what it means for my electorate of Joondalup. Let me just say that I'm so proud of how our community has come together to support each other throughout this continued difficult time. I, my office staff and volunteers reached out to our community, especially the elderly and the vulnerable, in the first phase of restrictions. Most were doing okay with the support of family and friends. Locals supported businesses through buying vouchers, attending online sessions, paying for memberships even though they couldn't use them, and buying takeaway meals. And I'm proud to say that local businesses supported locals and our frontline workers in a number of ways. The kids at Playful Learners in Heathridge made beautiful artwork to brighten seniors' days. The pictures were, mailed, were then mailed to the COVID with COVID-19 information to the over 75-year-old community members. The strong leadership that has been provided by our Premier has meant that our community has felt safe and secure. It has made WA a leader in terms of recovery. Our kids are back at school, local businesses have reopened and significant state government projects are underway. And now we look to our WA recovery plan. What we've seen is continued progress and significant investment in key infrastructure projects in Joondalup that will support one of the fastest growing regions in Australia. My vision is to make Joondalup the best coast city community anywhere in Australia. Together we can grow this place, our home, into a world-class destination. And this will provide us with local WA jobs right now and for decades to come. West Australians have an affinity with our coast. As a diver, fisher and boating enthusiast myself, I'm proud to be delivering for Joondalup with works having started on the Ocean Reef Marina. Back in 2017, I made an election promise to get this project moving and I've delivered. Our community has been excited about this project from the outset, pr uh, participating in consultation and sharing their ideas. I'm glad that the Ocean Reef Marina will feature Perth's first ocean pool and a family beach, ideas that our community put forward during consultation. We're working very closely with stakeholders like the Ocean Reef Sea Sport Club, Marine Rescue Whitfords, Joondalup City RSL and the broader community. These clubs, their members and their community leaders have been intricately involved getting this project to where we are today. The McGowan government's first budget included $120 million for the Ocean Reef Marina. We've now also secured an additional $6.5 million through the WA recovery, pro recovery Plan for the key stakeholders to have a new facility. And we're committed to delivering this project. For the new club facilities, it's important that they're built nearer to the start of the project. We know that all of the stakeholders need to remain on site until the new facility is completed, and there needs to be a seamless transition from the current locations to the new facilities. And this is particularly important for Marine Rescue Whitfords to ensure it can continue to provide its essential emergency services to our community that enjoys interacting with our WA coast. Marine Rescue Whitfords is one of the largest and busiest volunteer sea rescue groups in WA. Its operational range stretches from City Beach to Alcamos and 30 nautical miles out to sea. In 2019, more than 210 searches and rescue missions were carried out. 
The group has roughly 130 active volunteer members operating purpose-built vessels and a 24-7 radio service. It's an amazing group of dedicated volunteers who give their time to ensure that people are safe on our waters. We know that the Ocean Reef Marina will become a hub for commercial, recreational and residential activity, with capacity for 550 boat pens, 200 boat stackers and more than five hectares of community space. As I mentioned earlier, Ocean Reef Marina will also become home to Perth's first coastal pool. My family and I live within bike riding distance of the Ocean Reef Marina, so I'm looking forward to taking my kids, Maya and Ryan, out for a swim, a snorkel and even a bite to eat when the works are complete. Local people want more jobs here in Joondalup. By delivering the Ocean Reef Marina, the McGowan Government is creating local jobs now and for decades to come. The project is expected to create more than 8,000 construction jobs and will be a key economic driver for the region. I know that local families and businesses have done it tough as our state has fought to stop the spread of COVID-19. But with important projects like the Ocean Reef Marina development, we can begin our economic recovery. I'm looking forward to continuing to work together with my community to grow the Ocean Reef Marina into a world-class destination and make Joondalup our home, the best coast city community anywhere in Australia. The Ocean Reef Marina will put Joondalup on the map. Raising my family in Joondalup, it's important to me that the McGowan Labor Government continues to deliver in quality health care. The McGowan Government is putting patients first, investing $9.6 billion in health services and initiatives, which includes further upgrades at the Joondalup Health Campus. I'm so proud of our Joondalup Health Campus and the quality health care that it provides for our community. As a community representative on the Joondalup uh, Health Campus Community Board of Advice, it's very important for me to acknowledge the hard work and dedication of every single person that continues to work at the Joondalup Health Campus, and this is an incredible amount of 72 per cent of that staff live locally. The McGowan Government is delivering local jobs. Our local hospitals are one of the busiest, has one of the busiest emergency departments in Australia, in one of the fastest growing regions of Australia, so it's a key priority for me to see a major redevelopment that is currently underway and following it through to completion. We've already delivered a $7.1 million 10-bed mental health observation area. This is a facility that has been built alongside the emergency department and provides a service for emergency patients with psychiatric disorders. It provides a safe space for patients to receive the care that they need. We've already delivered a $5 million 12-bed stroke unit. This unit has six acute beds co-located with a therapy space. I know that our community has been asking for a stroke unit in Joondalup for over a decade, and we have delivered it. It's open and it's already saving lives. Every minute counts for a person experiencing a stroke. This unit now means that locals will have their travel time by cut by up to an hour each way for patients that would otherwise have to travel to Sir Charles Gardner or Fiona Stanley Hospitals. In previous years, the JHC treated around, 20, uh, around 200 stroke patients and now that the unit is open, the number is rising. It also brings patients together into one ward that enables stroke care experts from all disciplines, including doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists and speech therapists, to come together on one ward. With the significant support from Sally Allen, Pete Coglin, Robin Vanderkratz and the team at the Northern uh, Suburbs Stroke Support Group, we have delivered on this commitment. We've also delivered $1.9 million for five interim palliative care beds. I've been calling for palliative care beds to be located at the Joondalup Health Campus, and we've succeeded. With the voluntary assisted dying debate that occurred in this parliament still fresh in the minds of many, regardless of your position, it did highlight the need for extra state government funding with palliative care. The state budget provides $20.1 million to strengthen end of life care, and to support the implementation of voluntary assisted dying reforms. I spoke to many locals during the time that the debate was occurring in this place, and what I heard was very moving accounts and experiences that people had gone through during the loss of a loved one. 
What I wanted to see was the local. What I wanted to see was local support to ensure that patients who are most vulnerable can spend quality time with their loved ones, whilst not having to worry about the time, costs, and travel. That's why I'm proud to be part of the McGowan government that's already delivered 1.9 million for five interim palliative care beds at Joondalup Hospital to meet immediate needs. And there's the tender underway for 10 additional inpatient palliative care beds in the northern suburbs at a cost of approximately 9 million. We're already delivering on health and we will continue to do so for our community. Early works are underway on the major redevelopment of the Joondalup Health Campus. The JHC Development Stage 2 project is a major redevelopment with an investment of $256.7 million. We will see the construction of a new 77-bed <coughs> mental health building, 12 additional ED patient bays, 30 inpatient beds, 6 critical care beds, a new theatre, a new cath lab, a behavioural assessment, urgent care clinic, increased parking and future-proofing of inpatient beds and an upgrade to associate, associated services. Relocation and fit out of the emergency department administration area has, com uh, has commenced as part of these early works. This budget has highlighted the mammoth effect that COVID-19 has had on Western Australia. A conversation around healthcare in Joondalup would not be complete without acknowledging the hard work and dedication of each and every single person that has and continues to work at the hospital. JHC has been at the forefront of dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. They've handled one of the largest single intakes of COVID-19 patients with a zero rate of accidental transmission. Behind our frontline doctors and nurses at the JHC are thousands of hardworking people who keep our hospital running and provide us with world-class healthcare close to home. I thank each and every one of the people at Joondalup Health Campus, all 3,473 of you, for your service to our community. An important individual staff member is Disease Management Coordinator Mary McConnell. A seasoned nurse who worked in Ireland during the IRA bombings, Mary has spent many years at the JHC uh, training for situations just like the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, in November last year, she ran a pandemic scenario, a training session involving all of the JHC infection control team and other staff. So when the pandemic was declared just a few months later, the JHC employees were well and truly ready. And that was in no small way thanks to Mary. COVID-19 has presented a number of challenges and one very important aspect is the fact that the mental health system is and will continue to experience significant pressures. This state budget has addressed the current needs with increased funding to the Mental Health Commission of 7.5 per cent to just over a billion dollars. Before COVID-19, I was very aware that there were challenges being faced by younger people in our community, particularly as I've sadly heard that we have children as young as nine years of age presenting suicidal at some of our local primary schools. What I've been working on is to ensure that the younger members of our community are able to receive support as soon as they need it. Youth mental health is, is, youth mental health is something that I've raised with the Minister. In this budget, our state government is committed to additional mental health beds. Since 2017, funding has already been provided for 30 additional beds at Jindalup Health Campus, and I look forward to seeing youth mental health addressed as a matter of priority there. There is a clear need, and I will continue to advocate for additional community mental health services in our community. I think it's important to grow services for younger people's mental health challenges. Youth mental health covers ages 16 to 25, but I want to see more support for the 9 to 16 years of age in Joondalup. It's vital. Early intervention results in better outcomes for individuals. We know this, the fam for the family and also for the broader community. It's also pleasing to see that there's uh, funding of $322.2 million to address methamphetamine issues in WA. And thanks to Minister Cook for being part of a virtual community forum I held in September to share up-to-date information on the WA government response to COVID-19 with people in Joondalup. 
I did want to uh, move on to discussing the, the issue of education. As a mum with two kids attending um, a local school, I'm proud to be delivering record, part of a government delivering record investment at our local schools. This budget includes $5.5 billion for education, which is focused on preparing our kids for the jobs of the future. In Joondalup, we've seen $6.5 million in funding being delivered as part of the WA Recovery Plan. Heathridge Primary School has received $1.5 million to the administration building to improve functionality. As a board member of this school, I know that this funding has been welcomed by the school community, including Principal Denise Jeffs, Board Chair Grant Bowen and the PNC President Danielle Vanderplas. Ocean Reef Senior High School will receive a $5 million sports hall that I know is appreciated by Principal Karen Brooks, Board Chair Patrick Young and PNC President Chris McCafferty and the rest of the school community. As a local mum raising my family in Joondalup, I'm proud to be delivering two state-of-the-art performing arts centres. The new performing arts centres at Bell Ridge Secondary College and to include the Education Support Centre and also at Ocean Reef Senior High School, I know will be a huge asset not only for the school community but the broad northern suburbs community. In addition, the following have already been delivered for schools in Joondalup. We've got six science labs. At, uh, we've got the first one of uh, Science Lab in WA was opened by the Minister for Education, Sue Ellery, at Connolly Primary School. Other schools that have converted a classroom to a science lab at Beaumaris, Ocean Reef, Belden, Edgewater and Currambine Primary Schools. We all want our children to have the best opportunities at school and we know they'll benefit from this extra support in the classroom. In February this year, announcements were made that we've delivered on our election commitment to put more education assistance into WA classrooms. In the electorate of Joondalup, Eddystone Primary School received extra funding for an education assistant. Uh, very pleasing for Principal Stephen Boone and PNC President Carly Ellery. Last year, the McGowan government announced a $200 million package to address school maintenance works in public schools across WA. This major maintenance blitz represents one of the biggest investments in WA schools and will improve infrastructure in public schools and create local jobs. Twelve schools and two education centres in the Joondalup electorate received maintenance allocations totalling $3.337 million to boost high priority maintenance works. This government has been this has been great news for local school communities and the McGowan Labor government has continued to deliver for them. In March of this year, the Joondalup education community was able to join in a virtual education forum with Minister Ellery and it was attended by PNCs, school boards and school principals. Can I seek an extension, please? Extension granted. Thank you. The McGowan government continues with congestion busting, job creating road projects. We have a proven track record on building heavy rail. Metronet has an, seen an investment of $4.1 billion by the McGowan government. I'm excited that construction has started on the Yanship rail line as part of Metronet, as this will benefit Joondalup. This extension means that for those living north of us are able to travel directly to the Joondalup station. This station was designed as a transit station which is centrally located in the Joondalup CBD with direct access to Lakeside Shopping Centre, the Business District and the CAT buses. For Joondalup, this investment in heavy rail opportunities means that the Joondalup city centre and local economy will continue to thrive. It will provide a transport route for people living north to come down on the rail line and stop in Joondalup. I've long said that whilst Joondalup is a young city, it is a maturing one. But what, what is most important is that Joondalup has every aspect of an inspiring coast city community that will have all the facilities right here on our doorstep. It's my view that in the not too distant future, locals in Joondalup and further north should be able to access every service they require without having to travel further, further south than Hodges Drive. Not only easing congestion with less time in the car, it means more time at home with your family. Joondalup boasts the Learning Precinct, comprising of Edith Cowan University, <coughs> North Metro TAFE, the Police Academy, then there's Edith Cowan College, Electrical Group Training, Joondalup has the Winton Road Business Park, a police station, a courthouse, the Joondalup Resort and Golf Course, Quest Apartments, 10-storey Art House Apartments, the, car, la, the country's largest periodic table at ECU, and Joondalup will see the state's first trial of an electric cat bus 
and of course now the Ocean Reef Marina. And these are just a few of some of our assets. This budget fast tracks the widening of the Mitchell Freeway southbound to three lanes between Hodges Drive and Hepburn Ave, providing freeway users in Joondalup and the other northern suburb commuters with the benefit of a shorter journey and improved journey times, with early works expected to commence in January of 2021. The Mitchell Freeway widening will get northern suburb commuters to work faster, but will also bust congestion. And I know from my experience on the freeway heading into this place, it will give me more time in the mornings with the family. I did want to spend a few moments talking around small businesses in Joondalup that have been doing it tough. I wanted to spend a few moments to commend the small business owners in my electorate, the mums and dads, the experienced and the novices, the ones who have been working so hard during the global pandemic and economic crisis. I know what it's like. I come from a family of small business owners that are facing the challenges day by day. My father has owned and run them since I was about two. Catering, party hire, canvas manufacturing, a real mix really. I've worked in them from a young age, whether it was putting up marquees with dad at the Darren Field Day, serving food at family celebrations at people's homes or eyeliting banners. I've been around it forever, being hands-on just to help and to manage. I know that blood, sweat and tears go into small businesses and rather than a job, they are your life. In Joondalup, I know it's been hard and that there is still quite a bit of uncertainty. I've been talking to locals about the difficulties and at times the successes of what had worked or not worked as they attempted to operate. Our community members have been so supportive of local businesses in every way they can. Trying times have meant that there needed to be innovative ideas and some have worked and some have worked very well. Very early on, I started my Sunday small business shout outs on social media to do what I could to share around the details of our local small businesses with the wider community. While on the phones during COVID-19, if I heard of a small business, I'd share their info and, I'd, and this has continued while I've been on the doors. I've supported quite a number of businesses actually, but just to list a few, the Vissers Painter Service, uh, Painting Service, I uh, met the fellow on the door, Llamas Down Under came from a phone call and BDM Carpentry and Joinery uh, came from out on the doors as well. Local business owners have been very appreciative. And I also note the work done by the Joondalup Business Association with their Friday Martini Hour and ongoing virtual and now in-person networking events. And uh, the Joondalup Business Association is ably run by President Jerry and the office team. Our government will recruit 800 extra police officers over the next four years, meaning WA will have the highest number of officers per person of all the states. As of the last month, the total number of new police funded by the McGowan government since taking office is 1,100. Training is thorough, uh, sorry, training is through the West Australian P Police Academy, which, as I mentioned, is part of the Joondalup Learning Precinct. On top of the extra offices, the funding has included a rollout of major technological improvements, including body-worn cameras, personal issue uh, devices, automatic number plate recognition technology and protective vests to every frontline officer. In 2018, I was delighted to attend the police recruit graduation, which included the first four Aboriginal cadets graduating as fully sworn police officers. The Aboriginal cadet program is ongoing, with currently 36 <coughs> cadets in WA. It was my privilege uh, also to represent Minister Michelle Roberts at a Police Remembrance Day in September, laying a wreath to honour and remember police officers who have made that ultra ultimate sacrifice in line of duty. Financial support and relief for Western Australians is also important to help to continue our recovery from the pandemic. So it was great to see if part of the budget, household feed and charges have already been frozen and uh, noting that this has uh, reduced some locals' bills. But also now the McGowan Labor government has delivered the $600 WA household electricity credit. This is something I'm talking with my community about right now. Many still haven't heard that it's coming, but when I remind them, they're quite pleased. Speaking with local Joondalup residents, it's clear to me that the credit will be a welcome relief for many local families, particularly in the lead up to Christmas. In taking the time now to have worked through my speech, I'm proud to be able to say 
that we're part of the McGowan's team that's keeping WA safe and strong when I talk to my community. This budget sets us in good stead for whatever the future may present us with. In the midst of a global pandemic, our state of WA is the only state in the country to have delivered a surplus to date. With the strong leadership of our Premier Mark McGowan, WA is strong and I look forward to continuing to ensure that the McGowan government invests in and delivers for June Lub. The budget is focused on keeping Western Australians safe and strong. By protecting the health of the community and leading the state's economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic through creating opportunities for local businesses and jobs for West Australians. This Labor budget is delivering for Joondalup. As a state member for Joondalup, I look forward to continuing to work with my community to grow Joondalup, our home, the best coastal city community anywhere in Australia and continue delivering for Joondalup. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, um, member for Maylands. Thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. I uh, rise and straighten the mic as I do so you can hear what I'm saying, um, to contribute to the appropriations debate. And it's an, uh, a very opportune time for me to reflect a bit, so look a little bit back over the last four years, to look at what's happening currently, and also a bit of a view to the future. So I'm, I, I would like to be able to reflect on what's going on in my electorate, but also to look at some um, more, I suppose, visioning issues around um, bigger pictures about what I think the state government might need to tackle into the future. And in reflecting in what's been going on in uh, the wonderful electorate of Maylands over the last four years, I can't help but start uh, by mentioning the John Forrest Senior College, and uh, I have a vested interest in that college, and I sit on the uh, independent board of the college, uh, but I'm very pleased that the $50 million rebuild of what is a very old college, one of the oldest in the state now, um, is, is going ahead, uh, has started, um, some of the preparatory works have been done, a little bit of toing and froing with moving tennis courts and the like, and, um, and trying to rescue trees. But work is progressing and we are running this rebuild. Um, a lot of the work will be done out of school over summer and the holidays, but we're actually trying to move students around uh, while the school is still open rather than shut the school down like some other rebuilds have uh, had the opportunity to do. So there's a bit of tricky footwork for us in getting this rebuild done, but I'm very proud that it's going ahead. And I'm so excited that over the school graduations that we all go to between now and Christmas, that when I go to my primary school's graduations and encourage them to look at John Forrest, uh, as an option for their children into high school, then I can now say that with a $50 million upgrade to the school, it is going to be a truly beautiful school and a great place to send children. It's already got a good academic record. Um, not that there's any competition between Mount Lawley and, Mail and um, John Forrest, but hey, who am I to say they've got a really good academic record at John Forrest. So I encourage uh, my um, parents in my electorate to think about that and the new rebuild. Back at the, um, into the very, uh, into the last election in 2017, we had been fighting for a long time in my electorate over a private development that was being undertaken in the, the wetlands on the river, on the Swan River, the end of King William Street in Bayswater. And uh, there were two blocks that were under development. One of them was referred to as the Carter's Block, the, the owners at the time were named, uh, their name is Carter. Um, the other block was a little bit more advanced in redevelopment, so we had trouble in intervening in that. But reflecting on the incredible uh, work of my community at saying, no, this is not good enough, and uh, applauding their tenacity and their vocal objections, we were able to, coming into government, uh, very, very proudly fund a million dollars towards the purchase of the Carter's wetland block so that that is now retained forever as part of the Eric Singleton Bird Sanctuary. It extends over the walk trail and it's a beautiful part of the, um, of the electorate. Uh, very proud to have been able to see that, uh, see that saved. 
I couldn't possibly talk about what's happening in my electorate without mentioning uh, the Bayswater Metronet project. Um, I've probably been heard in this house to call Bayswater at the centre of my universe before today. Uh, I would reiterate that. It has been, in every sense of the word, the centre of my universe over this four years. And I fear it will continue to be pretty, pretty f to the, to the uh, forefront of my thoughts in the coming years as well. So that redevelopment is um, a, a very important part of the Metronet uh, scheme overall. And I just remember that that before the last election in 2017, in fact, in the September leading into the Christmas, just before we broke, um, with the election coming in March the following year, I was able to host the very first public consultation with my community in Western Australia on the topic of Metronet. And when, when I called that, I, I was told later, people, people said, oh, she'll get 50, 60 people there. Well, we got 200. We've got 200 people there. It just shows interest. They were fantastic, yeah. They were very concerned and they were very excited and very connected to what we wanted to do. And it was a case of saying to them, tell us what your ideas are. Don't just shut down and say, this is the plan. Tell us what your ideas are. Now, I draw your attention to that and remind myself of that because that was in 2016. So Metronet has, over four years, the Metronet Bayswater project has had four years of consultation with my community, starting back in 2016, at every stage of the development, at every stage of the planning, as it's emerged that it, it's had to get bigger, more expansive, um, and uh, pick up some additional issues that we weren't expecting at the time. Uh, Everyone in my, well, the, the affected members in my community have been offered the opportunity to, to uh, contribute. Now, clearly, not everybody likes redevelopment, and I get that. I totally understand. The real challenge in Bayswater is it's a heritage suburb, and Midland is a heritage line, and it's not something that, at the time, Main Roads, PTA and the like, had had a lot of experience in putting this kind of a brand new infrastructure, a new train station, into uh, what is basically a heritage line and a heritage part of um, uh, part of uh, the the city. So there were many challenges. Most strongly among them is my community is really, really connected to the trees and to the heritage uh, facades and the architecture of Bayswater. There is strong um, historic architecture in Bayswater and it's imperative that we retain and reflect that in what we do in the for, in, with uh, the redevelopment of the train station. It's, it's pretty hard to think that you could build uh, two additional bridges through Bayswater and, and still do it um, in a heritage classic heritage way. So the whole notion of adaptation has had to be first and foremost in the architectures and the planning for the train stations. There are two bridges, uh, and I just remind members of that, there are two bridges going into the Bayswater uh, train station, not just one. I have said that repeatedly to my community since day one, since we were elected in uh, 2017. And the second bridge, of course, is tied up with the Morley Ellenbrook line. But going back to the first development that is taking place, it started already, and I'm proud to say that I was one of the marching band that escorted the beautiful tree that we replanted uh, right down the middle of King William Street. That was a day that I will never forget, walking behind this massive tree as it was craned down the centre of my electorate. And it took two cranes, one to get it out and to lift it, and then the other to pass it on. It was it's kind of like a hurdle arrangement. <laughs> very slow hurdling, I might too. Yeah, very mm. slow baton, very slow and quite hairy because it had leaves everywhere but and roots, of course. But to see that tree moved because my community said, you cannot 
get rid of it. You must retain it. And it's actually really healthy now. Those of you who are driving down King William Street, have a look at the Senior Sit Centre in Basie and have a look at the beautiful tree that's planted next to it. She's a bit smaller than she was because it's taken a while to grow her branches all fully back, but she's on her way and she's very healthy. So I'm incredibly proud of that strategy and very thankful that um, uh, the Minister for Transport took on board what my community was saying at that time. The other thing that this has done in, in Bayswater, as, or, as I should imagine any major infrastructure project will do, is it's, it, it has activated my community and brought them together in an, in an absolutely amazing way. I had been, from the time I was elected in 2012 uh, and um, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2008 and subsequently in 2012, uh, I was very keen to see what we could do to activate Bayswater. And because there hadn't been this level of activity, it was quite difficult. With the coming of this redevelopment, people were very keen to come together. Obviously, there are loud voices. They organise, there are some very good community groups, and I pay great respect to every single, every single person involved in those community groups. Whether I agree with your position is irrelevant. What they have done is come together and strongly voice their opinions, and they have carried that through. I hope that they realise that they've been listened to, and everything that has been done at the moment in the planning for the final treatment of the station and into the future around Development WA's work of the precinct. Uh, everything is in with the background and the, if you like, the, the wash behind the station is the wash created by my community that, that talks about heritage, about a green canopy and about a, a village atmosphere. I'm very proud of the community groups that have supported this project and those that have opposed it because they've come with um, a professional perspective and by and large been very, very professional at how they've managed their behaviour. Uh, and, and they have been heard. This has been the biggest consultation ever being conducted on um, the building of a railway station. I'm certainly not talking about Row 8 here because that was a lot more um, heated. I'm very much talking about the Bayswater train station and the level of consultation has been extraordinary. I personally and um, uh, have had no problem in getting Metronet to respond when I've um, spoken to them and they've responded on behalf of my community very quickly. To, there has been a few instances where it's taken a bit longer than I would have ideally liked, but they've always come back to me with some, um, some responses. Obviously, the responses are not always going to be what the person who's inquiring has wanted as the ideal outcome, but they've been, they've been responsive and, and clear and I've been able to put, the, um, put a position. I wanted to, um, and I look forward. To, I look forward to the next two, three, four years of construction in my lecture. I'm sure there's a lot of people who are not looking forward to the construction, but it will happen, and we will get it get it through as safely as possible. I also note that the Evolve Bayswater team have just taken up office space in the Bendigo Bank building um, on Watley Crescent, so that they're holding forums to. Um, show the public or take questions and whatever. And that was something I asked right from the get-go. They needed to be there because you need to be there while a construction like this is happening in order to be correctly informed and advise the community when complaints start come, which I'm sure they will, or inquiries, or inquiries, or just information needed. If I move you up the line and across a bit to the northwest. Um, you'll end up at the FAL tunnel and uh, the spur which will take us off into the Morley Ellenbrook line. The Morley train station is also being built um, on the edge of my electorate, the member for Morley's electorate and the member for Bassendine's electorate. However, the majority of it, land use wise, comes into my, spills into my electorate. So I'm very keen to make sure that that development is positive for my community. Um, I've been door knocking, phoning. Um, I have had one person who was not happy with it, who said that they hadn't heard about it. Um, he claimed there was someone else he'd spoken to who was not happy with it, that's fine. Uh, but by and large, the people I've spoken to around that uh, suburb have looked to the positives that they see coming with the train station being built. And when you assure them and reassure them that the, that the infrastructure that's in place 
um, will be relocated. And by that, I should, I should mention the skate park. I've got an avid group of skaters, um, and I love that. I love that they are passionate about what they do. It's a great pastime for kids. Parents are there. They watch, they watch their children skating. Um, it, it, the, the, the skateboarding is, you know, like there's a, a huge international uh, competition. Well, there was before COVID, so I'm assuming it'll go on after COVID or when in the new normal. <clears throat> it's a very um, committed and very uh, growing sport. <clears throat> and parents like to be there and watch their kids. So it's been very safe and very well received. We want to keep that and we want to make sure it is relocated. So we're providing the, the money in the Metronet, in that uh, station design, we're providing the money to the consultants to actually, and through the City of Bayswater, to relocate the skate park. Uh, the City of Bayswater are currently um, doing a consultation. They've got a steering committee with the skaters on it. Um, all working very hard to find a location that it can be moved to, which will be really good. And I look forward to uh, being part of the skating opening ceremony when it happens. I'm sure it will be a very positive event. Before I leave Morley, I need to reflect on some of the downside of what uh, has not happened in that precinct. I'm not talking about the train station. I'm moving down the road, down Walter Road, to look at Morley itself. Now, by any measure, by any measure, Morley is not in a positive development at the moment. It is stuck. It's stuck and it's tired and it's sad. And the main reason for that is that we cannot get the development going. It needs to be kick-started. The government, the McGowan government is spending hundreds of millions of dollars, the train station at Morley and Ellenbrook, uh, at the Morley, uh, uh, just up Prune Avenue, with, uh, with interfaces to bring people to and from the Morley shopping precinct. And right in the middle of that, the major landowners in that area, uh, the city of Bayswater, who is very keen to try and kickstart some development in there, um, Bunnings have shut their store in Morley. Uh, and we spoke with the, and they've handed it over the, uh, the what to do with that building to the Bunnings Trust. Uh, the Bunnings Trust have put a freeze on doing anything for 15 years. I'm sorry, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. I think they're aware of the feelings and uh, myself and the member for Morley have made it very clear that we are not happy with that plan and we are encouraging them with the government, with their government, with taxpayer money going into Morley that they should come to the party. But the other big landowner I'd like to mention is um, vicinity centres who are the Galleria. <clears throat> I remember as a child being so excited by the Galleria because it was the first big shopping centre. It was all great and glossy and glitzy. Now it is just a poor cousin. Shops are closing down. Shops have down, um, down their stocking levels. You can't get the range of things that you used to be able to get there. And quite frankly, why would you want to go there at the moment? It's, a, it's, not, a good, it's not a good experience. I don't want to talk <coughs> Morley down. Morley is an amazing suburb and it has a great residential, uh, great residential uh, presence. Can I have a bit of a time? Extension Something. granted. Has a great residential neighbourhood around it. And there are people who are very switched on. There's activation groups starting. The Morley Momentum is a key group in the area that's kicking things along. I simply say to the Bunnings Trust and to vicinity centres, when your government is spending hundreds of millions of dollars working on your area, working in such a prime location, so close to the city, on the train line, with a station, with bus transit routes planned, why would you not invest in that area with them? Why would you not come along? Why would you let the members of that community down? I look forward to being part of the solution when it's put forward by Bunnings and the vicinity centre to seeing Morley have a bit of a renaissance. A couple of other issues that I turn to, that's, I suppose that's in essence the, uh, a synopsis of, that's a synopsis of where I've been in the last four years and where we are at present. I wanted to mention a couple of other things. This morning, I was very, very privileged to be able to host an event outside the Aboriginal People's Room, uh, that uh, an event to launch 
the Reimagining Homes Innovation Project that has been developed by a researcher, Liz Lennon, and supported by Shelter WA and Connect Vic Park. I'm very proud to have been part of that. And Liz, who's the researcher who developed um, these documents, and they will be available online. I won't table them uh, today, but uh, well, actually, maybe I should table the documents. The Reimagining Home, the full research project. There is um, also a synopsis, a summary of the framework she has created, and then a lookbook with some designs, and I'll explain what she's done in a minute. Uh, Member for Maylands, are you going to table the documents? I will do, yes. OK, all right. I'll do it at the end, yeah. yeah. Okay. I will, I'll leave it when I sit down. Okay. So I will do that. Um, I just wanted to talk a little about what this is about. Liz's presentation, funded and supported by Connect Vic Park and Shelter WA, tells a story of citizens in Australia, and specifically in Western Australia, who are invisible, silent, well-behaved, despite the fact that they're often low or unpaid. They're often, they are patient, persistent, and remarkably resilient. They may never feel quite safe or secure in housing, because it doesn't feel like a home. They don't look too far into the future because they see despair. They'll be unpaid carers for adult children, grandparents, par parents and friends. They'll be the first to volunteer in their community and they have great stories to tell. These citizens are the older women and specifically the older single women on low incomes who number in the hundreds of thousands across Australia living in housing stress and at risk of homelessness. This framework was created by Liz from her own experience of housing stress and homelessness in Ireland and in Western Australia through her 50s and now into her 60s. When she returned to WA in 2015 after living in Ireland for more than 20 years, the last six in Ireland were a mix of house sitting and living in fairly poor housing conditions as a result of the global financial crisis decimating the country and her consultancy. She decided that she'd rather live in a poor, but she'd rather be poor in a warm country than a cold one, so she came back to Australia, and I'm very glad that she has done. Um, Liz has produced this Reimagining Homes project and a lookbook, as she calls it, which provides over 40 examples of affordable social housing led by or focused on older single women on low incomes, older people, other people on low incomes, and a range of communities and of identity that who, who also may be on in, uh, lower incomes. And this lookbook is exactly what you might think it is. It's a book to look at to see the incredible talent and creativity that architects from all over the world have brought to building homes with older single women that meet, a, that create a community and that meet their expectation and their lifestyle needs. There are, I, sit, I did say to Liz when she was in the process of putting this together, I really want to see some, ish, some pictures. I want to see some visuals. I'm a visual person. I wanted to see what's possible. And so she put this together. There are 40 different accommodation types shown in this, and some of them are quite spectacular, quite amazing. The, uh, there is a, a big document and a much shorter visual summary following a fight with a five-step strategic narrative that she created to make the complex look simple. The five steps she's put into the framework are a strategic journey that we should all take in understanding and reimagining homes with older single women. Poverty drives housing stress and the risk of homelessness. For many of us, the issue of housing stress and homelessness is a lack of livable income. Many people are, are not all, they're not all high needs and they don't actually need extra support services. Of course, some people do need extra support services, but not all do. A recently published report from the University of Adelaide titled Understanding the Population Size and Demographics of Older Women at Risk of Homelessness in Australia revealed that across Australia, 408,000 women aged 45 plus were experiencing housing stress and at risk. That means about 50,000 of them live in WA. And of that 50, 32,000 live in the Perth metropolitan area. 
I won't go into the reports because they'll be available online through Shelter WA's website and I thank them for what they've done to support this research and to make it available to uh, developers, to architects, to older single women who are looking at different ways of living their lives uh, and to the government. Housing options that are included in, uh, in Liz's research are things like cooperative housing, co-housing, mixed tenure housing, tiny homes, built to rent mixed tenure, and co-sharing, co-living. Many of these hybrid options will appeal to women in the community who may, may look at these as slightly more creative than the apartments that we're used to putting people in, one on top of the other. I think it's important that we look at what we're trying to aim for. And I think we should be aiming, that, aiming for a different model uh, for older single women and for the housing market to step up and include them in their planning into the future. I can pretty much guarantee that most older single women, and this is Liz's words, I should, I should say I'm quoting, she says, I can pretty much guarantee that most older single women living in poverty in Australia and Western Australia do not wake up every morning saying, what a great day. My housing stress and risk of homelessness is not my fault. It's the result of the federal government refusing to see that social and affordable housing is an infrastructure investment. It's structural and gender equalities. It gave me a lifetime of low pay, low savings, low, no superannuation, unpaid caring, sex, sexism and ageism in the workplace, violence when I go home, and a poverty shaming narrative that makes me feel worthless. Oh, happy day. It's an Australian housing tax discount system that supports the wealthy and wishes the poor would just go away. No, most older women instead blame themselves and quietly try to make do. They often see themselves as failures because somehow they don't own a home or they don't have much money. These are success indicators in our society. They will feel invisible and und heard. If we continue to support any kind of narrative that shames older women generally and older single women on low income specifically, then shame on us. Shame, as us. shame on us as individuals. Shame on us as government. This framework has been developed as a guide to creating homes for life with older single women at the forefront. <clears throat> it's not prescriptive. There's no one size fits all model. And the model identifies what's important regardless of the kind of homes we choose to, correct, we choose to create. I encourage members who are interested in the subject of homelessness, um, poverty, and um, the state of uh, older single women in Australia to have a look at Liz's report when it comes online through Shelter WA. I think it's an outstanding document and it has lessons for many of us, uh, particularly for those of us who, who classify ourselves as having some leadership roles in these agendas. The final thing I want to mention in my last three minutes of, uh, of speaking, probably in this parliament really, um, before the election, uh, who knows what happens after the election. Final thing I want to mention is the issue of rights in Australia. And this is topical and um, controversial, but I want to mention it uh, because 13 years ago, I spent six months travelling around Western Australia with Fred Cheney, Colleen Haywood. Oh, that's Fred already. <laughs> I've already got an extension, I know what you're saying. Um, with Colleen Haywood, Professor Colleen Haywood, uh, the Honourable Peter Carnley, the former head of the uh, Church of England, and with the wonderful Senator, ex, uh, the Honourable Fred Cheney, to consult West Australians on the issue of rights in this country. Did we need one in this state? So Australia does not have a national bill of rights like, for instance, the, U the US or um, South Africa or many other countries. Um, in other states, such as in Victoria, in Queensland, just two years ago, in Victoria some years ago, and in the ACT some years ago, they have brought into play a Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities, which one of the things it does, and I suppose it's, it's if I can quickly just say, they went out and did an extensive consultation, and indeed I think that would be what we would need to do as a starting point in Western Australia as well. We need to go back to the community and say, what do you think? Should we? Should 
should we be developing a charter or a bill or something around rights in this state that apply to West Australia and Western Australians? That would be the starting point, so a consultation would be a starting point. Um, the, at, at, when you work with stakeholders on the ground, you'll find many people will actually not understand human rights as an issue or where the gaps are in rights in this country. And of course, the argument against a Human Rights Act is that it's unnecessary because many rights might be, you know, um, protected in criminal law and common law. It, it's true to say that some rights are protected. However, there are gaps. There are gaps, and in a developed first world country such as Australia, there should not be gaps. We should, we should be confident that our rights are protected. So Victoria and ACT have had human rights laws for many years, and we've seen stronger protection for, for instance, people with a disability, with families threatened with homelessness, women and children experiencing family violence, and many other groups in the community. When governments have to take into account human rights, when they write laws, and they make laws, and they deliver services, and the way the courts are operated, then there is some accountability. So that in particular, the Victorian Bill insists that when the parliament writes new bills, that it puts it through a filter, that a assesses its impact, if it has any, on human rights and puts a report forward to the parliament that says this bill does impact on human rights. And, you know, that might be okay, but at least we go into law, making law, knowing what we're doing and knowing where the impact is likely to be held. I recommend that consideration, a consultation on human rights. Member for Bunbury. I have two minds to speak to the appropriation bill, but I'd like to start by actually acknowledging the passion and spirit of the contribution of the member for Mayland. And that's what we have on this side of the House, people who are proud of their electorates, proud to be part of this government, proud to stand up for issues that are really important to them and do so with a great deal of passion. So thank you. And you'll be very pleased to know, member for Mayland, that our tiny housing project in Bunbury is well on the way and we're particularly interested in the issues around the vulnerabilities of older women who for, uh, for uh, many years... Member for years Bunbury, from... I'm sorry, just for a moment, uh, you will table the document, Member for Maylands. Sorry, Member for Bunbury, you can uh, continue. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Yes, um, uh, who similarly have suffered for many years from inequality, so thank you for that contribution and I look forward to reading the report. Uh, I did want to start by thanking the people of Bunbury who elected me back in March 2017. You realise when you're in this place what a great privilege it is to actually be here, to represent your constituents, to contribute to the debates that have such a fundamental impact on the future of Western Australia and the lives of everyday people. And uh, I've enjoyed every day of the uh, period that I've been here since I was elected. And it is, of course, great to be part of a team that went to the 2017 election with such a clear agenda, fixing the state finances, delivering an ambitious range of legislative reform, and further work in health, education, and a focus on jobs, and a clear commitment not to sell Western power, unlike the members opposite, who's got a, a secret agenda of dismembering the energy infrastructure that's owned by the state of Western Australia, dismembering it, and in the process, causing a, a resultant increase in the cost of power to people in regional Western Australia through the loss of the uniform tariff policy. That's what in, the members opposite will do. Uh, in accordance with Standing Order 61, this business is interrupted and adjourned until a later day of this day's sitting. Uh, Leader of the House. Speaker, uh, I move that private member's business notice of motion number three be now taken. Member for Darling Range. Oh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Member for Darling Range. Thank you, Acting Speaker. I stand to move the motion in my name and I move that this House condemns the WA Labor government for its failures after four years to manage important frontline services and for its failure to protect and support the vulnerable in our community. And Acting Speaker, when I was actually contemplating uh, preparing for this uh, motion today, 
uh, I thought, well, we're at the second last day of parliament for this term of government. And it was only two years ago uh, that I uh, joined uh, this term of government uh, for the, in the lower house at the by-election uh, for the seat of Darling Range. So I thought, being the second last day, it would be fit to actually look back on uh, my inaugural speech that I made on the 14th of August 2018. And as I think most members do, you look back to see what you promised uh, in this place and what you promised to your community to make sure that you're actually <coughs> delivering what you said you would do. And what I found interesting, Acting Speaker, is as I was uh, reading back over my speech, I find that uh, nothing has changed. Sadly, uh, the things I raised, uh, the issues, the important matters that I raised in my inaugural speech, as a result of the feedback I received from the people of Darling Range while out door knocking, while talking to them during the by-election, and then again after uh, the successful result of the by-election, um, I brought their issues and concerns to this place through my uh, opening speech. So to go back and look at it and to see that sadly the message that they sent so clearly on that day to this government, uh, that they were not happy with uh, the changes they had made uh, to the increase of water and the increase of power and the increase to car registration, uh, that they weren't happy uh, with the changes that were made to services front lines like our HUGS program, that they weren't happy uh, with the threat of shutting down our community resource centres. They weren't happy about the uh, threat again of that our family neighbourhood centres were going to lose funding and the rigmarole that those centres, our neighbourhood family centres, went through under the first 12 to two years of this government was horrendous. We had volunteers and community groups across our family neighbourhood centres who give so much to our community in limbo land, not knowing if they were going to have their funding uh, renewed, whether they were going to have their funding reduced, uh, whether they were going to have their funding cancelled completely. I still talk to uh, my fantastic uh, staff and the volunteers at the Rolling Stone Family Neighbourhood Centre, and you know what they still discuss? They still discuss the impact um, that the government changes and the impost they put on them. Uh, they still discuss. They still discuss the impact that it had on them. And it was actually, it's really sad that you actually have a government come into place and the first thing they do is put these guys into that, that stressful situation. I won't be taking interjections, Acting Speaker. Um, Deputy sorry, Speaker. Minister, um, the member on her feet is not taking interjections. Would you like me to call you, Minister? Perhaps not. Go ahead, Member of Darling Rain. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. So, as I said, I was reflecting back on the speech that I gave when I first came in, and to see that none of these things have changed after two years, you would have thought that this government would have stopped and listened to that result uh, in 2018 uh, that the people of Darling Range sent, saying that they cannot afford this government and that they need this government to get in behind them and start supporting them. But sadly, as I look back, none of this stuff has changed. So it goes further on to uh, issues like we had, uh, if you remember back members, there was uh, the closure of the Mora Residential College. Uh, there was the funding withdrawn from the Lansdale Farm School um, and the infamous backflip on the Perth Modern School and the School of the Air. Uh, so these are all the things that we were looking at two years ago, on top of the fact that uh, there was no works planned, no commitment, um, prom uh, the commitment and the promise not delivered on for the Tonkin Highway extension from Thomas Road through to South West Highway, that the roundabout that was promised for the Nicholson Road and Thomas Road, was, again, no action had been taken. So as I keep flicking through, these are the same arguments that I'm standing up two years later asking this government to start delivering for the people of Darling Range. So when I went out door knocking in 2018, the number one issue 
was the increase in power bills, the increase in water bills, the increase in car registrations. And when I went out door knocking only two weeks ago, I spoke to a couple of people at the door and they said the first thing their issue was again, the increase of power, the increase of water, the increase of car registration. So in the four years of this government, they have done nothing, absolutely nothing, to bring down the cost of living for our hard-working, struggling families across Western Australia. So as part of my uh, speech when I first came into this place was my commitment to the people of Darling Range. And my commitment was to be their voice. It was to be their voice and to not shy away from raising any of these issues in Parliament and to not shy away from asking the difficult questions and to stand up for what they want in their electorate and to stand up for what I promised I would deliver. And I can say proudly I have done that in every opportunity possible in this place. And I know it's not kept members on the other side um, friendly. And uh, every time I stand up, they, they love to yell and scream. But I've done it for the people of Darling Range. I have stood up every possible moment to actually advocate for the needs of the people of Darling Range. And I will never stop and I will never shy away from that. So this morning, um, I tabled a petition on behalf of uh, a community within Darling Range. And that was a petition in relation to the proposed Thomas Road Bridge Over Rail project. And uh, Deputy Speaker, I'd just like to reflect on that, if I may. Uh, this was a petition that was uh, started up by some very concerned residents over a project that has been rushed through. So at a time where the people of Darling Range have been asking for the Tonkin Highway extension, uh, that was promised by the Premier and the Minister back in 2017, and we have still seen absolutely zero action on this project. We then have a residents wake up to a mail drop in their letterbox saying that they're going to have a bridge over Thomas Road, over the rail, right outside their front door and taking property off some of the landowners without any consultation. So while we have projects that are waiting to be delivered, we're seeing projects that are being rammed through without any environmental protection assessment, without any community consultation, without no proper planning process being undertaken, just rammed through for a simple media release so this government can actually stand up and say, hey, we're starting something new in the seat of Darling Range. All they do is start another media release, another announcement. But I have to say, Deputy Speaker, this one has backfired because it's actually upset a large number of people within the community. When you actually want to come along and take people's property off them or you want to put an 11.3 metre wall outside the front of their home without consulting, you're going to get kicked back. Now, these people understand. They understand that this has to happen. They understand that there needs to be a solution of the rail crossing at Thomas Road. But what they are asking for is simply to be consulted with, simply to be spoken to, to be given some warning. And if I can try and pass on any advice to this government, is bring people with you when you want to do a project of this size. Do not alienate them by dropping off a media release in their uh, letterbox saying this is what's happening on your back to, in your uh, front yard. Part of one of the areas is there's over 300 trees, 60 years old. Now, it is uh, on the road side and also on a private property. On the other side of Thomas Road is a vacant, clear piece of land that was set aside for the road reserve. But this isn't being used. Instead, they're going to knock down the 300 uh, trees that are up to 60 years old uh, that the black cockatoos feed on. They're going to knock that over without one consideration of an environmental assessment uh, process. That, I have to say, I find extremely surprising to have that coming out of a Labor government. Uh, I know that if it was us in government doing this project, you would be having pickets and signs and people tying themselves to those trees. Yet when you're in power, you see no reason 
to consult, do the environmental process and fo pro uh, follow, follow proper planning process. So I'd like to congratulate the very brave men and women uh, from the Darling Downs and Byford and Marygrove Primary School and Byford Primary School communities for joining together in getting a petition together in very short notice and working on, in their time, day and night and on the weekends, uh, to retract these signatures and try and make sure their community was aware of it. We also have tabled a petition in regards to the proposed realignment of the South West Freight Line. Again, while the people of Darling Range are waiting for the Tonkin Highway extension to come through, we are now seeing the Shire and the State Government realigning the freight line realignment without any consultation or consideration for homeowners. We've had an alignment that has been in place since 2008. And last year, the Shire saw fit to change that alignment to go through homes that are only three years old, through an equestrian precinct where people have bought properties, built their homes to invest in uh, horse stables to be able to have their horses and enjoy that lifestyle. An equestrian precinct that the Shire of Serpentine Jarradale put forward. We now have the same Shire and the State Government picking up the freight line realignment that's been there since 2008, realign it and go smack through uh, straight through people's homes. That's just not good enough. Again, the people of Darling Range, all they're getting from this government, no consultation, no consideration. We're just going to ram through the projects we want and ignore the ones uh, that we promised. So, as I said, I've raised a couple of times already the Tonkin Highway extension. And when we talk about lack of services uh, being delivered by this government, road safety would be one of the most important services a government should deliver to its community. And we all know in this place, media release after media release by the government, media release by the federal government, commitments by the opposition. We all understand the need to extend the Tonkin Highway extension. We all know it's going to take trucks off South Western Highway through the town of Byford, through Mundajong, through Serpentine, and it's going to put them on to Tonkin Highway and get them out of heavy local traffic and make our local roads safe. We all know that. So why is it taking this government so long to act on it? The full funding is there. $505 million project, $404 million committed by the federal government, by the federal member for Canning, Andrew Hastie. It is there. It is being matched by the Labor state government. The Premier and the Minister matched it in 2017, 2018, 2019, promising, promising, promising to deliver this. Sadly, what we've seen in the budget, money just keeps getting pushed out further and further. And when you ask, when you ask where in the budget, Minister, is the funding for the Tonkin Highway extension, she won't answer. She says it's there in the pool of funding, the pool of funding of the Tonkin Highway corridor. The Tonkin Highway corridor starts from Guildford Road and goes all the way through to Thomas Road. So when she says the pool of funding, we mean we have to wait for the Hale Road intersection upgrade. We have to wait for the Kelvin Road intersection upgrade. We have to keep waiting for the Welshpool intersection upgrade before she's even going to start looking at the Tonkin Highway extension from Thomas to South Western Highway. So when the Premier and the Minister come out saying that they're delivering Tonkin Highway, the people of Darling Range do not believe you. Until we see dirt turned and bulldozers on site and properties purchased along that alignment, we know that this government has no priority on delivering the Tonkin Highway extension. We also have the Thomas Nicholson Road upgrade. Again, fully funded. 10 million from the federal government, member for Canning, Andrew Hastie. 10 million from the state government, promised. Promised again in 2017, it was announced by um, RAC that it uh, needs major, uh, has major safety concerns 
and in 2017-18 the government said they would do it. In 2019 they said, absolutely, here's our money, we're delivering the uh, Nicholson Road, uh, Thomas Road upgrade. Yet in the budget, this year's budget just come out, we see that in 2019-20, when there was a million dollars allocated for the uh, Thomas Road, Nicholson Road upgrade, only 490,000 was spent. Over $500,000 not spent. So that's now been pushed over to the next year. It was meant to be completed by the budget paper last year, by 2022-23. We're now seeing it's been pushed out to 23-24. So again, when the minister and the premier comes out to Darling Range and wave their uh, media release that we are delivering the Nicholson Road, Thomas Road roundabout, well, tell the truth. Tell them you're not planning on delivering it to 2024 because that's what's in your budget paper. And the people of Darling Range are sick and tired of the services that you keep delivering not being uh, achieved and not even being started. So I'll move on uh, to one of the other main issues that was raised with me when door knocking in 2018 and continues to be raised. Um, and as uh, I touched on, it was the cost of living. But one of the, the hardest ones, I think, uh, is the worst thing that this community has faced is the change that this government made to the HUGS program. Extending the waiting period 180 days for people who are in need, 180 days for you to be able to access uh, ass assistance when you're in financial stress. Now, before COVID-19, we know that our HUGS service centres and our national debt helpline were ringing off the hook. We know that their numbers went through the roof before COVID-19. I would love to know right now what their numbers are like now with COVID-19 in place, because I know the calls I'm getting through my office have doubled. I know the assistance that our local community groups, our local church groups, our salvation uh, group, I know that their work is going through the roof. As I've mentioned in this time before, in this place before, we have the Byford Baptist Church who work with Food Bank and they deliver food and house food packages every week to families in need. They have tripled under COVID-19. They are seeing people coming to them for the very first time, people who are embarrassed to come to them because they don't normally like taking a handout. And then when we have a hugs program that was, that was cut by giving less access and reducing the time for people to get access, uh, increasing the time, sorry, for people to get access to the hugs program and to see that this was not changed or altered under COVID-19, I have to say is completely disappointing. We had bill after bill in this place during COVID-19 to make sure that we were responding as quick as possible uh, to the community's needs uh, under the COVID crisis. Yet, the HUGS program was never ever to be seen. No changes there, no assistance to the people in need. So I just want to remind um, the Premier that he promised the people of Darling Range that he would not turn his back on them, no matter the outcome of the by-election in Darling Range. He promised that he would continue uh, to deliver on the commitments that he made, both at 2017 and the commitments that he made at uh, the by-election in 2018. But sadly, as I started off, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, he did not deliver on any of them, and I'm still standing here waiting for one of those promises to be delivered. <coughs> Education is a major service of a state government in any state. And I have to say this, the cash splash that went across in the 3rd of August, I think it was about $492 million that went out uh, to all the schools across WA. I've got 19 schools in the Cedar Darling Range. Guess how many schools in Darling Range benefited from that $492 million splash? One. One school received a demountable. 
Out of my 19 schools, one school got some money for a demountable. Now, we have some old schools in Darling Range. The Marygrove Primary School needs so much love. They need so much love. Uh, their, their playground is concrete. The oval is like concrete. Uh, it, is, it needs a lot of attention. We've got the Rolly Stone Community College. They do not have an undercover area. They do not have an indoor gym. So when they have to have a school assembly and it's too hot, they can't hold it. If it's too wet, they can't hold it. If they have an Anzac service, which is raining, they can't hold it. To have an end of year assembly and invite all the parents in the middle of summer, the parents are sitting out in the sun to be able to attend this. We're in 2020. Every school should have an undercover area. Every school should have an indoor gymnasium. And yet when I wrote to the Minister for Education and asked her about getting some funding for the Rolly Stone Community College, the letter I received back said, it will be a priority. I have no money at the moment, but the Rolly Stone Community College uh, will be a priority. And yet five days after receiving that letter, a $492 million splash uh, in education was sent across the state and Rolly Stone didn't see a cent. So I can tell you now, the people of Darling Range are very upset. They know that they can't trust a word that comes out of the mouth of this government. When you have a minister say the school be made a priority and five days later they do not receive one cent of $492 million. <coughs> Clifton Hills Primary School, same deal. Their undercover area floods in winter. Their undercover area is a piece of colour bond roof over the top with no sides. They can't meet in winter because it is wet. It is like a pool. They, can, they cannot meet. Excuse me, Minister? But the school manage. Do you know what you did? Did you say anything, Do you know what I you don't did? think so. Do you know what you did? I when, don't think so. I don't think you heard me say anything the, uh, about that. On the election of Darling Range, a truck went through a, um, part, a building of the Clifton Hills Primary <coughs> School. A truck went through, smashed the whole building. Do you know what this government did? We're not going to build you a new one. We're going to fix it. It has taken two and a half years for it to be completed. A truck goes through a school, it gets demolished, and you don't tear it down and build a new one. No, no, no. You get contractors out to build one half and contractors to build the other half. They don't talk. It's an absolute nightmare. It wasted so much time of that school's principal and committee. It was ridiculous. It is shameful what this government did to the Clifton Hills Primary School. They also have the old fire system. So they are not able to upgrade they're not able to upgrade their undercover area because the department says you need the new fire protection unit. But you know what? The department won't give them the money to upgrade their fire uh, protection system. So now they can't upgrade their undercover area. And your minister said, I will have a look at it. And again, in the cash splash of $492 million, you could not find one cent for the Clifton Hills Primary School. So when I hear member after member talking about their wonderful new schools, and then I have to go to Darling Range and apologise on behalf of this government that they have been neglected, and I get an interjection from a minister who has absolutely no idea, um, I, I just think they really need to understand and stop and listen to the result of the people from Darling Range that are telling you to listen to them and stop ignoring them and stop turning your back on them. So we also, I, I could go on for hours on our schools, but all I can say for the schools of Darling Range, um, they've been let down by this Labor state government and I promise to keep advocating for them and you are always going to be a priority of mine. I won't touch on small business and tourism because, quite frankly, I know it just falls on deaf ears and I've done it so many times in this place. Um, so I suppose let's hope for the election.
Let's hope for the election uh, we get into government and we can fix up all the mistakes by the current minister. And you know, if we don't, let's just hope there's a new minister at the helm, because I can tell you right now the performance uh, and the lack, the lack of support for the small business and tourism sector has been missing badly from the current minister. So I'm, I'm not even going to waste any more oxygen on that. That's just going to be um, a waste of time for uh, this place. But I'll move on to a surplus. We have a surplus in this budget of $1.2 billion. So at a time where I've just listed uh, all this money that's been given uh, for the Tonkin Highway, money given for the Thomas Road um, Nicholson Roundabout, not done, not delivered, unemployment through the roof, the people of Darling Range, the second issue after cost of living is jobs. Jobs. And this government went to the election with a jobs plan. And before COVID-19, couldn't even achieve it then. Now they're going to use COVID-19 as an excuse. And in question time today, mm. question time today, the Treasurer was asked about unemployment. And his words were, we should all be proud of our unemployment rate. We should be proud. We're leading the nation. We, our economy is bouncing back. Well, do you know what? Of the 97,000 people across Western Australia who don't have a job, they're not proud about that. They're not proud about that. The 140,000 people across Western Australia who are underemployed because there's not enough work out there for them, they're not proud about that. And I don't think they're going to like the comments coming from the Treasurer and coming from this government that they're proud about their unemployment numbers. You may say the economy is turning. You may say everything's rosy. But get out of the bubble and go talk to the real people on the street who don't have their jobs, who can't pay your bills, who cannot pay your water, cannot pay your car registration. This is the whole issue. This is the whole issue. So uh, the Minister for Small Business is pretending he knows something. So let's, <laughs> let's, just, let's just remind him um, of the $10,000 grant that they think is a joke to support small business. And they keep saying no other state around the country is doing this. Well, if he just did his homework or asked someone, because I'm sure someone in his office knows the answer. But when they say no other state has offered any assistance to small business of up to a $10,000 grant, he could not be more wrong. Victoria actually offered $500 million uh, to their small business sector. One-off grants of $10,000 to support effective businesses in the hardest-hit sector, but no, apparently no state did that. New South Wales, uh, they offered a $10,000 grant to provide fast relief for New South Wales small businesses battling COVID-19. They did that on the 17th of March, and then they also did one on the 3rd of April. Uh, Northern Territory gave a $50 million small business survival grant uh, to help local territory businesses. Uh, they also gave $2,000 for businesses with one uh, full-time employee or a sole trader. They gave $5,000 to businesses with two to five full-time employees. They gave $20,000 for businesses with six to 19 full-time employees and $50,000 for businesses with more than 20 full-time FTEs. Now, I stand here, the Premier said it yesterday, the Minister says it every time he says that no other state has done it. Minister, they, are, they have done it and they did it right at the beginning and they continue to support their small businesses because they know without supporting them, we are not going to be saving jobs. And that's why we have 97,000 Western Australians without work because you won't get in and support the very people who are employing them. Queensland gave a $10,000 grant. Uh, they gave that uh, under its $100 million package. South Australia gave two grants, one on the 11th of March, one on the 26th of March, two rounds of $10,000 emergency cash grants to small businesses. Tasmania gave $20 million. $15,000 small business hardship grant. They gave um, $2,500 emergency grant on top of that to businesses under severe hardship. So when the Premier and the Minister come in here saying that this $10,000 grant is a load of baloney, 
it's going to make them bankrupt, that we're going to give $10,000 to every business, please. Please, as if we're going to give it to every business. It will go to businesses who are struggling under COVID-19, like every other state has done around this country except you. And that's why our unemployment, in your words, is doing dandy. But 97,000 people without jobs, I do not think is good enough. And if I was you, I would never sit there and say it's a number to be proud of. So at a time, and I, I will wind up because I, I know we have a smaller time this section, uh, Deputy Speaker. But um, all of this has happened at a time when this government has actually received the biggest windfall of any state government. They sit there um, with $3.8 billion for 2021 from the GST revenue, thanks to uh, the Liberal federal government putting in that floor. If it wasn't for the floor, we would be short, but the floor is there. So $3.8 billion in GST revenue just for the 2020-21 budget. Iron ore royalties increased by $2.2 billion, more than you expected. So $7.4 billion windfall from iron ore royalties. And the Bell Group settlement uh, that was started under the Liberal government, $665 million. So you've had a massive windfall, massive windfall in getting your $1.2 billion surplus. So as you sit there with your $1.2 billion surplus and you sit there with this $676 million cash windfall into your bank accounts, you could not see fit. <clears throat> you could not see fit to fix the Rolling Stone Community College. You could not see fit to invest in the Clifton Hills Primary School. You could not see fit to invest in the Mary Grove Primary School or Mundajong Primary School or Jaredale Primary School or Serpentine Falls, a uh, Serpentine Primary School. You could not see fit to spend one cent in those schools. You could not see fit to reduce your mean $850 uh, cost of living increases. You could not see fit to adjust your HUGS program to help people in need. But instead, you sit on your money, beating your chest, proud of what you've done. So when I look back, Deputy Speaker, two years after the by-election, what has changed? Nothing. Sadly, for the people of Darling Range, the Premier came out and promised he would not ignore them, and that's exactly what he's done. When he walked away losing at the by-election, he walked away and he turned his back on the people of Darling Range for good. And they will remember this. So my commitment to the people of Darling Range is I will continue to be your voice. I will continue to raise your issues. I'll continue to ask the tough decisions, and I will always put you first. Really? Member for Bass. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I rise in support of uh, the worthy motion that has been um, presented by the member for Darling Range today. And I, I do that in, as a, a bit of a follow-up to a grievance I presented last Thursday in this place. Uh, our really important grievance, uh, the, the theme of the grievance was in relation to the investment in the Vass electorate. Uh, it was a, a grievance that I had proposed for the Premier and I had uh, provided some additional information uh, to inform the Premier's office that I would be highlighting uh, the issues in the VAS electorate around uh, mental health and uh, as well as uh, tourism infrastructure and, and also just more generally um, the fact that um, the, the government's um, COVID economic response as well. So I was quite disappointed and, and quite concerned uh, when I saw not only that the Premier was unable to respond to that grievance, but that um, the minister who responded to that grievance uh, gave no air, gave, gave no emphasis, gave no um, response, not a worthy response at all, to the very real issues of mental health that I had raised. Uh, and, and had um, forewarned um, the Premier's office of. Uh, because quite obviously um, these issues are, are very significant, not only across Western Australia, not only at this particular time, um, but 
but quite uh, concerningly in the electorate that I represent. Uh, the, the purpose of the, of the grievance that I, I did present was the fact that uh, uh, after four years and over four budgets, we have seen uh, the McGowan Labor government uh, ignore the electorate of, of VAS. There has effectively been a blind spot when it comes to this government's uh, emphasis and, and um, interest in the people of, of that region, something that I argued is extraordinar extraordinarily unfair. And, and I, I did refer to the fact um, that the Premier has form in, in this space, has form because uh, when he was uh, the Minister for the South West, uh, last time he was in government, uh, the, the Minister for the South West, who is now the Premier, uh, Mark McGowan, had actually talked about uh, selling off uh, part of uh, the public open space and, um, and some of the public open space along the foreshore of Bustleton uh, to um, pay for the upgrade of, of the Bustleton jetty. And uh, to that, uh, that uh, comment that I made in the grievance at the time, um, the Minister for Transport, in response to my grievance, had stated that the member for VAS talked down her electorate and claimed the Premier tried to sell off what the coastline. I do not believe that. Well, I will refer to um, the article, which is um, dated um, September 2007, and, and some um, comments from the ABC article, which states the Minister for the South West, Mark McGowan, has rejected criticism that a deal to help repair the Bustleton jetty is nothing more than a land grab. Under the deal, the government will give $6 million for the jetty's repair in return for permission to sell and develop some of the town's foreshore land. Critics of the deal say the move is a government land grab, which will destroy the amenity of the area. But Mr McGowan says development can only improve the foreshore. And I quote, it's state government land that is currently dilapidated under underutilised and, quite frankly, embarrassing for that community. Well, thankfully, at, at that time, uh, and, and with that, um, that outlook, um, uh, the, the vision of, of who was then uh, the Minister for uh, South, the South West was never um, realised and, and we saw a, a change of government. But what we do see under, under this government, under the McGowan Labor government, is that is uh, um, um, under this? Sorry, what? I'm happy to respond to your interjection. You're, you're not even within a, you know, a cooey of the subject of the motion. It's I am about frontline services. Sorry, the motion uh, is about frontline services. It is. It is about You've frontline been services. You've on about the southwest foreshore in Bustleton. Uh, okay. I'm, yeah, I, so as I am saying, uh, this is about, and, and my concerns about that grievance, which highlighted the fact that I was focused on um, mental health, I was very concerned that there was no response from um, the Minister for Transport representing the Premier on those real issues um, that, that are in my electorate. And in the space and in the area of mental health, there are many concerns regarding the growing need to support mental health issues in the region. Um, LAMP and also Pathways Southwest say they, that they are both saying that supported accommodation services and um, emergency department alternatives are some of the biggest issues in relation to um, the mental health space. And um, these issues ha have been exacerbated by the fact that one of the first decisions um, the McGowan Labor government made when coming to office was to uh, cut, uh, a cruel cut, uh, of 89,000 to the mental health homelessness program that was delivered by LAMP. This meant that a full-time position was cut to two and a half days per week, meaning that this service could no longer support um, the neighbouring Warren Blackwood region and even um, meet the current demands of supporting um, homelessness, those with a mental illness in the region. Uh, according to um, LAMP, and I, I spoke to um, Lorraine Loud 
uh, ahead of the grievance last week, and she said that they are at crisis level. Um, it is seeing uh, an example of this is, is seeing a person with mental illness supported by LAMP being in transitional housing, not for three months, but for two years. It means um, the transitional houses uh, have no permanent uh, accommodation for up to two years. And um, the Bunbury Housing Department, according to LAMP, has no vacancies and the hostel has a full wait list as well. Um, there are real issues with um, addressing juvenile mental health issues. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I again raised these issues specifically uh, with the Minister for Mental Health and the Minister for Health's office. Um, seeking support for a patient who was in Busselton's emergency department, um, seeking a, a psychiatric bed or mental health bed uh, in the region or, or in, in Perth. And he spent the whole weekend in the emergency <coughs> department in, in Busselton. Now, this is not a unique situation, uh, and, and, and that is not a unique situation with an issue such as that uh, being raised uh, with our office. And I, I must say that the Minister for uh, Mental Health and Mr. Minister for Health's office is always very helpful in relation uh, to these matters. But uh, this is no way uh, to resolve what is quite obviously an urgent health, health need. Uh, we regularly... Um, uh, I regularly contact and, and catch up with a number of psychologists in, in the region. Um, one of them is, is Dr Keith Mowat, and I, I quote from uh, a letter he pre previously provided, um, and, and that is that um, he's, he states that these, uh, in, in talking about the uh, acute mental health services in the southwest, he says these gaps remain today where hospital emergency departments such as Busselton ED and psychiatric wards such as Bunbury APU are dangerously under-resourced. This means that critically unwell patients, e.g. those who are suicidal or psychotic, are not being properly assessed or treated and or are being discharged from services when they are at risk to themselves or others. This has resulted in life threatening um, situations and fatal outcomes in the South West. Uh, obviously quite uh, concerning uh, comments. Uh, in relation to uh, the, the, the need for the in investment and the focus in, in this region, uh, it, it is, I'm not alone in, in, in calling for greater, a greater level of support in, in Busselton. Uh, my colleague, the, the member for the South West, uh, Adele Farina, has also uh, raised these concerns and, in fact, um, criticised her own uh, government in relation to the South West um, recovery plan. And, and I quote, um, the South West region extends beyond the seats of Bunbury and Collie. And while some funding has been made available to the Warren Blackwood towns of Bridgetown, Pemberton and Margaret River, the seat of Vass has been overlooked. A lack of affordable housing is a significant problem for those who've lost their jobs, with many facing homelessness. And she points to the need for economic stimulus in Busselton, um, considering the 45 per cent um, uh, percentage of, of people on, on JobKeeper as well. Um, there is quite clearly, and, and one of the challenges in relation to uh, homelessness in the city of, of Busselton is uh, what, the, what the size and what the measure and, and, um, and the need um, for an assessment of, of what is currently uh, required in, in this area. And, and that's certainly what the community has been calling for. Um, I understand, and, and um, through the committee today, um, I understand, and the feedback that I've had recently from the city of, of Busselton is that um, the Department of Communities um, had been working with the city of, of Busselton during COVID to, um, to assist in interviewing um, homeless people um, to gather data around um, what the measure of, um, of the issue is. 
um, so that they could it, it could be properly um, dealt with. Uh, and as I understand it, and unfortunately, um, the two um, representatives from the Department of Communities had since uh, resigned, and, and the information had been lost. So the, the city of, of Bustleton were hopeful that that information um, could. Um, be, be gathered, and this is something that I did raise with the Director General um, today in, in another um, in another forum. Um, but um, there certainly is a need and, and a recognised need um, for an, as, an assessment uh, across the city of, of Bustleton about what um, the what the homelessness issue actually is and, and the the um, um, and what the gaps are, so that. Uh, the government can better respond so that there can be some focus on what is quite obviously a very important issue. Uh, in relation to um, these issues as, as well, um, another concern that I had raised in, in my grievance um, uh, but, and, and another issue which does uh, fall into and, and relate to some of the mental health issues that uh, we see in, in the region uh, relates to uh, the youth crime intervention officers. Um, there is no doubt that the youth crime intervention officers um, do play a significant role and, and have been very helpful in uh, supporting youth in, in our region. And they uh, have the I guess they, they had the, the expertise to be able to engage with youth but also uh, connect with other agencies such as the Department of, of Child Protection. Um, we, I, for, for quite some time I had been pushing for um, or to see that the four youth crime intervention officers that are based in Bunbury, um, I have been advocating to see uh, two of them based in uh, to see two of them based in in Bustleton, uh, to ensure that there was a fair spread of um, this important resource in support of what is uh, one of the fastest uh, growing regional areas in the state, and certainly uh, a, a, an area which has a higher than average number of, of people under the age of, of 21. And we see that the city of Bustleton have invested in a youth um, building on, on our foreshore, and it has attracted and it has attracted a, a lot of youth to that area. And I do quote from um, one of the youth officers at the city of Bustleton, who says that um, since the centre has opened, uh, out, of, um, out of the youth attending, 80 per cent are at risk. Either they are engaged in drug or alcohol use, have domestic violence in the home, are neglected or not attending school uh, regularly. Um, there are issues around mental health issues and they are couch sur surfing. It's rare to find a youth without one of these issues. Sadly, the reduction and lack of resources and support um, means that this will ultimately lead to a larger cohort of the future generation being disengaged, uneducated and unemployable, which we know will lead to more crime. Now, the issues that I had uh, raised and, and continue to raise is the, the importance of seeing uh, at least two of those youth crime intervention officers uh, to be permanently based in Bustleton, where they could not only support that growing community but provide better support uh, to the lower South West community as well. But I, I must say I was quite concerned when I did make some inquiries about uh, the, the latest situation, and I'm quite concerned to understand that um, that there is um, now one only one um, solo officer uh, operating in the area of um, youth crime intervention um, to cover the whole of the southwest region. Uh, and I would like some clarification on that, but the, the feedback that I have um, received is that um, there, there is now we've, we've gone from four youth crime intervention officers uh, just to one. Uh, this, uh, the, the feedback is that, um, that this person is significantly, quite obviously, stretched. Um, the, the responsibility includes those uh, larger centres of, of Bunbury, Collie, 
Bustleton, Augusta and, and Manjimup. And it, it is a concern uh, that, uh, that, that has been the, the feedback that I have uh, received. I, I would like that uh, clarified, but at the very least, uh, we would like to see um, the resourcing of those, the, what, what should be for youth crime intervention officers for the region at the very least, and the dedication of two of those in the city of Bustleton uh, to support uh, the other uh, parts of, of the region and the lower south southwest region as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker, um, I will uh, seek a brief extension. Extension granted, Member. Um, so those are uh, the real issues that I um, had intended to raise and, and did raise in, in the grievance uh, last week. It was uh, pretty disappointing to have a response which was just largely focused on uh, the, the Bustle Highway upgrade, a, a project which is, is fantastic. But having flagged um, what are the real concerns um, facing the electorate of VAS specifically in, um, and the outstanding concerns in the area of, of mental health, uh, in the need for uh, uh, dedicated youth crime intervention officers to be based in, in Bustleton uh, are real concerns for not only um, the uh, agencies in, in the region, but quite obviously um, for, the, for the people as well. So I do urge the government and I look forward to uh, a response to see what level of, of support there can be uh, to, um, from the McGowan government going forward um, for what are real issues um, facing the very vulnerable in my electorate. Project or the um, performing arts cultural. Well, um, over the four years of um, the, the government, we have had, um, there are a number of priorities in the region, and I would say that in, in terms of the feedback that I've received from the community, um, sporting infrastructure is probably a, a more significant priority. Uh, when you are looking at, and the Minister for Sport is here, but uh, when you're, you're looking at, say, the Basketball Association has 209 uh, basketball teams, 1,600 players, uh, is actually turning away prospective players because they only have four competition courts. Um, that is a real priority. Uh, when you're looking at um, the um, Bustleton uh, or Sir Stuart Bovell um, Football Club, uh, that's a, they host over 1,000 football players, uh, but the women's team can't shower because there is no sewerage connection. So they have a very limited change room, and if they want to shower, they have to wait until the blokes leave, which is so inadequate. You don't see it as a priority. And there's a funding round that they never applied for. Well, there you go. Dick, so you don't support it as a priority because no, no, the council. No, 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 I don't apply for the money. Because you're aware that the community is, has been raising issues regarding the funding, the council's proposal. I'm just, they, interested, they in, have. I'm just they, interested in the local member's view on, yeah. on the pri priority of the project. Well, I think the community's view is that um, there are, are greater priorities. Um, there is some support for the Performing Arts Centre, um, but there is also some concern um, that, uh, that that would necessarily require a, additional uh, well, would require borrowing um, additional funds um, as well to, to pay for it. I mean, if you want to fund the whole lot and pay the well, operating costs, well, the community's costs. got to have it. So I'm just interested to use local member because uh, obviously you'd have, you you are uh, you seem opposed to that as a priority. Uh, well, the council's very strong on it, I understand, but yes. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure what your view is that you put to the council as local member. Yes, and I've been very upfront with, with the council about that, and, um, and overwhelmingly I have received um, community feedback that uh, their, their biggest concern, and it does fit in with mental health, uh, the fact that when you are seeing uh, a, a shortage of, of, of sporting space, when there are real pinch points there, uh, that that is um, most certainly a, a real uh, priority. So. Uh, overwhelmingly, I would say the feedback that I've received from the community is that there are um, 
other priorities in, in the electorate. There are um, memories in this, this House, isn't it? Remember when we were coming to government, one of the biggest criticisms I got for you, from you was about me going out to the community and advocating for sporting facilities in my community before the last election. And now you're doing exactly the same. Are you talking about the swimming pool? The swimming pool, everything. Well, what happened with that? Well, our swimming Collie pool. Collie pool. It, it's, it's, um, the tenders went out last week. The tenders, it's not me, the Shire. Okay. The Shire knocked her back, and now they're, they're out there doing it. They, they changed their mind after two years. I can't help with that. Uh, uh, member for Hillary's. Oh, thank you. Uh, I rise to speak on this motion, to support this motion. Um, when I came into this place in 2017 as the member for Hillary's, I said I would proudly stand up and advocate for my electorate, an electorate that unfortunately had been neglected for a long time in the delivery of frontline services. And it had been neglected by all governments for a long, long time. You know, and we can go back and, and eight years and eight years of and eight years of the uh, Gallup and Carpenter governments, and before that as well. A part, a, an electorate that represents the quiet Western Australians that get on with their lives and don't complain a lot and don't whinge too much. But what they do expect is basic, the delivery of basic government services, and in particular frontline services. And I highlighted in my maiden speech, um, I, I highlighted in my maiden speech that um, one of the particular needs that my electorate had was a, a critical need to renew our school infrastructure a lot, and a lot of our road infrastructure. And I pointed out that our school communities were great. Every school community I've ever visited is a wonderful community, totally committed to great education outcomes for their students. And that's from the staff, the teachers, the ancillary staff, the parents, the friends and everyone else involved in the school. And my community is no different. But they were working in what were and continue to be substandard buildings, and in some cases overcrowded buildings. And the need didn't magically appear in 2017 or in 2020. It had been there at the time. But you know what the public of Western Australia hate? It's when governments and opposition say it's your fault, his fault, her fault and or everyone else's fault except for the people sitting in the chair at the time. And everything that I've been talking about in relation to the schools in my community came home to roost a couple of months ago when on the same day that I was again raising the seriously dangerous condition of Hillary's primary school in this chamber, on the very same day, a ceiling collapsed in a classroom and fell on three students, one of which had to go to hospital. Now, that is beyond just substandard. That is completely unacceptable, no matter who is in government, no matter who was in government. It is completely and utterly unacceptable in any first world nation or state. And it should never happen. And it did happen, despite continual warnings. And you know what? It wasn't the first time it had happened at that school. It had happened a few years earlier as well. And the response of this government is, oh, we'll patch it up. And guess what they did? They sent people out there and they patched up the ceilings. And that's great. They patched up the ceilings. During the work, another ceiling collapsed. That happens sometimes. Thankfully, there were no students in the class at the time. But what they didn't do is patch up the roof. So in the recent rains, these newly patched up ceilings have now got roof leaks on them. How long is it going to be before those ceilings again return to the same awful condition of the previous ceilings. That just proves, I tell that story to prove that you can patch up for a seriously long period of time. And I know every member has got schools in their electorate that have been patched up. They've been fixed up again and again and again and again. But there is a point in time where patching up no longer works. 
and Hillary's primary school in particular and Springfield Primary School in Kalaroo are two of those schools. In critical disrepair, in some parts sadly dangerous, students and teachers and school staff forced to work in these sorts of conditions that are completely and utterly unacceptable. And so when the government comes out with a multi-million dollar program, it's more than $500 million, I believe, in school renewal, in rebuild of schools and significant upgrades of schools, you would expect that these two schools would be right up there on the list. And they again missed out, like they did under the previous government and the government before that, and the government before that. 50-year-old schools well past their use-by date. In the case of Hillary's primary school, which was originally called Limburna Primary School, built as a temporary school. How temporary is 50 years? And the public don't expect the Liberal government or Labor government to fix it. They expect the government of the time to stand up and be counted and deliver basic services to their community. And the government couldn't find any money for that. OK. That's well and good. But then when the critical need appeared, when the ceilings collapsed, that was a couple of weeks before the government delivered a $1.2 billion surplus. $1.2 billion surplus. No one in my community is saying, deny all the other schools the building works that they need and they deserve. Because I'm sure, and you know, I've got a little bit of experience in this area. I am sure the building's approved for either complete renewal or significant renovation and remodelling are all in need of that work. I have absolutely no doubt they are all in need of that work. But when you're sitting on $1.2 billion nest egg, perhaps these other schools also need to be looked at. And it's not good enough to say, oh, we'll patch it up and hope the media cycle goes away, which is what this government unfortunately does in too many things. But you need, you, need to deliver, you need to deliver basic services. And yeah, to put it in language you understand, I think having a classroom where the ceiling is not risk, at risk of collapsing on children is a basic human right. It's a basic human right, okay? And it is, and it shouldn't happen. And if it happens, I don't care what your point is, I'm speaking. Thank you. You're really good. The two of you are great at derailing speakers, right? I am speaking. And I'm not taking your inane interjections on such a serious subject. On a serious subject. And this will, you know, the people at Hillary's will remember this. The, the parents at Springfield Primary School, the parents at Hillary's Primary School will remember this. And there's other... Remember that the ministers in this government ridicule the member for Hillary's who raises this serious subject in this place. That is what they will remember. That is what they will remember. And they will remember it for a long, long time. Long, long time. OK, OK. Enough now. Uh, it's difficult for Hansard to take down when you're all yelling at the same time. So I think we've can just all, you know, you might want to sit down, Member Hillary. Okay. I'm on my feet. That's good. So, enough now. Move on to what you're saying. Thank, Thank you. you. So I was saying oh. it is. Member for. Please. There you are. I rest my case. Mem uh, member for Hillary's. I was on my feet. So, Minister, you waited till I sat down, and then you spoke. So. Member for Collie, I mean, Minister for uh, Sport and Rec, I call you. Member, um, and you shouldn't have spoken either. But Well, as I said, this is a basic expectation that the public ought to have and ought to have delivered to them. Classrooms and buildings and schools that are in a condition that are fit for students and teachers to go into. And I'll keep fighting and I'll keep campaigning. I really don't care who is going to be in government at whatever period in time. I think I've proven that over a long period of time. I will advocate for what's right 
irrespective of what party is in power. I'm going to advocate for my community and the basic services that they need and they deserve. There's another emerging issue in my community, and that is high schooling. Um, around half the people in my electorate uh, are zoned to the Duncraig Senior High School in the, the neighbouring electorate of the member for Kareem. So uh, children living in Padbury and Hillary's suburbs are zoned to Duncraig Senior High School. That, senior, that high school is groaning at the seams. It's actually a bit of a victim of its own success. Wonderful academic achievement, wonderful pastoral care programs, a great gate program, and other specialist sporting and, other, and musical and other programs. It's become a school of choice. People are actually buying in the area to send their kids to that school. There are homes, uh, there are boards on homes for sale in Hillary's and Padbury, that, and I'm sure they are in Duncraig and other suburbs, that say, in the Duncraig Senior High School zone. So it's a school that parents want to send their children to. But again, it's one of those really old schools that, is, that has two problems. Firstly, it's no longer really fit for purpose. The buildings are old. They, they're not built in the way that can best deliver modern 21st century learning. And there's not enough of them. There's a cavalcade of, um, of demountables, and there's more coming, eating into the oval space, eating into the, public, into the open space at the school. So if we keep putting demountables on this school, there'll be no open space for the children to recreate in. And it's in urgent need of assistance, absolutely urgent need of assistance. Another one of the schools that missed out. And you know, I, I know all governments, I've been there too, come and say, oh, not every school can, not every school can gain uh, funding all at the same time. But why is it that these schools in our communities always miss out? Why is it that the quiet people, the people who don't whinge, they don't moan, they're not loud, they don't march on the streets, they go to work, they provide for their families, they aim for a better life, they are, they are very aspirational people. But they're not complainers, they're not whingers. They just have an expectation that they should be treated fairly. No, I don't think they have. And it's the same in the, in the space of road safety in my area and congestion. I've spoken about this again for the, four, the almost four years I've been here as the member for Hillary's. I've spoken about it. Infrastructure Australia tell us that one of the top 10 most congested road corridors in Australia over the next decade is going to be the Marmion Avenue West Coast Highway Corridor that runs through the northern suburbs of Perth between the freeway and the beach. Some of it through natural growth, some of it, some of it because of the continual growth up further north, so through into Butler and Alkamos and Yanchip and Two Rocks, uh, and some of it through the um, natural process of densification that is happening through the middle suburbs of Perth. But more and more cars on the road, more and more trucks on the road. And these roads are getting more dangerous. And I've been highlighting some of those roads here since I've been here. Now, I've highlighted one of the particular intersections that everyone in my community raises with me, whether they live in that area and use that road or they just see it as they're driving past. The McQuay Road and Marmion Avenue intersection, which is just north of the Marmion and Hepburn intersection. Very busy area where three lanes are merging into two, cars are trying to turn left, cars are trying to turn right, and all it needs is a bit of a left-hand slip lane, a bit of an articulation um, of, the, uh, of the island in the centre of Marmion Avenue, a bit of better pedestrian access. Not an expensive project, but a really, really important project to improve road safety. For, for drivers, for pedestrians and for cyclists, including the many cyclists, the many children who use that as a way to get to Duncraig Senior High School from Hillary's and Padbury. And I've been crying out for funding and, the, and this government has just ignored that intersection, absolutely ignored it. And it needed the federal government. I eventually got the federal government on the case. I remember when the chair of the, the federal black spot committee was Senator Dean Smith and I had him out there and I showed it to him. And, he agreed that it needed fixing, and the federal government have provided the city of Joondalup with funding to fix that intersection. 
Very similar intersection at Cambria Street in Kalaroo with Marmion Avenue again. Very similar intersection. And again, the federal government had to stand up and provide that funding because the, the state government was missing in action. I'm glad we've got that funding. I'm glad the work's about to start. There's another one, Forest Avenue, on the other side of Marmion Avenue. Major road leading into the Padbury suburb. Forest, Avenue, uh, Forest Road is busy, very, very busy. It's got a childcare centre on one corner. The other corner is a bu busy sporting ground and recreational facility. It's used almost every day of the week. It's used by the local senior and junior football clubs, senior and junior cricket clubs. Uh, the Fleur Frame Pavilion that's attached to the sporting ground is used by many community groups, including the, uh, the Joondalup Bridge Club and many other clubs that meet on a, on a regular basis there. Um, further down, there is another park that is widely used, uh, Forest Park, and there's a little shopping centre further down on Forest Road as well. A very, very busy intersection. Again, it needs a left-hand slip lane. It needs articulation both on the side of the road and the middle of the road to, to direct cars turning left and right, to avoid collisions, to avoid dangerous, um, uh, dangerous incidents from occurring and to improve road safety. City of Joondalup have applied for black spot funding. They haven't got any uh, advice yet as to whether they'll be successful, but it's another area that needs to be fixed. As does the intersection of Walter Padbury Boulevard and Hepburn Avenue. The only real entry into the Hepburn Heights estate, Walter Padbury Boulevard, very, very busy, difficult sight lines, cars turning right blocking the cars turning left, the cars on Hepburn Avenue coming around to bend at a great rate of knots, and that's just the left-hand turns, let alone the right-hand turns. A busy and popular independent fuel station that particularly on Tuesdays and Wednesdays is very, very busy and adds to the congestion and adds to the difficulty of drivers coming in and out. Just needs a little bit of articulation. Needs main roads to listen to the submissions from the City of Joondalup and work with them to fix that intersection. I'm going to continue to advocate for this. And then there's the freeway. There's the freeway extension. A few years ago, under the previous government, the freeway was widened from two lanes to three lanes between Hepburn Avenue um, and um, Hodges Drive. And that work was done with the expectation that soon after that work would be done, the, the southbound lanes would also be widened to three lanes. And most of those lanes actually exist. All of the work has been done. All you need to do is effectively lay the bitumen. And I've been campaigning for this since I became the candidate for Hillary's. It was funded in the last state budget that the previous government introduced. It was funded in the 2017 budget to commence work in the 18-19 year. Sorry, in the, um, it was funded in the 2016 budget to commence work in the 17-18 year. When this new government came to power, the funding was removed. Under pressure, and I seek an extension. Uh, Deputy, Deputy Speaker, I seek an extension. Extension granted. Thank you. Um, when, this, uh, when this government came to power, they removed the funding. Eventually, they reinstated the funding. And they committed to doing the work, which is great, which is what the community want. And then we've been asking, when's the work going to start? To much fanfare, in a media release on the 23rd of June, the Minister for Transport indicated that the contract for this work, very important, Hodges to Hepburn um, third lane extension to the southbound lanes on the Mitchell Freeway, the Minister indicated the contract would be awarded in October 2020 and work was scheduled to commence towards the end of 2020. All well and good. People thought, great, by the end of 2020, we'll see some work on this extra lane that is much needed. And I think every Western Australian knows it's much needed because when you turn the radio on in the morning and they talk about congestion, there's never a morning where uh, Mitchell Freeway around Whitfords Avenue or Mitchell Freeway between Whitfords Avenue and Ocean Reef Drive or however it's described, that particular area, there's never a time where it, when it's not included in the 
highly congested uh, roads at peak time. And it's not just at peak time. You can go there on a Saturday afternoon, you can go there on a Sunday afternoon, and it's congested. And anyone who lives or visits the northern suburbs would know that. Then in estimates, a couple of weeks ago, the member for VAS in her uh, shadow ministerial capacity asked the Minister for Transport when that work was to commence. Remember the contract in June was meant to be awarded in October 2020. And the Minister indicated that the contract was now going to be awarded in January 2021. And under questioning, the Minister prevaricated as to when the work would commence, let alone finish. And in a question on notice that I received an answer to yesterday from the Minister for Transport, we're now told that work is to commence on this, what has now been rebadged the Smart Freeway, and I don't criticise that. I think there's, there's a lot of value in, in the, what the government is calling a Smart Freeway, the uh, Managed Freeway proposal. We're now to told this work is to commence in the second half of 2021. So the timeframes keep getting put out and out and out. Frankly, this road should have been built and finished in 2017-18, as was originally scheduled. The people in my community are expecting government to deliver this. This government has now promised it. And I just hope that these timeframes don't get pushed out any further than they already have been. Because they've been pushed back way too, way too long. Meanwhile, the congestion grows and grows and grows. And my community is saying to me, we've had enough of this. And there's other issues. That in, in her contribution, the member for Darling Range talked about the imbroglio that neighbourhood and family centres had at the commencement of this government. And, um, you know, to her credit, I, I'll give the Minister for um, Communities, the Minister for Communities, Child Protection, I know it's a, quite a long title, uh, the member for Fremantle, I'll give her her dues. She listened. The local family centre in my electorate, the Whitford's family centre that has served our community for so long and so well, was under threat of closure. By, because of the application of some illogical, centralised rules that wanted every neighbourhood centre to fit a particular cookie-cutter model not understanding that neighbourhood centres and family centres are there to respond to the needs of their communities. Not some idealised view of what a family centre should do that is set in a silver city somewhere in, a, in an office block in the centre of town, but responding to the needs of their community, which is what the Whitford Family Centre has done now for so long, for around 40 years, and continues to do so. The Minister listened, and I, I thanked her for that at the time, and I continue to say, good on you for listening, but that funding is coming to an end in the middle of next year, and already in my family centre, and I know right across the sector, there's consternation. Will they be forced to jump through hoops again? In, in particular, the Whitford's family centre has gone from strength to strength, grown, continued to grow. And I was out, out there at the opening day um, two weeks ago, at the open day two weeks ago, where we also opened the Hillary's Community Garden, and it's just so amazing to see families that have been connected to the centre from the time that their children were very, very young coming back to do other activities at the centre and to assist and to help and to see new families coming to the area, particularly people who are moving from other places, finding a home there, finding care and finding a community that's willing to accept them and look after them and give them the assistance that they need and deserve. And as I said, I give a lot of credit to the Minister for listening and reversing those centralised decisions um, made, by, made by people who perhaps didn't understand that neighbourhood centres should actually respond to the needs of their communities, their neighbourhoods, not some, as I said, some stylised, idealised, cookie-cutter view coming from, from Silver City. And I hope that this time, next year, the process for providing ongoing funding to these centres, including my centre, the Whitford's Family Centre, is not elongated, it's not difficult, and in many ways is made simple and easy for these centres to continue to do the wonderful work that they have been doing in our community. They are just some of the needs of my community. I know other members want to speak. I haven't even 
manage to get onto the my portfolio issues around policing and how policing and frontline service policing has been let down by this government over four years. But I know I need to let other members speak. All I will say is I will continue to passionately, passionately advocate for the needs of my community in the electorate of Hillary's. I'll do that whether I am in government or opposition. I will do that whether ministers of any political persuasion like it or not. Because I am elected by the people of Hillary's to stand up for them, to advocate not for some sort of extra special treatment, but to advocate for the delivery of basic frontline services and basic frontline infrastructure that every Western Australian needs and deserves. And I'll continue to do that for as long as I get the opportunity to do so. Thank you very much, Acting Speaker. I just want to uh, contribute to this motion as well, if I can, in the last uh, eight or nine minutes that are, that are left uh, in this uh, last sitting opportunity for parliamentary business. Um, I wanted to start by talking about, obviously, the vulnerable component of this motion and talk about you can't really start a speech without uh, starting with the COVID-19. And we know that uh, the first case of COVID-19 was uh, confirmed in Victoria on the 25th of January 2020, and the first confirmed death uh, of COVID-19 was uh, confirmed on the 1st of March, a 78-year-old man who died in Sir Charles Gardner Hospital here in Western Australia. And when you go back and you look at the history of how we started dealing with uh, COVID-19, uh, bearing in mind that it first came to uh, uh, Australian shores on the 25th of January 2020, you go back to the first, uh, an article uh, done by Peter Law on the 12th of March, uh, where he said, virus and election wildcard. And in that uh, article, uh, he says, the Western Australian, it took the Western Australian to reveal that people were being tested for coronavirus in the car park of the Premier's local hospital and how a lack of masks had caused confusion in GP clinics. And then he goes on to say, it now seems ridiculous that the government was saying on March the 3rd that the opening of COVID clinics and a public information campaign were still weeks away. Thankfully, that all changed with some pressure from this newspaper, AMA Pre WA President Andrew Miller and the opposition. Uh, then uh, on the uh, 18th of March, uh, again, Peter Law and Lani Scar uh, pr printed uh, time to, uh, to, board, to close our borders. And it says there, Mark McGowan is calling for Australian borders to be closed to holidays makers as he warned, shutting WA off from the eastern states to slow the COVID-19 spread would have severe implications. Mark McGowan said shutting the state to the rest of the country would impact the supply of medicines, fresh food, products, including clinics, tissues and toilet paper. And he was uh, very reluctant at that point in time to do so. Then also, uh, again, Peter de Cliff and uh, Lani Scar on the 20th of March uh, printed an article, Welcome to Fortress Australia. He said, Premier Mark McGowan has pleaded with Western Australians to not descend into Bedlam as he doubled down on his insistence WA borders must stay open to the rest of Australia. His comments came as Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced national borders will be locked down to foreigners from 6pm today and Tasmania sealed itself off from mainland, the mainland. And doctors uh, at the time insisted that WA borders should be sealed, but Mark McGowan says it was a, he, he wanted a national approach to uh, interstate travel and he didn't want to close uh, Western Australian borders. He was fighting hard not to close the borders back in early March uh, 2020. Then on the 24th of March, we know that uh, uh, South Australia and other states started to say they're closing their borders. Tasmania had closed its borders and of course that's when Mark McGowan decided that it was time for Western Australia to close its borders when every other state and territory in Australia started closing their borders. But up to that point he was resisting very strongly for that not to happen. And of course Nathan Hondras uh, wrote a beautiful article summing it all up on the 3rd of August 2020. So when this godlike figure tries to take the credit for things and mislead the people of Western Australia, the least he could do is try and be honest. Try and be honest with them. So what did Nathan Hondras say on the 20th of March? Um, 
uh, 20, sorry, 3rd of August 2020. He said, it seems like a lifetime ago, but in March when opposition leader Lisa Harvey first proposed closing WA borders, the, the idea was rubbished by Premier Mark McGowan and his ministers. We need to avoid propositions. We need to avoid propositions that are ill thought out and create panic. Mr McGowan said, if we close the borders, if we close the borders to the east, what will happen to the markets for some of our products? Order. Usually, the debate is heard in silence, and I ask that you bring the government members. I ask that you bring the point of order. Is also usually heard in silence. Point of orders are heard in silence. Exactly so right. let's let the leader of the house, uh, leader of the you know opposition leader of the house, have his point of order in silence. What's your point of order? So that we'd wish to hear from the member for Korean in silence, please. Uh, that's not a point of order, but um, please, you. members, um, you might... Uh, uh, member for Korean does have the floor, and he does... Uh, uh, and also Hansard needs to be able to hear what the member for Korean is saying. And so I'm sure he would appreciate um, if there was an interjection. So Member for Corrine, you have the Thank you. As Mark McGowan said at the time, he said, if we close the borders to the east, what will happen to the markets for some of our products? What will happen to our supply chains for important goods that we need? And of course, what did the Treasurer say at the time? Ben White. He says, Treasurer Ben White was even more strident and called the opposition hypocritical for pushing the idea. He suggested an open border and our, our, our ability to ship our goods or trade, to keep our products moving through our ports, was the one thing we have to protect to the state from an economic misery ahead. But WA Health Minister and Deputy Premier members, Roger Cook members, was perhaps members. Labor's most cautious and reasoned Leader Minister. Of the House. Member for Corrine. The member has asked to be heard in silence, so we have to... You know, there was a point of order to do that, so remember. But WA Health Minister and Deputy Premier Roger Cook was perhaps Labor's most cautious and reasoned minister, had bigger problems on his mind than just the economic cost of a border closure. Well, there's a little thing called, according to the Deputy Premier, a little thing called the Constitution, and it's really up to the national response in terms of how we can appropriately manage the public health risk in Western Australia. So the Deputy, Deputy Premier is focused on the Constitution. That issue has been resolved now. Um, uh, and also, also he went to say, we can't turn members, around. Members. We can't turn around. Excuse me, Minister. I've only just got in the chair, but I'll call you order for the first time. It might quieten you down. We can't turn around. And also, what did the Deputy Premier say? We can't turn around and say one Australian cannot meet and visit another Australian. But of course, we know, we know what the Premier said about that. Members. We talked about bringing Western Australians back home from, this, from overseas. The Premier said, we are not. Member going for Wanneroo, I don't want to hear you again. Around. Western, Western Australians coming home to Australia for overseas were referred to as rubbish by this Premier, Mark McGowan. Point of order. Ask the, mem the member to address the motion before the House. I'll read it out for you. That this House condemns the WA Labor government for its failure after four years to manage important frontline services and for its failure to protect and support the vulnerable in our community. And I don't know how the member's topic. current contribution relates to the motion before the House. Yes. So, 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 Excuse me, yeah. I'm ruling on that. You'll get back to the uh, topic which yeah. you're talking of about. Of course, Mr Speaker, that. we're talking about protecting Western Australians and about doing the right thing by them and about being honest, being honest with Western Australians. You know, like, you hate the fact this government's kept the place safe. I want it to be safe, don't you worry about it. You hate it. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, little person there. <laughs> Point of order, yeah, no. Well, look, come on, you, you, you've had your say, let him have his. I call you order for the I call you order for the third time, oh, Leader of the House. And then of course the Premier then changed his changed his mind and said the reason we're closing our borders is an economic argument on the uh, on, on the on the second of October. It became an economic argument. He didn't want Western Australians to come back to Australia, then it was the economy, then then our state is full to tourists, we can't accept anybody else according to the Minister for Tourism. It's just an absolute joke. Uh, the story uh, keeps changing. Uh, the story keeps changing every single time. Sit Premier down. Somewhere in South Australia. Oh, you're still here, <laughs> Minister for Sport. <laughs> Call you to order for the first time. Just a oh, second time. You've been naughty when I was away. 
Thank Go you. on, Member for Queen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. So it is about protecting vulnerable people, and it's about being honest with the people of Western Australia. And I, 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 members, I, I like members, members, side wants to protect people. Member, of course, why, under, why is the sit member? down? Understanding Order 61, this business, thank goodness, is adjourned to a later day of today's sitting. And after all that rubbish, we will now have a valedictory from my good friend, the member for South Perth. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The voice of reason is standing now to uh, bring some order to the chamber. <laughs> and my family and friends up there, this is what it's like all the time. <laughs> a very unruly place. I've just found out, Mr Speaker, that I'm competing with the state of origin. Third game, the decider. I've got friends texting me saying, do you mind if we don't watch your speech online? <laughs> <laughs> We've got to watch the, uh, the state of origin. Uh, it's can one we, try can each. We watch it later? It's one try each. I said, I could go for your life. Um, <laughs> Queensland have scored the first try, if no one knows. And New South Wales the second. OK, thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, if anyone had suggested to me 20 years ago that one day I'd be standing here after nearly 16 years in this place giving a valedictory speech, I would have laughed at them. Uh, my life was completely different back then. I, I was a, a journo at the West Australian. Uh, worked long hours, night shifts during the week, covering sports events on weekends, a few beers after the sports events, travelling regularly interstate and overseas to cover big sporting events. But I had no time for politics and I really wasn't interested in politics. My politics, I had been a member of the Liberal Party back in the 80s when we lived in Ascot and it was pretty tough out there in Belmont being a member of the Liberal Party. And I do remember I said once, um, I was at a branch meeting and they were looking for candidates to go to state conference. Well, I didn't even know what state conference was. And um, I said, oh, yeah, I'll go. OK. So I turned up at the um, Sheraton Hotel, and I'm a journo at the West, and we're supposed to be apolitical. I turned up at the Sheraton, and there's this uh, phalanx of, of, of reporters and cameras all waiting, all getting the, the, can the delegates as they walked in. So I had to quickly walk past and, and find another entrance to the, to the conference. But um, I was always a Liberal because when I was a kid growing up in Hammy Hill, I do remember Bob Menzies, and I was always pretty inquisitive, but I was taken by his oratory style. And we only had a radio in the lounge room down in Hammy Hill. I mean, we didn't have much money, but um, we would listen to him. He'd come over and, and speak at the Perth Town Hall. And sometimes he would speak at um, the, the GPO uh, during the day and the night time they'd speak at the Perth Town Hall. And we'd sit around and listen to him on the radio. So I was sort of impressed with him. My dad was a Labor man, but I'm probably one of the few Liberals to come out of Hammy Hill. Uh, but I've got to say, uh, you know, after the career I had, um, being a Member of Parliament is the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And I did a lot of rewarding things as a journo. I, I, I promoted good ideas and, and covered big events and tried to make the sports that I was covering better for the competitors and the, and the fans. But the job we all do uh, as members of parliament is, is so fulfilling and rewarding when you can help people in your electorate. And even in South Perth, people think it's a wealthy electorate. There are a lot of people in South Perth who live in homes, West Homes, and, and battle and, and struggle and you, you help them whenever you can. And, and that's rewarding for me. So how did I become, how did I come to become the member for South Perth? Now I haven't spoken about this much, but on, one day in 2004, I got a, a phone call from a, a person who will remain anonymous, who said, would you be interested in running for South Perth for the Liberal Party? I said, why do you ask? He said um, they're having big problems with their pre-selection. It had become very untidy. The state director had to call in the police at the, at the pre-selection because, <laughs> because uh, I mean, bad behaviour doesn't just happen in Labor. I mean, it, it, happens, it happens over this side too. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and people on the pre-selection panel were being uh, uh, coerced about how they're going to vote and threatened and all that. So. They arranged for me 
to have a meeting with a couple of the Liberal heavyweights. Um, one I knew, one I didn't, at a cafe at Scarborough Beach on a Sunday morning. My wife came with me and they said, listen, we know you've, you're, you're a member of the party. Um, we're looking for someone who lives in South Perth. We're having problems with the pre-selection. And um, would you be interested if we, if the State Council opened up the pre-selection again, would you put your name forward? So I discussed it with Karen. Karen had actually, she, she knows much more about politics than I do. She had worked for Wilson Tucky, for Iron Bar, and, um, and she encouraged me to give it a go. Uh, we'd not long been back in Perth after I did five years in Melbourne, best five years of a journalistic life. I was sports correspondent for the West Australian. But incidentally, this wasn't the first time that I'd been approached to throw my hat in the ring. Uh, back in the 1990s, um, Wilson Tucky and a fellow called Andrew Peacock, who I'm sure you've all heard of, um, spoke to me about standing for the federal seat of Swan, which was held by Kim Beasley. But the, the margin was diminishing for Kim, and he eventually went to another seat. And they said, well, you know, you should run against, uh, you should run for Swan. Because I'd lived in Belmont for 20 years. Uh, I had a reasonable profile in the media. Uh, I was well known in the racing industry. They thought I'd be a good, good candidate. But at the same time, uh, my career at the West was, was moving forward at a rate. Uh, I'd been moved over to cover AFL. I'd originally been a, a racing rider, and they put me onto footy. They obviously identified I knew something about the great game. Uh, and um, I'd covered the Eagles two premierships, 92 and 94. And uh, my journalistic career was going pretty well, so I, I declined. But um, when the opportunity for South Perth came up, the situation was different. I'd been living in Como for about 12 years. I'd returned from uh, Melbourne, where I was basically my own boss, went back to the Old West, where people that I used to be senior to were now calling the shots. Um, my mail was getting sent back to Melbourne because they didn't even know I'd come back. Um, and I thought, well, this maybe isn't the place I want to be. So um, I took it up. My colleagues at the West couldn't believe it that I was going into politics. What they did say, though, when I did leave, they said, well, you're going into an early retirement. Nothing could be further from the truth, because politics is a busy job and it's a tough job. Uh, but I was going for a job uh, for, for, from a job where I'd been sports editor, I'd covered two Olympic Games, uh, 14 AFL Grand Finals. I'd voted on the Norm Smith Medal in 1993, won by Michael Long. I'd covered more than a dozen Melbourne Cups, five Australian Tennis Opens, a couple of Grand Prix in Melbourne, and numerous international golf tournaments. Now, why would you give up that life to go into politics? I sometimes, <laughs> I sometimes ask myself. Um, but my experience in politics also, as I said, had been almost non-existent. The only university that I'd attended was the University of Hard Knocks. I went to John Curt until I was 16, got a job at the West as a copy boy. I was interviewed for the job by the late Tom Burke, uh, who had lost his job in, the, uh, in federal politics, and the West Australian had given him a job in what was then called the staff office. Now, I reckon now Tom would have seen this young bloke from Hamby Hill and said, he's caught two buses to get up here for this interview. Why not give him a job? So I got a job as a copy boy, went to night school and the next minute got leaving English in another subject and um, I got a cadetship in journalism. So that was the start of it. Um, I, won the, I won the pre-selection from a very big field that included uh, a couple of former members of parliament who, who saw South Perth as a good seat. And um, my campaign committee included Karen, my wife, my good friend Phil Bruce, who's here this evening, uh, a work colleague, Barry Farmer, used to be chief racing rider at the West, good Liberal. Advertising guru, Keith Ellis, and our treasurer was Liberal Party stalwart, Ted Gray. It was decided that our first fundraiser, uh, this was, this was um, recommended by Keith Ellis, who was an advertising guy. He said, why don't you have, have a fundraiser for a legend of South Perth in sport? So we'll have this big fundraiser and, and we'll, part proceeds will go to a sporting organisation, a junior sporting club in South Perth. 
So we had the first one, and it was so popular that we've had one every year since. And, you know, we've inducted people like Lynn McClements, a gold medal medalist at the Olympics. She grew up in Manning. Uh, all these champion footballers grew up in Manning. Um, three hockey players. Andrew Vlahoff grew up in South Perth, went to four Olympics, went to um, Kensington Primary School. Now, all these people... And, you know, it, it was just a good local thing to do. And, and I, I, I'm really pleased. And I want to thank uh, Phil Bruce, Steve Loxley, and Alan Chubby Styles is here, the great Alan Chubby Styles, who won a Simpson medal playing for Western Australia. Good friend of mine. He still hasn't forgiven me because in my, my first ever campaign, I vowed to the people of South Perth that I would deliver underground power to the whole area. Now, he, Chubby lives in part of Kensington that still hasn't got it. <laughs> and he, so he, he reckons uh, he was going to run against me. There was a... <laughs> There was another time when uh, Jeff Gallup retired. I got on well with Jeff Gallup. He was adjoining seat, Vic Park. And um, we were looking for a candidate. And you know what happens in politics? You always say, oh, we can win this seat. I said, can we? Yeah, well, we can win it. <laughs> and so I said, I said to Chubby Stiles, I said, Chubby, I've got something for you. He said, what's that? I said, you played for Perth, you're at Lathlane Park. Um, everyone knows you. you. You're in the movie industry. Why don't you put your hand up and run for Vic Park. He said, I've got a better idea. Why don't I run for South Perth and you run for Vic Park? <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, on the 26th of February 2005, I was elected to Parliament, the 37th Parliament, as only the fourth ever member for South Perth. Now, you might wonder about that, but South Perth wasn't a, didn't become a district till 1950. Before that, South Perth was in the city of Canning, because back before 1950, it was all bushland out through Manning and all those places. But in 1950, it became uh, the seat of South Perth, and I'm the fourth ever member and the second longest serving. My first election, uh, I, I got through, but, but you know, I was fairly new to the area. I got a 52.87% primary vote. Um, then in 2013 was a different year. Um, I increased that primary vote to 66.97%, and that was the highest of any Liberal that year. And I remember mentioning it in a speech, and the, the then Premier was sitting down the front that I'd, I got the highest of any, of any um, primary vote of any Liberal at the election. He said, not a good, good career move, reminding people that you got a better vote than me. <laughs> but I did. Uh, other members of the class of 2005 on this side of the chamber were Troy Buswell, very well known, John Castrilli, Murray Cowper, Dr Graham Jacobs, Tony Simpson, Gary Snook, Trevor Sprigg and Dr Steve Thomas. Sadly, I'm the only one remaining, although Dr Thomas is now, he's come back and he's in the upper house. I especially say sadly because in January 2008 I lost my very good friend and roommate here, Trevor Sprigg to a heart attack. It was one, one of the saddest days of my life when I got a phone call from the, someone in the media saying Trevor had died in Fremantle Hospital. Um, Trevor and I were like minds. We both loved East Fremantle Footy Club. Uh, he'd been a premiership player at that club and both of us didn't mind a bet on the horses. An old lady in South Perth said to me one day after I was elected, Mr McGrath, they tell me you're a punter. And I said, I'll tell you what, Mary, it's not illegal. Understand, it's not illegal. And it's funny how people think, you know, because you're a punter, well, you know, it's, I mean, it is a legal, legal thing. Um, <laughs> so I'm coming into Parliament. Uh, Trevor's, Trevor's wife, Lynn, asked me to deliver a eulogy at the funeral at East Fremantle Oval. I, I guess some of your members would have been there. Um, and after the, after the eulogy, the East Fremantle Football Club came to me and said, Trevor was a co-patron. We'd like you to take over with him. And, and I'm, I'm still now a co-patron of the Mighty Sharks. And we don't like South Street Metal that much, uh, Minister for Transport. Um, <laughs> so what did I do when I came into this place? I said, well, um, I made a commitment that I would do the best for the people of South Perth, but also because of my journalistic background, I, I, I thought, you know, I want to try and make the state a better place. I remember as a journo, I went to Melbourne 
And after footy matches at the MCG, all these kids had run out on the ground and they'd all be kicking the footy with their dads and all that. In Perth, at, at Subiaco Oval, they couldn't, wouldn't let them on the ground. So I wrote this column, I said, what a disgrace, you've got the MCG, one of the great stadiums of the world where kids can run on, and in Perth our kids can't. That was a no-brainer. It wasn't long before the Football Commission said, yeah, the kids can go on the ground. So I've always been inclined to want to make, make the world a better place if I can, because that's what a lot of journalists do. You know, we, we look at things and we write columns and, and think pieces. And... So um, I really believe that in my own small way, uh, without having any decision-making responsibility in government, I, I believe I've made a, dis a difference in, in some areas. So I'm, I might talk about a couple of them. My first portfolio was uh, seniors, racing, gaming and liquor licensing. And some of my uh, colleagues very unkindly suggested that was a natural fit for me. I hope it wasn't, <laughs> I hope it wasn't the seniors. I, I prefer it to be the racing and gaming. And my first, first ever shadow, I was shadowing the man who's now Premier, the member for Rockingham. Now, I thought the Premier for Rockingham might be an easy target, you know, like he, he knew, he, I didn't know much about him back then and he probably didn't know much about me. I certainly didn't know that he was going to be Premier one day, uh, but I, I thought he didn't know much about racing. <laughs> and so I used to try and trick him with questions, you know, across the chamber. And, um, but I didn't have that much luck with that. But um, I do take my hat off, and I've always believed this, the, the member for Rockingham was responsible for my first big challenge in this place when he brought in legislation to introduce small bars and allow liquor stores to trade on Sundays. Now, uh, he's the first person that I knew of, maybe Herb Graham was the previous one when he brought in taverns in the 80s, to take on the powerful AHA, a very, very, very powerful group. So I agreed with the legislation, but I had a problem. My party members had been lobbied very heavily by the AHA, who said small bars are going to send all pubs broke. Uh, they also wanted to hold on to the monopoly over Sunday trading uh, for takeaway liquor. So it was a difficult time for me because I hadn't been experienced taking legislation to our party room. And when you walk in, and you don't know that half a dozen members are waiting to blindside you or ambush you, and that happens. And, and, and what, the thing about this place is you learn on the, on the go. You, you've got to make mistakes, and, and I, I could be a lot better member if, if I could turn the clock back 16 years, but it doesn't happen. There's no rule book, or you don't get tuition along the way, because all your fellow members are, um, they're all busy doing their own thing. You know, they, so um, it was a difficult time, but the deadlock was finally broken when Paul Omaday, our leader back then, made a captain's call to support the government's legislation. And I've got to say, uh, I became a bit unpopular with the AHA. I noticed the Premier now is boy number one with them. I don't know, <laughs> I, I don't know how you patch that one up with Bradley Woods, but, um, and I haven't seen too many, clubs, uh, too many pubs close. The other thing I've always wanted to do was uh, greater use of the Swan River. Um, you know, I'd seen ferries in Brisbane and uh, tourist ferries and, and commuter ferries and uh, I've always pushing for that. And, and I also came out with a suggestion that um, we should lift the causeway. Because the causeway, I mean, you'd hardly walk under it, it's that low, and you've got to have those little flat bottom boats and, and low boats to get up the river. I thought, why don't we lift it, uh, you know, put a, and get bigger boats up into the upper reaches of the river? When I, I raised it and it, was, it made the papers, a, a bloke sent me a text saying, well, why don't you just lower the water? <laughs> <laughs> but under the Barnett government, I did get to chair, and that was through uh, the, the member for Burt, who was then the um, transport minister. Uh, I chaired a working group to look at creating more ferries. And we came up with, a, with that suggestion to uh, raise the causeway, but we also came up with a suggestion. I still believe it's a no-brainer. Run a fast ferry from the Raffles Hotel jetty into Elizabeth Quay. With all those towers now in Applecross, people would walk down, jump on a fast ferry, ra rather than walk over the bridge and jump on a train that might be half full. So that's one for the Minister for uh, Transport, provided she doesn't become uh, Treasurer. And if you do become Treasurer, 
you've got to hand over to whoever becomes Minister for Transport and tell them South Perth train station. OK? <laughs> keep, keep it high on the list. I don't want to really lose you at this time, but can't stop progress. So I had another idea. One of my colleagues said to me, one of the, the, the federal colleagues who will remain nameless, he said, I can't get in the paper. I said, well, I get, a, I get a good run in the Southern Gazette and in the West. He said, you come up with all these wacky ideas. <laughs> I said, well, maybe you should come up with some wacky ideas. But, <laughs> but I, uh, there, was, there was the tourism industry was going through a difficult time and they wanted the government of the day to, uh, I don't know which government it was, it might have been uh, the Carpenter government or ours, um, they wanted uh, to, to get a holiday at home campaign going. And I said, well, you've got all this road reserve on freeways and highways. It's owned by the government. What about putting up some billboards? You know, holiday in Broome or holiday in Bustleton. And it didn't go that, down that well with members of the community who thought it would be a distraction. But I notice there are billboards now down on the Forest Highway, out at the Perth airport. There's one as you drive up the freeway here above the Channel 9 building. I don't get distracted by it. And if you go to Melbourne, going out to Tullamarine, on the Tullamarine Freeway, there's a row of them. And it's government land. Easy. Doesn't cost anything, Premier. Uh, in 2009, I was appointed uh, chair of a joint standing committee to review the Racing and Wagering Act. Um, the member for Darling Range and also the speaker were on that committee. It was a very, very high-powered committee. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> No, Mick Murray wasn't on it. He wanted to be on, but he wasn't allowed to. <laughs> we banned him. They all want to get on committees with me. I don't know why. But I do remember the member for, the member for Darling Range uh, had never been inside a, a betting. She didn't know anything about betting. So the former member for Kalgoorlie, John Bolton, myself, gave her a little bit of tuition. <laughs> we'd, we'd had lunch at this hotel in Kalgoorlie and we took her into the betting place and told her all about it. Um, but the committee found that the racing industry was in need of infrastructure. They needed a lot of money because a lot of the, the infrastructure in the industry uh, was tired and old and had to be replaced. And so we made a, a recommendation that the, the government should reduce the tax on wagering by a sufficient amount to set up an infrastructure fund. Now, you know what it's like trying to get Treasury to... to give back a bit of a tax that they've been getting for a long time, and it, it didn't happen. Now, I wasn't happy with that, so I came out and I gave a speech here and said, the only answer is to sell the tab. And uh, I said, because if you sell the tab, whoever who's the successful bidder, they always put, give you money up front. And, and so that money, part of that money could be used, which the government was planning, uh, to set up an infrastructure fund. Uh, well, I had so much opposition. Um, the Nats opposed it. The Labor Party opposed it. Some of my colleagues opposed it. They were crossing the floor. And my friends in racing were saying to me, you've, you've sold out the industry that you love. You know, what are you doing? The, the TAB is the goose that lays the golden egg. But I knew that the, the climate was, was going to be bad because there was more competition coming from the big, the big boys from overseas. So... Um, uh, we, we stuck firm, uh, we tried to get it done and we ran out of time, 2017 election came, I think we lost that one, um, I think we did. You did. And, um, but then, surprise, surprise, the, um, the new government, the McGowan government, made an announcement that we're now going to sell the tab. And I, I, I felt so vindicated, because at last I've got one right. And I could have politicised it. I did, say, um, I did say to the media, this is the biggest uh, backflip in the history of the Parliament of West Australia. It was, it was probably close, but, you know. And, uh, but as I've said in this, time bef in, in this chamber before, and the Attorney-General's mentioned it a few times, in politics, nothing wrong with doing a backflip, provided you land on your feet. You don't want to stumble, but if you make a good landing... Backflips are fine. And I, I didn't make it political. In fact, I supported the government because I knew the industry, it was best for the industry. And I think I'm one of the few opposition members that got mentioned in the official press release. Thank, thank the member for South Perth for his support. 
Yeah. Uh, but I, I didn't, didn't do it for the government. I did it for the racing industry because I felt it was right. My only worry, Treasurer, is that times have changed. I don't know what the tab's going to be worth when we finish COVID-19. If, we it... it if we'd sold it when we first suggested it, it might have got seven or eight hundred million. But I can only hold you guys account for that to account. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my most, one of my most difficult decisions was when uh, my government decided to um, merge, amalgamate the two councils, South Perth and Vic Park. It was a very difficult time for me. Um, my community didn't want it. Uh, the people from Vic Park didn't want it uh, because they were going to lose Burswood and Crown, and that was a lot of rates, about four million a year. Um, I ended up. Uh, I went on. Uh, went on the 7:30 report. It probably was another uh, not very good career move, and I, I said that the people of South Perth have been led up the garden path by my government, and. I could imagine uh, the former Premier sitting at home in Cottesloe uh, with no air conditioning, um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, watching the 7.30 report. And um, to his credit, Colin said, well, I don't mind you talking about your electorate, John, that's fine, but uh, I didn't like the language, some of the language you used in the interview. Um, and I also went to Vic Park. Um, there was a a rally, and, and I remember the, the now treasurer was there, remember, and he had a T-shirt on saying, Save Burswood, or Battle the Battle for Burswood. And uh, Kate Douse, from the, the president of the Upper House, she was there too, and so I was the only lived there, and the media interviewed us afterwards, and so it's on Sunday night TV. There's me with two Labor members, so I'm always getting into trouble about things like that. <laughs> but I did have... I think my, my finest achievement in this place was the stadium. Um, I, uh, I gave a speech one day, I was sitting up there, I was whipped, and the Premier was down the front, and, and I said that um, the stadium should go to Burswood. And my reason that it should go to Burswood, it was a greenfield site, but I had a bit more information. I had, I had a copy of the um, Stevenson report from 1955, who. One of my workers who's here today, Fred Kavanagh, who would, who would have a copy of the Stevens report at home? Who? Only a bloke like Fred Kavanagh. He keeps all those things. And he brought it into me. And the Stevenson report in 1955 said um, that one day there will be need for a stadium to hold 80 to 100,000 people in Perth. And the best location is the Burswood Island, which was infield and all that. And he said it, they said it, it, it should be the site of a sporting... Uh, zone for all sorts of sports. So the Premier liked it and he said, well, why don't we, we push that and the rest is history and the stadium is an amazing, yeah. amazing um, project that, that everyone agrees is really outstanding. So in closing, I want to thank all the people that have worked for me, all, all the people, uh, I want to thank my wife, um, Tower of Strength, when I get home at night, she says, where were you today? I didn't see you in the chamber. I said, <laughs> I said, and I'd say, uh, why don't you get a life? <laughs> uh, but she's always the font of knowledge and, and she gives me good advice about politics, but I don't always listen. Um, my, my, my children, David and Erin, uh, great supporters of mine. Uh, my long-serving uh, staff members, Dawn Stratton, who's here, and Fred Kavanagh. Dawn was my electorate officer for uh, 12 years. Um, all my, my current staff members, Pierre Sanders and Frank Wright, all my staff who I've had over the years, and, and I've had some outstanding staff. I don't know why, but I think the member for South Perth's office is a, is a breeding ground for outstanding people. I've had four, uh, four university students who did law all go on to, to outstanding careers, in, uh, including president of the Law Society and and one's in the, the, the bar in New York. And these people have all come out of my office in South Perth. So um, maybe it's not a bad training ground. Yeah. So I want to I thank all those people. I want to thank the community of South Perth. You know, South Perth people are good people. They, they don't complain much. South Perth people just get on and, and get things done themselves. You know, they don't come and want, want you to do everything for them. And, but I've had, I've had so much support from those people and it's been a real honour uh, to serve them for 16 years. 
I don't know where I'm going after this. It'll be a new chapter in my life. I've had two chapters now, one in journalism, one as an MP. Who knows what the third chapter will be? Uh, and I wish, you know, I wish you all the best in, in all your endeavours in the future and also my colleagues at the, the next election. Uh, good luck. Thank you. Yes, can we change over the, uh, the groups now, please? Well done, members for South Perth. Members, I wish to advise members I've given permission for the member for Kimberley to deliver parts of her valedictory speech in her first language, Aborig Aboriginal Gidja. After the member makes her speech in Gidja, she will repeat that part of the speech in English so it can be reported by Hansard. I've also given permission for one of her guests to play the didgeridoo in the public gallery while she speaks in her first language. We'll just wait. To see. Yeah, your friend's coming in, Josie. Member for Kimberley. Thank you. First of all, in my valedictory speech, I'd like to thank my mother, Winyana, for instilling in me the knowledge and wisdom of her culture based on respect. I never knew who my father was, so I was raised by a single mum. In my inaugural speech, when I first came to Parliament in 2013, I said that I stood here proudly elected, proudly black and proudly woman. That was almost eight years ago. And despite the many changes that have occurred throughout my journey in politics, I can still stand here today and say I stand here proudly elected, proudly black and pr proudly woman. On that day in 2013, I brought Gija, which is my first language, and Creole to Parliament for the first time. There have been so many achievements throughout my terms that I'm very proud to have been a part of. No matter how big or small the achievements or amount involved, each is just as important as the other. Achievements are measured in ways other than money. There may have been things that I said and caused that I pushed that people didn't want to hear or deal with, and I make no apology for that. If my achievements saved lives and made a difference to people's lives, then I stand proud. I would like to say it is with sadness that I speak today. For me here on this old hill, where this beautiful building known as the Parliament sits on. When I first came here in 2013, I could feel the spirits of people who have lived and existed in and around this area for thousands of years. I'd like now to speak in Gija. Kolongan, Yurunga, Palamanji, Rud Yuran, Gili, Jarak Jarak Gili, Nganonga, Ngayan, Jarak Nganan, Lirgan Gerambe, Waringaram, Kadiangambe, and Manbi, Manbi, Kapi Jarambe, Jagangarambe. I say, Turkbuna. Ranga Lirgan. In English, I said, now today we, us as members of parliament, sitting, we are together, all. I speak, and we shall be together here this, in this place. Myself, I talk, and I do find myself here to try and educate and teach so that people can know and understand, all of us together. Gariambi, which is the white people, and Manambari, that's the non-Aboriginal, oh, sorry, the Aboriginal people. Kabijarambi, whoever else. 
Yagangaram, including others. And Duk, to look and see, and Ranga, to listen, and Lirgan, to teach and educate. Bipartisan agreement for First Nations West Australians to be recognised as the first West Australians in our state's constitution. And I'm proud that I led the change to ensure the Aboriginal flag flies proudly here at Parliament and that our chamber opens proceedings each day with an acknowledgement of country. In 2016, following the tragic deaths of 13 young Aboriginal people in the Kimberley, I instigated a parliamentary inquiry into Aboriginal youth suicide, which resulted in learnings from the message stick. The report of the inquiry into Aboriginal youth suicide in remote areas. This report led to the state government's commitment to Aboriginal youth wellbeing, a new framework to improve the outlook and resilience of young Aboriginal West Australians in the Kimberley and across WA. What also I happened to do is changes to domestic violence and helped with the legislation. Um, $19.3 million to upgrade Broom Senior High School, some of the achievements, $9.2 million to establish a comprehensive alcohol and other drug youth centre in the Kimberley. $9.7 million to funding to upgrade boating facilities at Entrance Point and Town Beach. So they were some of the achievements and significant funding to address crime and youth justice issues in the Kimberley, including $900,000 to deliver the Kimberley Juvenile Justice Strategy to find alternatives to detention and services aimed at diversion. $43.6 million towards the improvement of the Gibb River Road and $1 million for the much needed Kimberley Mobile Dialysis Unit. Two million for a new police and citizen centre in Kananara, uh, and two remote pools, which I'm very proud of, because one is in Balgo, where there's no river, and those kids have to wait until the next rain comes along so that they can have a bit of, you know, wetness. And the other one was in Columbia, so that was, I think, the highlight of, of uh, my achievements. 2020 was a very challenging year with the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, not only for Western Australia but worldwide. Remote Aboriginal communities and the Kimberley were the first places to be isolated from the rest of the state. Being a member of the highest risk sector, risk, sorry, risk sector of the community, I was unable to attend parliament or travel outside of Halls Creek, despite adverse comments from local media. And I'm extremely proud of what was achieved by not only myself, but my office in dealing with a very concerned large and remote electorate many distressed constituents, unable to work and separated from loved ones, and an extremely heavy workload in extremely difficult uh, circumstances. I would like to thank the Premier's office for their regular updates, assistance and information during this time. Ministers and backbenchers, the Speaker of the House, Watson, who may be related to a few of my grandkids who've <laughs> <laughs> got the same surname. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's just incredible what you find. <laughs> there are many, many people I would like to acknowledge and thank for their incredible support, advice and friendship throughout my time in Parliament. Some of these are my new friends in Parliament over the last four years in government. A big thank you to Chris Bailey for doing a portrait of me that hangs in the, in the Parliament. Uh, in government, I would like to thank my secretary and staff who are there today, who's there today and who has made things a lot uh, easier when times was in turmoil. And so thankful for your support and the other staff member who working tirelessly, even though she was having another new member added to her family, um, Kamai, who now gave birth on the 3rd of November to a, a boy who I was given the privilege of giving an Aboriginal name from my language, and I named him Gurgal, which translates to firefly, because of the time his mum spent, even after hours, still doing work for me in my office. Thank you both. Congratulations, Kevin, the dad, proud father, for my appreciation in being able to uh, to name his child. My appreciation to my granddaughter, Siobhan, Will and Mia, for being here today. Uh, sorry I couldn't have my family here today. My husband, Mario, <laughs> could not be here. He's a, 
he's a scared person. He wouldn't fly on the plane. <laughs> but he's, in, he's here in spirit. <laughs> Robin Clark, Claire and Mima, and most employees in this place. I thank security for making sure I got home safely after late sittings. I'd also like to thank chefs who helped by making kangaroo available on the menu for me. <laughs> to Anthony and Leah for giving me hot chocolate during the cold winter times. And also a thank you to my husband for being here, being there for me, children and grandchildren. The friends I have worked with in here, no matter which party you belong to, so each and every one of you, and um, the committees I've worked with have been wonderful. I will leave Parliament knowing I made a difference, especially my passion on suicide. I will now speak in Gija some of the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Nabuin, Lana Yuro, Dirk Bana, Yurunga, Kolangan, Nananga Road, Yaran Parliament. Arak Bana, Lurgan, and Yurunga, Mengog Buru, Wanyanyagambe, Wellinga Jari, Pinara Kirambe. What I've said there in Gija is uh, reciting part of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, up above in heaven. Look down, see us all here in this house. Today we are sitting here, we are in parliament. Make do to educate, teach and learn all of us together. Make good for them and all our children as they come before us and to make them understand. That's the prayer to God. So Waringa, Enough of that. Amen. Thank you, Josie. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, everyone. Can we uh, have the change over? Is there any people? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It may have taken me a couple of attempts, but yes, I am definitely leaving the WA Parliament, Mr. Speaker. And to even say that is for me a little surreal, as I am voluntarily leaving a job that I genuinely love. I'll never again have a job as diverse, stimulating, or exciting as being a member of Parliament and Minister. But I also know that while I will miss everything, I don't think I will regret my decision. To adopt the saying from a different scenario, Mr. Speaker, it's not you, it's me. I want to begin by acknowledging the sheer privilege it has been to be a member of this place. Colleagues, all of us are so fortunate to be given this rare privilege by our parties and our electorates to be afforded the responsibility to represent them in our state parliament. So I'll start by thanking the people of my community of Victoria Park. They have been good enough to, on four occasions, send me to represent them here the sixth member for Victoria Park. We all love our communities, and in an inner city area like mine that has undergone incredible change over the last 20 years, it has been wonderful to be a key part of this. I thank the community in which I have lived for over 30 years for giving me this privilege. To the organisation that brought me to the dance and gave me the opportunity to be their standard bearer in Victoria Park, WA Labor, thank you. 
I came to Labor not from the union movement but from a family of Labor people. My mother from the coal mining region of New South Wales who watched her mother mutter curses whenever the TV screen was filled with the face of either John Howard or Kerry Packer and my late father, a member of the Stolen Generation and lifelong Aboriginal activist. Of interest, my mother has over the years drifted further to the left, as my father drifted further to the right. <laughs> this ensured I sat firmly in the centre of Australian politics. To my local Victoria Park WA Labor branch, thank you for your continuous support. The members of our party are just wonderful. They donate their time, their money and effort to ensure that Labor governments are formed. They fundraise, letterbox, door knock and advise, and I'll never be able to return their favour. To the unions, it is fair to say that I have had over the years a somewhat fractious relationship with some of our union movement, but I hope that they have never doubted my belief in their importance. They always keep us focused on working Western Australians. And I want to say the unions have always stood firm and proud at every key point since the 1940s with the Aboriginal rights movement. And while I may have irritated some in my role as Treasurer, we have always, I like to think, found common ground in my role as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. To my electorate staff, as every MP knows, we are only as good and, as, and effective as our electorate officers, particularly when you enter the ministry and time in the electorate is at a premium. The late Rose Sheridan, who worked for Jeff Gallup before me and who, to be honest, taught me how to be an effective local representative, your memory is not lost on us. To Alison Cook, I employed Alison, uh, a young girl, when I was elected and I have watched her grow into the confident leader she now is. I thank you. Adelaide Kitson, who walked in off the street from Meriden, pretty much, to eventually join me in my ministerial office. Uh, like Alison, you have become a confident leader and I suspect your journey in politics uh, has, still has some way to travel. And to Sarah McBride, who gets my incessant texts and demands at all hours of the night, I thank you for your patience and your commitment. Your journey also continues. In respect of my ministerial office, it is always dangerous to start listing individual people. So can I say how wonderful it is, it is to be a minister in WA and to be served by outstanding committed public servants? While I may now name some, I do not want to diminish the work of so many people who have, who have ensured I haven't completely embarrassed myself during my time as a minister. The Under-Treasurer Michael Barnes and the Executive of the Treasury and the public servants at Treasury. Your advice and commitment to the public good serves our state so well. I am incredibly proud of the work we have done together and I thank you for your extraordinary efforts, in particular over the past 12 months. If I can also acknowledge Jody Cant in Finance, Kayleen Goolich at the Treasury Corporation and Kate Alderton in Aboriginal Affairs, you have all been quite outstanding and I thank you for your huge efforts on behalf of the state. My Chief of Staff, Roger Martin. Uh, it's a funny old relationship, uh, the one between a Minister and a Chief of Staff. Sometimes adviser, sometimes wife, sometimes friend and the person sent forward to tell the minister when his great idea is in fact an expensive dud. You have been fantastic. It's been quite a ride and I thank you for leaving a small start-up to join my office immediately before it became a successful large start-up where everyone made significant amounts of money. Thank you. <laughs> To Robin Taylor, or Riordan, when I first uh, joined, the, uh, became a minister, my executive officer and the executive officer to many ministers before me, and I suspect a few to come, I thank you for your loyalty and professional brilliance. The public sector has many rules and regulations. Many of them are not obvious nor make sense. Robin, you ensured I didn't walk an obvious path into scandal, embarrassment and resignation. My advisers, there have been many, and I thank you all so much. Uh, you all work so hard to make uh, me a better minister and to ensure the success of the government. Your work and efforts are never taken for granted and will always be remembered, I thank you. The parliamentary staff, our arcane rules are known only by you. I thank you for your support and your advice. Uh, there is one group I do want to thank in particular who were invaluable, particularly in my opposition years, and continue to provide support. 
and that is the parliamentary librarians, Mr Speaker. You are the soothsayers who seem to know the knowledge I seek before I ask the question. Uh, my mother is a librarian. I thank you for not following her example in correcting my grammar in my email requests. <laughs> to the Cabinet, I think we have been a brilliant Cabinet. United, disciplined and clear-eyed in our task, it has been an honour working with you all. Government is wonderful. It really is. <laughs> but it is opposition, where you earn your stripes in policy development and forge your relationships. You have all been just fantastic. And if I can uh, mention a couple in particular, the Attorney General. <laughs> you woke him up. <laughs> he is now. <laughs> we shared an office for eight and a half years. <laughs> and despite that, Mr Speaker, we became firm friends. You have been a standout attorney and a loyal, although sometimes eccentric, friend. I thank you. To the Minister for Transport. A firm friendship formed in opposition and, dare I say, in the strategic brilliance of the debt monster. <laughs> it, has been a, it has been a pleasure to watch you in government roll out our signature policy in Metronet. And despite the inevitable tensions, Mr Speaker, between a Treasurer and a big spending minister, <laughs> you have been a wonderful friend, adviser and colleague. Uh, to the Premier, it has been an honour, it really has, serving in your government. Uh, your journey from Leader of the Opposition to a Premier of determination, fairness and humour has been a pleasure to watch and to be a part of. I thank you for your support and the chance to serve in your government. And to my family, uh, I am in a house of females. The only other male is my galah, and we often feel more bonded than you might realise. <laughs> to my girls, Matilda and Georgina, uh, you have only ever known me as a Member of Parliament and we can only do this job and I can only do this job with your support and love. I thank you and apologise for the many late nights and an often grumpy dad. Uh, Viviane, I thank you so much. This has only been possible because you raised my children and fed my galah. Uh, to my sister Kate, who just before I got to my feet sent me a text to demand that she be acknowledged, I acknowledge you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> With your indulgence, Mr Speaker, I will opine on a few issues. The best job in government is Treasurer. I have loved the central agency, the ability to stick your nose into any area. Although I will note now, with a hairy eyeball towards some of you, on, and a note to whoever may follow in my footsteps as Treasurer, on Budget Day, the Minister for Tourism gets to announce things like cruises. Well, <laughs> used to announce things like cruises. <laughs> and other wonderful things for the tourism sector. The Minister for Transport, new roads, rail. Minister for Education, new schools. The Premier, whatever exciting thing happens to be in the budget. But as Treasurer, I get the wages policy, Mr Speaker. And I thank you all for taking the lollies in our four budgets. To a certain extent, we are required to respond to the circumstances we find ourselves in, and then we play them. The repair of the finance has been my task, and I am relieved and proud that we have done so. I was determined to ensure that the Treasurer after me had a balance sheet better able to respond to the challenges our globe presents us. The Cabinet was determined in this and our success is obvious. One of the reasons we have been able to do this, of course, is our, is our reform of the way our GST is distributed. This has been a massive overdue reform for Western Australia. But I say this to the Parliament, to all members. I wrote this before today. At some point, this battle will have to be taken up again. Other states are envious and hostile, in particular at the bureaucratic level uh, of our success in this reform, and they will continue to advocate into the years of consecutive governments in other states. And at some point, the battle will again be joined. It is upon us all to remain highly alert to this and in the interests of our citizens defend this hard-won reform. Can I also thank uh, the treasurers of other states? I've worked with them all uh, over the last four years through the Board of Treasury and KIFA, uh, the Council for Federal Financial Relations, uh, to deal with the issues of national significance. It has been a pleasure working with you all. Uh, Mr Speaker, I wish to make some comments on Western Australia's and Australia's relationship with China and what I believe has been the rise of unhelpful public commentary directed towards our most important trading partner. China is by no means a perfect nation, but very few nations are. 
The Economist magazine's Democracy Index has just 4.5 per cent of the world's population living in 20 fully functioning democracies such as our own. As one of the globe's great trading nations, it's ridiculous to suggest that we should maintain strong relationships with only those countries that share our own values. If you add what The Economist categorises as flawed democracies, it leaves more than half the world's population living in 92 countries without democratic governance. When Gough Whitlam became the first Australian Prime Minister to visit China in 1973, that nation had substantially the same political system that it has today. Every Prime Minister since Whitlam has recognised the importance of nurturing that relationship, establishing a bond between our two nations which has brought enormous benefit to both countries. Australian governments have also been adept at tackling our differences, whether this be in relation to human rights or territorial disputes. We have maintained a frank but respectful relationship. It is only in recent times that some commentators and some of our elected representatives have decided we need to spend less time nurturing this relationship and more time attacking our major trading partner for not sharing our values. Much of the anxiety appears based on Chinese investment in Australia. Indeed, Chinese investment has been growing in Australia and last year totaled $78 billion. But this represents just 2 per cent of the $3.84 trillion in foreign investment in Australia and is dwarfed by the United States at almost 26 per cent and the United Kingdom at almost 18 per cent. Even the Netherlands is a larger investor in Australia, but there is no national conversation about the Dutch buying up our national assets. I am a great supporter of a rules-based trading system and the global economy has benefited greatly from the principles that were put in place after World War II and refined through a variety of international agreements over the past 70 years. But in the same way I can choose which cafe I will buy my coffee from, Mr Speaker, many of Australia's trading partners make choices about where they buy their barley, wine, meat and other commodities. If my local cafe owner was unfriendly or abusive, Mr Speaker, I'd probably go to the cafe owner down the road. I desperately hope we can take our relationship with China back to what it once was, a respectful one uh, with, with, which supports strong trade benefits, but also one in which we can tackle our differences through thoughtful diplomacy. Hundreds of thousands of Australian jobs, many of them here in Western Australia, in all of our electorates, are at stake if we don't manage this relationship properly. I'd like to make a few remarks about my role as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. I came to this portfolio after having it in opposition for a number of years, and to be honest, and perhaps unsurprisingly, it has become my first love. It is dynamic and frustrating and influenced by the diabolical history of Aboriginal and government relations, but it deals with the most interesting, caring, vulnerable and resilient people in our community, those that have nurtured our country for millennia. I was fully appreciative about how challenging this portfolio is. There is no other area of government, business and public policy like Aboriginal affairs. The ministerial role, this role, is steeped in history. The legacy of violent dispossession, colonisation, labour exploitation, forced removal and institutionalisation of children and so much more lands at the feet and on the desk of the person who takes on the position of Aboriginal affairs minister. Make no mistake. The echoes of the role of the old chief protector still haunt this position. I wasn't the first Aboriginal person to take this job. Ernie Bridge held the position from 1986 to 1989. But that was at a different time in history. He took on that role in the aftermath of the land rights debate and before the Mabo decision. In 2017, I embraced the job as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs because I have seen the way Aboriginal people uh, with tens of thousands of years of history and wisdom behind them, are now embraced by non-Aboriginal people. I have seen the potential for agreement making where miners and other land users sit down with Aboriginal people to negotiate agreements that transcend commercial deals. Genuine relationships become enduring and life-changing for all. I have seen tens of thousands of Western Australians seeking a connection with the oldest living culture on the planet through participating in art, theatre, music, tourism and wandering the stunning landscape of our state through an Aboriginal lens. My overriding approach to this portfolio has been to harness this goodwill. Resetting the relationship between First Nation peoples and the Western Australian state is not something that can be achieved in one term of government. But that is what 
has been achieved since I took on the role in March 2017, with the full support of the Premier and my Cabinet colleagues. It's building a framework for structural change in the future, positive change that can't be undone. As I laid out in my NADOC address last week, I've been guided in this portfolio by four overarching principles. Recognition of traditional ownership and cultural connection, addressing past injustices, commitment to partnerships and political bipartisanship. These are principles that it appears all political parties are now committed. Past political divisions that made Aboriginal affairs such a difficult portfolio in WA now appear to be a distant memory and I'm very heartened by that. One of the things, first things I did in this portfolio was to welcome the federal court judgment to determine exclusive possession native title rights for the Injabati people in the West Pilbara and instructed the government solicitors not to appeal, a decision later vindicated by the High Court. A couple of weeks ago, I visited the Gibson Desert with my colleague, the Honourable Stephen Dawson, Minister for the Environment, to celebrate the recognition of traditional ownership of the renamed Pila Nature Reserve. These two recognitions bookend four extraordinary years of native title recognition in Western Australia. Native title is a Western Australian story. More than three quarters of our vast landscape is recognised native title. The native title system is the foundation of Western Australia's relationship with traditional owners. And in this, I want to thank the commitment and unbelievable work ethic of Debbie Fletcher, native title extraordinaire and the engine room of native title agreement making in Western Australia. The native title system is also the key to the proposed Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Act. It pains me that I won't see this bill passed into law as I consider it to be the most important reform of the Aboriginal Affairs portfolio in some time. But I am confident that we have produced a bill that can be introduced into the parliament next year. I have been enormously pleased with the constructive approach taken by Aboriginal people and the resources industry through all consultation, consultation phases. And I'm confident that the effort undertaken to reach broad consensus on these reforms will allow the best possible chance for a bill to be supported by the 41st Parliament. This year has, been, has seen extraordinary events that have transformed the position of Aboriginal people in WA. The government's rapid response to the spread of COVID-19 in locking down remote communities in partnership with Aboriginal people, uh, Aboriginal people kept Aboriginal people 100 per cent safe in those communities, means that we will look upon these remote communities completely differently. For the past two decades, our state's remote communities have had to justify their existence, and yet these are the communities where both the state and the Commonwealth Government said were the safest places to be when the, pan when the panic over the pandemic took hold. In this, I thank the Aboriginal medical services across Western Australia. You stood up in the most difficult of circumstances. Obviously, this, the destruction of the Jukan Rock shelters early this year has also has seen, in my view, a seismic shift in the way Aboriginal heritage is viewed. Six months ago, nobody except the PKKP traditional owners knew of the existence of these caves. Now it seems the whole world knows about them in collective grief over their loss. Jukan reinforces why Western Australia's Aboriginal heritage protection system needs to be overhauled. It also highlights how powerful the Aboriginal position is when it comes to protecting heritage. I sense that this power is not totally appreciated by many Aboriginal people and their supporters, some of whom hang on to the old rhetoric about demanding an enshrined, an enshrined veto over development. It's a power Aboriginal people have already. Sometimes moral authority and public opinion are far more effective than written law. One other comment I want to make about uh, the Aboriginal Affairs portfolio is its combination with lands. And, uh, and since, 2009, I've, uh, since 2018, I've held the lands portfolio. And it's the first time in Western Australia, in, in our history, that the portfolios of Aboriginal Affairs and lands have been held by the same minister. These portfolios go together perfectly because the long-term development agenda for Aboriginal people is so dependent on land reform. In a state without a dedicated Land Rights Act, we can do so much through working with the Commonwealth Native Title Act and the WA Land Administration Act. I, would give, I could give numerous examples of where this works. The Yaru in Broome, the Miru on Gadjurong in the Ord River Valley, Yamaji in the Midwest, Esperance Noongars in the Southwest, and remote communities, the list is endless. 
The Lands Portfolio also gives the Minister an opportunity to rename some of the state's landmarks that more appropriately recognise Aboriginal people and their traditional culture. And a few months ago, working with the Nyarinyan and Boonaba traditional owners of the Central Kimberley, the Government announced that their wonderful mountain ranges would be forever known as the Wanaman Milawundis and no longer named after a Belgian tyrant who never set foot on Western Australian lands. That announcement was met with massive public approval that highlights the goodwill in our state for recognising Aboriginal culture. And can I thank, over the last four years, the, uh, the work, uh, the advice and the support of the WA Aboriginal Advisory Council, who have been spectacular uh, in their support of me as Minister. So, colleagues, that's it. I have loved my time here. I love the parliament, the debate, the camaraderie and the opportunity to serve in government. Only those who have had the rare privilege to serve as a member of parliament really knows its delights, its pressures, its challenges and its rewards. I thank you all for the journey we have shared. My caucus colleagues, I wish you all the very best for the upcoming election. To my friends in opposition, I wish you well, but not success. <laughs> I don't know what comes next, but I'm excited about the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Treasurer. I can't say Mr Speaker, so I'll just say members. Who would have thought 73 years ago that I would finish up Speaker of the House and the member for Albany? When my mum was about to give birth to what she was told would be twins, out popped me. Nine pounds, 13 ounces. So fat I couldn't open my eyes. And my dad joke, joked, I think he ate the other twin. As you can see now, I don't think I did. I'm so proud to become Speaker of this wonderful chamber and to represent my city of Albany for 20 years. There are a large amount of people who have helped me on the journey. Firstly, the Labor Party for giving me the opportunity to represent my community. The late Honourable Bob Thomas, who was my mentor and convinced me to run for the seat of Albany in what was a safe Conservative seat. When Bob was the Upper House member, he set up networks in the South West and Great Southern, uh, which helped myself and Mick Murray get elected. I really miss our chats on politics and football, and I'm grateful also to the people of Albany who have had the confidence in me to win five elections, albeit some very close margins. Some of the previous Labor candidates, Ursula Richards, Brian Bradley, Joe Lynch, twice all had the courage to put their hands up and represent the Labor Party. Thank you to our true believers who had manned the booths during the dark times, and some still do. Will Richards, rocking Eddie Summerbull, if you need an Elvis impersonator, he's the boy. The late Norma Freebury, the Rowe family, Alan, Doug, John, and the late Joan Rowe. Joan Rowe always said to me, I've got your back, Watto. And with her two sons and a husband, I always felt very confident. The late Stan Tate and the late Beth and Ted Daniels. I'm proud to work with these wonderful true believers. My staff over the journey have been amazing. Guy Roth, spelt W-R-O-T-H, because in my maiden speech, I didn't check it, and he has let me know for 20 years. <laughs> or Bomber as everyone knows him, is one of my greatest assets. He lives for politics and election campaigns. If it wasn't for him, 
on the first election day picking up the slack when our campaign manager went missing, I wouldn't be here today. Guy is loyal. We've been together for 20 years. You only get 15 years for murder. Being a country member, you're away from your office a lot. And you have to have the confidence in your staff to keep the office ticking over and Guy and Ian do that. Guy's a great tactician in elections, and although we don't always agree on some things, we work it out in the end. It never ceases to amaze me why the party has never used Guy's expertise during campaigns. Now, I got a text from Bomber today. Best wishes for your valedictory cobber. Who would have thought from that night Bobby Thomas started to plan my first campaign that after five great wins, you'd be giving your valedictory as the speaker? It's been an exciting and fun journey sharing that roller coaster ride with you. I've got the page wrong. I should put the wrong page. <laughs> Ian Bishop hadn't been with me as long, but he's just, just as effective in different ways. Ian is the organised one in the office, the only one, and is at the front desk the first contact to our constituents. Ian also does the organising for our seniors concert and also our polling booths. We are a team in Albany, always been a team effort. Julie Hooper and Pam Stoney, job shared at the start, and now we have Christine Hunter working for us part time. These great women have each been an asset to the Albany office. In 2001, I swung 15.6%, two party preferred, to win against the odds and became the first Labor member in Albany in 26 years. In 2005, I won by 350 votes after recount, 12.5 primary vote swing to me. Prior to the 2008 election, party office commissioned research on name recognition of politicians within their electorates. Mine come back at 85 per cent. That can't be right. So they did it again, and the second time it come out at 83 per cent. So I'm trying to find those two per cent who changed their mind. In the 2008 election, Albany had a 2.5 per cent swing, a one by 89 votes. At the time, we had a young baby-faced Liberal from New South Wales who ran the Lib campaign. Ben Morton was his name. He's now the PM's horse whisperer. He had another go in 2013, also unsuccessful. In 2013, Albany swung 1.8 per cent to Labor, one of only two electors to go that way. The other elected was our Premier, also towards Labor. I owe a, I owe a lot to Linda O'Sharlan, then Assistant State Secretary, who came to Albany and set up a detailed business plan. When Cyclone Linda left, it was a great loss to the Labor Party, but I still wonder about a taste in men, the <laughs> member for Balcata. During this time, the big Liberal promise was only a Liberal government would deliver a gas pipeline. <laughs> a big truck with huge signs drove up and down the main street of Albany for two elections with this message. I think the truck got lost, as did the gas pipeline. <laughs> During the last two elections, my opponents spread a rumour around town that I was dying, both times. The whispering got back to me, and as a cancer survivor, I thought it was a cheap shot. I treat election time as a grand final or an Australian title. I get myself fit, maybe lose a bit of weight and work hard. So it's disappointing when some of my seniors ring me to say, I'm so sorry to hear you about your health, Peter. My family is my greatest asset. With me today in the chambers, my sister Lynn, my wife Diane and my children, Christy and her, part and her partner Benjamin, Still haven't worked him out yet. <laughs> Christy, <laughs> Christy has a successful career in the health industry. Justin and his wife, Brooke, who have just returned, returned from teaching in the UK. We're so glad to have you home. We were worried we wouldn't get you back. We got you back from Barcelona. And that um, business class ticket I bought you, son, uh, you can start paying it off now. Sarah, who is a tal talented wedding photographer, Flossy, flossy photography, and Sophie, who works in defence in Canberra, I can't tell you what she does, <laughs> and my grandchildren, Emily, Mason and Eden. 
I'm immensely proud of all of them. They are special people in their own ways. Emily has a taste for politics and media. At 15, Mason, who's soon be taller than Papa, is very good at sport and schoolwork, and Eden loves her gymnastics, advanced maths, and teasing her Papa. During the first, my first term, I was away a lot, and that put a lot of pressure on my previous wife, Liz, the mother of my three children. I appreciate how she carried the load at that time. Watching online and my interstate uh, in-laws, Karen and Owen, watching from remote, remote mountain on the top, high in the snowy mountains, assuming that the pedal radio is working and the power's on, uh, my mother-in-law, Audrey and Albury and Selina in Sydney. When we first started at Parliament, the first thing we had to do was go to Government House to be sworn in. As you have been told what to do, I wasn't listening. Being a Watson, we were always called last. To my surprise, the first person they called up was the member for Albany. They pushed me up on the sides and I said to the governor, what do I do? He said, do up your jacket, son, smile, shake my hands and look at the cameraman. In Parliament, the first day was quite an experience. I was on the row second from the back with Martin Whiteley, the late Paul Andrews, John Bowler and Q, John Quigley. Courage comes in different forms, and Paul Andrews, who had a stroke during the election campaign and still kept campaigning, showed plenty of that. As acting speaker, Paul was one of the best speakers I have seen in my time. And there was Q, who I sat next to for four years. I thought, it's got to get better than this. <laughs> in which time, he and I sorted out the Mallard appeal. We sat, we, sat, we sat late in those early days, and Q would often get me to look at something. I had no idea what it was. <laughs> but he was convinced that Mallard was innocent, so I was extremely disappointed after all my input, Q got all the credit. <laughs> the opposition called us the Cabbage Patch, but we, we renamed it ourselves, Gallup's Half Backline. Nothing got past us with a T-shirt to match. It was a bit embarrassing for Jeff Gallup that when they took the photo for the Sunday Times, Jeff was take, putting on his T-shirt, which left half his stomach exposed. And I have sold so many of those prints to, as fundraising. <laughs> the poor Hansard girls, Wendy, Elaine and Kelly, the A-team, who always we always tried to make laugh, were diligently doing their job, being in government in the back bench, so there wasn't much else to do in the chamber. So uh, we created mischief, but I'd like to congratulate Hanso. They do a tremendous job making our speeches look better. One of the first projects I was involved in was the Albany Entertainment Centre. Bruce Manning from the Great Southern Development Commission and Andrew Hammond, who was the CEO of the city, worked tirelessly to get the AEC off the ground against great opposition. Andrew Hammond has gone on to bigger and better things. Uh, and at the time, the mayor led a march up the main street protesting against the centre. And then when it was open under the Liberal government, he got up there and claimed credit for it. <laughs> Bruce Manning has done a tremendous job for our region over a long period of time. And I'm proud to work with him on his many projects. The city of Albany went through a period of instability, having three CEOs in three years. Graham Foster came in, steadied the ship, and our current CEO Andrew Sharp is also doing an excellent job. Over my time in politics, I've seen some great leaders. The first time I met Jeff Gallup was in a pre-selection meeting. On TV, he seemed aloof, so I was really surprised when I met Jeff to find out he's a lovely, warm and super intelligent man. My constituents loved Jeff and he had time for everyone. It was a shame his health issues caught up with him being a Premier is a very, very stressful job. Eric Ripper, the world's best treasurer at the time, before you, Ben, was one of the most intelligent men I've ever met. I remember having a meeting up in Parliament with Eric when we first tried for our funding for our entertainment centre. There was a particular developer who was quite aggressive. Eric put him in his place with facts, figures, and sent us on our way to get a better business plan. We only asked for 12 million at the first meeting, but it turned out to be 60 million, so we must have had a, good, a very good business plan. 
Alan Carpet was a good man who was thrown into the fire when Jeff Dalliff had to start, stand down. He, being an Albany boy, sure helped me retain my seat. Troy Buswell was an enigma. On his feet in the chamber, he was one of the best I've seen. His knowledge of his portfolio was always spot on and he could have been a future Premier. It's sad that his party didn't act sooner to help him. The warning signs were there for all to see. Troy and I had some great contests in the chamber and he really stitched me up quite a few times. Mark McGowan has been a tremendous leader for our state in the most trying of circumstances. He showed courage in making hard decisions that needed to be made and then sticking to them despite being hounded by the opposition and various uh, business groups. I remember long ago how disappointed Mark was when he missed out on the minister job in 2001. But he showed a lot of ticker and he's got the last laugh being our most popular Premier ever. During this challenging COVID year, Mark McGowan and Roger Cook had such a calming influence when people needed to be regularly assured about their changing world. Premier, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to be Speaker. It's something I'll never forget. Probably a few other people here probably think want to forget it, but uh, it's been a, it's a, a great honour and um, I really thank you for it with all my heart. Amidst the fear and uncertainty this year, sometimes I've had a laugh driving up and down the Albany Highway when the regions were in lockdown and planes were grounded. To get through, I had to have a pass. At the top of the Armadale Hill, I stopped as usual to show it to, to a copper. There was two coppers and there was a very a serious young reservist. So uh, the reservist said, uh, other way, I'll do this. And he get up and he got my pass and he said, what nationality are you? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it says Hon. Is that, is that uh, Dutch or what? <laughs> and the coppers and I burst out laughing and he said, excuse me, this is a serious matter. When I explained it meant honourable, he said, I will never live this down. <laughs> Mia Davies has been a great leader for the National Party. It was one of the few opposition members who made sense during the pandemic. But Mia, beware of the Rat Pack. In the chamber, especially at question time, the atmosphere can be intimidating. I've seen people who have been touted as incoming leaders of their party struggle in the cut and thrust of the battle. Since being in the Speaker's chair, I notice how different members prepare differently before asking a question. Who am I looking at? Minister Safiot is a perfect example. When I look and see she has the next question, I can see herself psyching herself up. And I'm <laughs> looking across the chamber on the other side and I'm wondering where the target is. <laughs> Rita is a fiery competitor, but is also right across her portfolio, and you can see her eyes, eyes light up when someone interjects. Some of the great performers of my time would be Ben Wyatt, Joyce Boswell, Mark McGowan, Colin Barnett, and of course Alana McTiernan. Alana is a true warrior, national might, might agree, who works tirelessly for our community and is a brilliant minister. I've always said she's the one person I go to war with, although it might be hard to keep up with her. In my first campaign, we were near the gritty end, I received a phone call from Clyde Brown. I'd never met him before, but I knew he was a senior figure of the party at the time. He took the time to ring me, see how he could help me, settle me down, gave me the proper pathway to take, and I've never forgotten that. I remember when Clive was speaking in the chamber, he used to sit where the whip sitting there, and someone would interject him when he stopped, he'd put his arm over the chair, the back of his seat, and say, well, well, and then rip into him, and he had the whole chamber in stitches. There's not the same kind of humour across the chamber now to compare when I first started, but then the world is a different place. Then again, no other speakers have been serenaded by a talented Minister for Arts, David Temple, <laughs> like I have. A highlight of my time in the Speaker's chair has been his Christmas hijinks. The one thing I worried about, he got about a million likes, but my photo wasn't in there at all, so if you do it this year, you're sitting on my knee up here. <laughs> The Barry Urban incident was a difficult time for the Privileged Committee. It's not a pleasant job to sit in judgment with one of your colleagues. Members of the committee, Lisa Baker, Ian Blaney, Peter Rundle, uh, Kevin Michelle and myself, assisted by the clerk, Kirsten Robinson, Deputy Clerk, Scott Norder, and Sergeant at Arns, Ireland McPhail. 
was a trying six months for all concerned, especially Isla. She went way above duty. If Dr Macphail is on your trail, my advice, just surrender. Gary Adsett also deserves a mention. It was him who set the wheels in motion with his investigative writing. He and Jeff Parry are the two best reporters I've come across in my time. I'm writing a book at the moment myself on politics, life, Olympics. I'll have to get Q to check to see if I could be sued. The voluntary assisted dying legislation was a tremendous effort by the parliament to get passed. There were some emotional speeches by both sides of the argument, and I'd like to congratulate all concerned. The day the three young men came into my office that, that had, with an issue that had haunted them for many years was, uh, um, sorry, was the most em emotional day of my political career. They had been going to the funerals of friends who had been boarders with them at the Catani Ho Hostel. Several, many of their friends had committed suicide. I brought their case up in Parliament, which resulted in the Blacksell inquiry. This gave the boys a chance to have their say and receive some closure. Also, the predator received extra jolt, jail time because of the, this inquiry. What these young boys suffered in a government-run hostel was appalling. I still get calls from across the state from those who are still suffering. Listening to the radio on the 15th of July 2011 and hearing that there had been a bad car accident on Albany Highway near Mount Barker is the worst feeling for parents who live in the country whose children were travelling home at long weekends. The proud love family's worst nightmare happened this way when their son, Warwick, was seriously hurt. Wazza had the world at his feet. A lovely young man, a terrific sportsman who had the talent to be drafted for the AFL. Kevin and Trish and family's lives were upside down, turned upside down. We set up the Proud Love Fam Foundation in Albany to assist the family in looking after Wazza. The family has since moved to Perth and the foundation is now run from Perth. I brought his case to the parliament and we finally got no fault insurance legislation through. Unfortunately, it wasn't backdated, but will help others in the future. Another young man, Kieran Watmore, went into hospital to have his appendix removed. Mistakes were made and he died. His mother, Helen, and dad, Jim, good friends of mine, weren't happy with the explanation they got. So I went into the bat for them and there was an inquiry by the health department and procedures were changed to make sure it doesn't happen again. When I first got into Parliament, we decided to do a seniors concert. In our first year, we had about 50 seniors in the Lockyer School Hall, and it's now to increase to about 400 last year in St Joseph's Gym. It's a special day. We have local talent who entertain. We have teas and cakes at interval. We have a free ticket system, and they line up in gophers and everything outside my office, up around the corner, every year. To see the smiles on their faces, seeing them singing along, brings a tear to my eye. Each year I deliver my two seniors jokes, which I think are funny, a bit risque, and uh, they laugh because I, I think they like me, but that's not for the jokes. And then they dress, dress me up in all sorts of gear, from the ugly sister, the, the Cinderella, garden gnome, all sorts of things over the years, and I will miss, miss getting dressed up. Each Christmas concert ends with everyone singing Silent Night my late parents' favourite carol. They are the reason I started the seniors' concert. Mum and Dad really had a chance to go out. I only wanted to provide an opportunity for my seniors to look forward to each year. Being a country member is a tough gig. Coming up to Pal on a Monday, then travelling long distance home Thursday night or early Friday morning, as Josie would. And then a full day in the electorate. We miss spending time with our families. In city meets, uh, sitting weeks, most country members go home to an empty house each night. When you get to Parliament, the first people you see are the staff. They have been my family for 20 years, and I'll miss them all. In Perth, I begin my day with a long walk, which includes walking past the park. I go down to Elizabeth Quay, up uh, St George's Terrace, and then I pass the dining room. And uh, I'll miss having Anna and Maria waving to and doing star jumps each morning. 
Since I was appointed speaker, the staff have been amazing, and I'll miss, mention specific people in my final speech tomorrow. Behind, behind every speaker is your backup team. That includes my clerk, Kirsten, Rocket, Sir Kirsten Robinson, the pocket rocket, Deputy Clerk Scott Nulder, my in-house lawyer, uh, the Sergeant at Arms, Ola McPhail, my executive sister, the ever bubbly Jackie, Jackie, my steward Anna, the Chamber staff and all other staff that keep this parliament ticking over do a fantastic job. Rob Hunter, who has to make decisions, difficult decisions in this parliament and probably upset some people with those decisions, but he managed to keep this place ticking over. Parliament House is the living, breathing treasure of our state, and I hope funds can be found to help maintain the buildings in a manner befitting its importance. If not, more money need to be sourced down the track, and a future government will have to find a lot of money to maintain it. On a personal level, global warming is something that really concerns me. I worry about the world I'm leaving my children and grandchildren. Maybe reducing logging of native forests is one way we can make a difference, and there's so many others. Mick Murray. What can you say about Mick? Well, I can say about Mick. One day, Mick and I were going downstairs after Matt Burney had had a go about Anna, Mick's wife. We turned the corner, and who's walking towards us with his chin out? was Mr Burney. Mick said, I'll have you. And Burney said, bring it on, and dropped his hands and went, yeah, come on. And because, you know, I'm trying to hold Mick back. And he said, look at his chin, look at his chin. I'm struggling, but wise heads shuffled Mr Burney away. Another time I was walking behind the chair to come into the chamber. Mick come flying past to have a go at the member for North West Centre at a crack about his hearing. I managed to stop him. And I think I, said, I saved both parties a by-election because I had to let him go. And I think he would have made new members. Uh, Nick and I were roommates for a long time. We spent a lot of time working out the problems of the world. One day we think we had the worst job in the world and a week later we thought we had the best. Politics is an up and down existence and only the tough survive. Nick is one of the toughest and I'm proud to call him my friend. John McGrath, can't forget John. John has been a great member of parliament as well as my failed Bolt Lawn Bowls coach. John says it's how it is. And I think some days he wishes on, he was on our side of the train, but I always think that underneath that shirt is a red T-shirt that one day he just wants to rip it open and say, I fooled you all. Yeah. Oh, you don't? OK. Uh, uh, but... He's a good friend. Uh, I've known John the whole time he's been here and uh, a great man and a good friend. A lovely speech tonight from Josie Farrah. Some up Josie's input to her community. Electric slogan has been, I am here for you, mob, and she was. I'm proud that our parliament was able to introduce Welcome to Country at the start of each day's sitting. Members, new and old, the election period is upon us, along with the pressures and stress that go with it. Please remember the Are You OK message and stay well. Making the decision to retire was a tough one, but it was made easier when Rebecca Stevens put up a hand. Rebecca is a local with strong family ties and she has the same interests as me, Albany, Albany, Albany. I save the soft, soppy bit to last. My wife, Diane and Harry the dog are my pack. They mean the world to me. Diane is my rock, my best friend, and is always there in the tough times. Diane is a brilliant shot children's author, sparking children's imagination through her books. Harry is our rescue dog. He's my mental health dog. Every morning he's there wagging his tail. And when we go for a walk, we sort out the world's problems. Harry wanted to be here today, but the speaker refused entry. <laughs> One of my biggest regrets is that Mum and Dad aren't here today. Dad was a strong labour man. I could just see him standing up there, puffing out his cheeks, chest the way he did when I won the two Australian junior titles in Perth. Just before Mum passed, when I told her I was running for Parliament, she said, what do you want to do that for? She then said, if you do, 
remember to look after the people who need it the most, and I've always tried to do that. I'm glad that my little big sister is here in their place. I'm not everyone's cup of tea, still on a few toes at the time, made lots of mistakes, but I've always given 100% for my constituents. That's something I'll always be proud of. Thank you. I'm still going. <laughs> Leader of the House. Congratulations on your speech. Uh, I move that the House is now adjourned. Members, the question is the House be now adjourned. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against? I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.